Chapter One of Dope. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. Dope by Sax Romer. Part First. Cosma the Dream Reader. Chapter One. A Message for Irvin. Monty Irvin, alderman of the city and prospective Lord Mayor of London paced restlessly from end to end of the well-appointed library of his house in prince's gate between his teeth he gripped the stump of a burnt-out cigar a tiny spaniel lay beside the fire his beady black eyes following the nervous movements of the master of the house at the age of forty-five monty irvin was not ill-looking and indeed was sometimes spoken of as handsome his figure was full without being corpulent his well-groomed black hair and moustache and fresh if rather coarse complexion together with the dignity of his upright carriage lent him something of a military air this he assiduously cultivated as befitting an ex-territorial officer although as he had seen no active service he modestly refrained from using any title of rank some quality in his brilliant smile an oriental expressiveness of the dark eyes beneath their drooping lids hinted a semitic strain but it was otherwise not marked in his appearance which was free from vulgarity whilst essentially that of a successful man of affairs in fact monty irvin made a success of every affair in life with the lamentable exception of his marriage of late his forehead had grown lined and those business friends who had known him for a man of abstemious habits had observed in the city chop-house at which he lunched almost daily that whereas formerly he had been a total trencherman he now ate little but drank much suddenly the spaniel leapt up with that feverish spider-like activity of the toy species and began to bark monty irvin paused in his restless patrol and listened lie down he said be quiet the spaniel ran to the door sniffing eagerly a muffled sound of voices became audible and irvin following a moment of hesitation crossed and opened the door the dog ran out yapping in his irritated staccato fashion and an expression of hope faded from irvin's face as he saw a tall fair girl standing in the hallway talking to hinks the butler she wore soiled burberry high-legged tan boots and a peaked cap of distinctly military appearance irvin would have retired again but the girl glanced up and saw him where he stood by the library door he summoned up a smile and advanced good evening miss holly he said striving to speak genially for of all of his wife's friends he liked margaret holly the best were you expecting to find rita at home the girl's expression was vaguely troubled she had the clear complexion and bright eyes of perfect health but tonight her eyes seemed overbright, whilst her face was slightly pale. Yes, she replied. That is, I hope she might be at home. I'm afraid I cannot tell you when she is likely to return, but please come in, and I will make inquiries. Oh, no, I would rather you not trouble, and I won't stay, thank you nevertheless. I expect she will ring me up when she comes in. Is there any message I can give her? Well, she hesitated for an instant you might tell her if you would that i only returned home at eight o'clock so that i could not come around any earlier she glanced rapidly at irvin biting her lip i wish i could have seen her she added in a low voice she wishes to see you particularly yes she left a note this afternoon again she glanced at him in a troubled way well i suppose it cannot be helped she added and smilingly extended her hand good night mr irvin don't bother to come to the door but irvin passed hinks and walked out under the porch with margaret holly humid yellow mist floated past the street lamps and seemed to have gathered in a moving reef around the little runabout car which was standing outside the house its motor chattering tremulously Whew, a beastly night he said foggy and wet it is a brute isn't it said the girl laughingly and turned on the steps so that the light shining out of the hallway gleamed on her white teeth and upraised eyes she was pulling on big ugly furred gloves and monty irvin mentally contrasted her fresh athletic type of beauty with the delicate 
exotic charm of his wife she opened the door of the little car got in and drove off waving one hugely gloved hand to Irvin as he stood in the porch looking after her when the red tail light had vanished in the mist he returned to the house and re-entered the library if only all of his wife's friends were like margaret hawley he mused he might have been spared the insupportable misgivings which were goading him to madness his mind filled with poisonous suspicions he resumed his pacing of the library awaiting and dreading that which should confirm his blackest theories he was unaware of the fact that throughout the interview he had held the stump of cigar between his teeth he held it there yet pacing pacing up and down the long room then came the expected summons the telephone bell rang monty irvin clenched his hands and inhaled deeply his color changed in a manner that would have aroused a physician's interest regaining his self-possession by a visible effort he crossed to a small side table upon which the instrument rested rolling his cigar stump into the left corner of his mouth he took up the receiver hello he said someone named brisley sir wishes put him through to me here very good sir a short interval then yes said monty irvin my name is brisley i have a message for mr monty irvin monty irvin speaking anything to report brisley irvin's deep rich voice was not entirely under control yes sir the lady drove by taxicab from prince's gate to albemarle street ah went up to chambers of sir lucian pine and was admitted well twenty minutes later came out lady was with sir lucian both walked around to old bond street the honorable quentin gray ah breathed irvin overtook them there he got out of a cab he joined them all three up to the apartments of a professional crystal gazer styling himself cosma the dream reader a puzzled expression began to steal over the face of monty irvin at the sound of the telephone bell he had paled somewhat now he began to recover his habitual florid coloring go on he directed for the speaker had paused seven to ten minutes later resumed the nasal voice mr gray came down he hailed a passing cab but man refused to stop mr gray seemed to be very irritable the fact that the invisible speaker was reading from a notebook he betrayed by his monotonous intonation and abbreviated sentences which resembled those of a constable giving evidence in a police court he walked off rapidly in direction of piccadilly colleague followed near the ritz he obtained a cab he returned insane to old bond street he ran upstairs and was gone from four and a half to five minutes he then came down again he was very pale and agitated he discharged cab and walked away colleague followed he saw mr gray enter prince's restaurant in the hall mr gray met a gent unknown by sight to colleague following some conversation both gents went in to dinner they are there now speaking from dover street tube yes yes but the lady a native possibly egyptian apparently servant of kasma came out a few minutes after mr gray had gone for a cab and went away sir lucian pine and lady are still in kasma's rooms what cried irvin pulling out his watch and glancing at the disc but it's after eight o'clock yes sir the place is all shut up and other offices in the block closed at six door of kasma's is locked i knocked and got no reply damn it you're talking nonsense there must be another exit no sir colleague has just relieved me left two gents over their wine at prince's monty irvin's color began to fade slowly then it's pine he whispered the hand which held the receiver shook brisley meet me at the piccadilly end of bond street i am coming now he put down the telephone crossed to the wall and pressed a button the cigar stump held firmly between his teeth he stood on the rug before the hearth facing the door presently it opened and hinks came in the car is ready hinks yes sir as you ordered shall pattinson come round to the door at once very good sir he withdrew closing the door quietly 
and monty irvin stood staring across the library at the full-length portrait in oils of his wife in a perio dress which she had worn in the third act of the maid of the mask the clock in the hall struck half past eight end of chapter one Chapter Two of Dope. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Noel Vox. Dope by Sax Romer. Chapter Two: The Apartments of Casma. It was rather less than two hours earlier on the same evening that Quentin Gray came out of the confectioner's shop in Old Bond Street carrying a neat parcel. Yellow dusk was closing down upon this bazaar of the new Babylon, and many of the dealers in precious gems, vendors of rich stuffs, and makers of modes had already deserted their shops. Smartly dressed showgirls, saleswomen, girl clerks, and others crowded the pavements, which at high noon had been thronged with ladies of fashion. Here a tailor's staff, there a hatter's, lingered a while as iron shutters and gratings were secured, and bidding one another good night, separated and made off towards tube and bus the working day was ended society was dressing for dinner gray was about to enter the cab which awaited him and his fresh-coloured boyish face wore an expression of eager expectancy which must have betrayed the fact to an experienced beholder that he was hurrying to keep an agreeable appointment then his hand resting on the handle of the cab door this expression suddenly changed to one of alert suspicion a tall dark man accompanied by a woman muffled in grey furs and wearing a silk scarf over her hair had passed on foot along the opposite side of the street grey had seen them through the cab windows his smooth brow wrinkled and his mouth tightened to a thin straight line beneath the fair regulation moustache he fumbled under his overcoat for loose silver drew out a handful and paid off the taxi man sometimes walking in the gutter in order to avoid the throngs upon the pavement regardless of the fact that his glossy dress boots were becoming spattered with mud, Gray hurried off in pursuit of the pair. Twenty yards ahead, he overtook them, as they were on the point of passing a picture dealer's window, from which yellow light streamed forth into the humid dusk. They were walking slowly, and Gray stopped in front of them. "'Hello, you two, he cried. "'Where are you off to? I was on my way to call for you, Rita.' Flushed and boyish, he stood before them and his annoyance was increased by their failure to conceal the fact that his appearance was embarrassing, if not unwelcome. Mrs. Monty Irvin was a petite, pretty woman, although some of the more wonderful bronze tints of her hair suggested the employment of henna, and her naturally lovely complexion was delicately and artistically enhanced by art. Nevertheless, the flower-like face, peeping out from the folds of a gauzy scarf, like a rose from a mist, whilst her soft little chin nestled into the fur, might have explained, even in the case of an older man, the infatuation which Quentin Gray was at no pains to hide. She glanced up at her companion, Sir Lucian Pine, a swarthy, cynical type of aristocrat, imperturbably. Then, I had left a note for you, Quentin, she said hurriedly. She seemed to be in a dangerously high-strung condition. But I have booked a table and a box, cried Gray, with a hint of juvenile petulance. My dear Gray, said Sir Lucian coolly, we are men of the world, and we do not look for consistency in women folk. Mrs. Irvin has decided to consult a palmist or a hypnotist or some such occult authority before dining with you this evening. Doubtless she seeks to learn if the play to which you propose to take her is an amusing one. His smile of sardonic amusement Gray found to be almost insupportable, and although Sir Lucian refrained from looking at Mrs. Irvin whilst he spoke, it was evident enough that his words held some covert significance for, "'You know perfectly well that I have a particular reason for seeing him,' she said. "'A woman's particular reason is a man's feeble excuse,' murmured Sir Lucian rudely, "'at least according to a learned Arabian philosopher.' "'I was going to meet you at Princess,' said Mrs. Irvin hurriedly, and again glancing at Gray. There was a pathetic hesitancy in her manner, the hesitancy of a weak woman who adheres to a purpose only by supreme effort. Might I ask, said Gray, the name of the pervert you are going to consult? Again she hesitated and glanced rapidly at Sir Lucian, but he was staring coolly in another direction. Casma, she replied in a low voice. Casma, cried Gray, the man who sells perfume and pretends to read dreams? What an extraordinary notion! Wouldn't tomorrow do? He will surely have shut up shop. 
I have been at pains to ascertain, replied Sir Lucian, at Mrs. Irvin's express desire that the man of mystery is still in session and will receive her. Beneath the mask of nonchalance which he wore, it might have been possible to detect excitement repressed with difficulty, and had Gray been more composed and not obsessed with the idea that Sir Lucian had deliberately intruded upon his plans for the evening, he could not have failed to perceive that Mrs. Monte Irving was feverishly preoccupied with matters having no relation to dinner and the theatre, but his private suspicions grew only the more acute. Then if the dinner is not off, he said, may I come along and wait for you? At Casmus? asked Mrs. Irvin. Certainly. She turned to Sir Lucian. Shall you wait? It isn't much use, as I'm dining with Quinton. If I do not intrude, replied the baronet, I will accompany you as far as the cave of the oracle, and then bid you good night. The trio proceeded along Old Bond Street. Quentin Gray regarded the story of Casma as a very poor lie devised on the spur of the moment. If he had been less infatuated, his natural sense of dignity must have dictated an offer to release Mrs. Irvin from her engagement. But jealousy stimulates the worst instincts and destroys the best. He was determined to attach himself as closely as the old man of the sea attached himself to S. Sindibad in order that the lie might be unmasked. Mrs. Irvin's palpable embarrassment and nervousness he ascribed to her perception of his design. A group of shop girls and others waiting for buses rendered it impossible for the three to keep abreast, and Gray, falling to the rear, stepped upon the foot of a little man who was walking close behind him. Sorry, sir, said the man, suppressing an exclamation of pain for the fault of in Gray's. Gray muttered an ungenerous acknowledgment, all anxiety to regain the side of Mrs. Irvin, for she seemed to be speaking rapidly and excitedly to Sir Lucian. He recovered his place as the two turned in at a lighted doorway. Upon the wall was a bronze plate bearing the inscription, Casma, second floor. Gray fully expected Mrs. Irvin to suggest that he should return later, but without a word she began to ascend the stairs. Gray followed. Sir Lucian standing aside to give him precedence. On the second floor was a door painted in oriental fashion. It possessed neither bell nor knocker, but as one stepped upon the threshold, this door opened noiselessly, as if dumbly inviting the visitor to enter the square apartment discovered. This apartment was richly furnished in the Arab manner, and lighted by a fine brass lamp swung upon chains from the painted ceiling. The intricate perforations of the lamp were inset with colored glass and the result was a subdued and warm illumination. Odd-looking oriental vessels, long-necked jars, jugs, tenuous spouts, and squat bowls possessing engraved and figured covers emerged from the shadows of niches. A low divan with gaily colored mattresses extended from the door around one corner of the room, where it terminated beside a kind of mashribia cabinet or cupboard. Beyond this cabinet was a long, low counter laden with statuettes of Nile gods, amulets, mummy beads, and little stoppered flasks of blue enamel ware. There were two glass cases filled with other strange-looking antiquities. Faint perfume was perceptible. Sir Lucian, entering last of the party, the door closed behind him, and from the cabinet on the right of the divan a young Egyptian stepped out. He wore the customary white robe, red sash, and red slippers, and a tarbush. The little scarlet cap, commonly called a fez, was set upon his head. He walked to a door on the left of the counter and slid it noiselessly open, bowing gravely. The Sheik El Kazma waits, he said, speaking with the soft intonation of a native of Upper Egypt. It now became evident, even to the infatuated Gray, that Mrs. Irvin was laboring under the influence of tremendous excitement. She turned to him quickly, and he thought that her face looked almost haggard, whilst her eyes seemed to have changed color, become lighter, although he could not be certain that this latter effect was not due to the peculiar illumination of the room. But when she spoke, her voice was unsteady. "'Will you see if you can find a cab?' she said. "'It is so difficult at night, and my shoes will get frightfully muddy, crossing Piccadilly. I shall not be more than a few minutes.' She walked through the doorway, the Egyptian standing aside as she passed. He followed her, but came out again almost immediately, reclosed the door, and retired into the cabinet, which was evidently his private cubicle. Silence claimed the apartment. Sir Lucian threw himself nonchalantly upon the divan, and took out his cigarette case. "'Will you have a cigarette, Gray?' he asked. "'No, thanks,' replied the other in tones of smothered hostility. He was ill at ease and paced the apartment nervously. Pine lighted a cigarette 
and tossed the extinguished match into a brass bowl. I think, said Gray jerkily, I shall go for a cap. Are you remaining? I am dining at the club, answered Pine. But I can wait until you return. As you wish, jerked Gray. I don't expect to be long. He walked rapidly to the outer door, which opened at his approach and closed noiselessly behind him as he made his exit. End of chapter 2 Recording by Noel Vox Chapter 3 of Dope This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marboy Dope by Sax Romer. Chapter 3 Chasma Mrs. Maudie Irvin entered the inner room. The air was heavy with the perfume of frankincense, which was smoldered in a brass vessel set upon a tray. This was the audience chamber of Chasma. In marked contrast to the overcrowded appointments, divans, and cupboards of the first room, it was sparsely furnished. The floor was thickly carpeted. But save for an ornate inlaid table, upon which stood the tray and incense burner, a long low cushioned seat placed immediately beneath a hanging lamp burning dimly in a globular green shade, it was devoid of decoration. The walls were draped with green curtains, so that, except for the presence of the painted door, the four sides of the apartment appeared to be uniform. Having conducted Mrs. Irvin to the seat, the Egyptian bowed, and retired again through the doorway by which they had entered. The visitor found herself alone. She moved nervously, staring across at the blank wall before her. With her little satin shoe, she tapped the carpet, biting her under lip and seeming to be listening. Nothing stirred. Not even an echo of busy Bond Street penetrated to the place. Mrs. Irvin unfastened her cloak and allowed it to fall back upon the settee. Her bare shoulders looked waxen and unnatural in the weird light which shone down upon them. She was breathing rapidly. The minutes passed by in unbroken silence. So still was the room that Mrs. Irvin could hear the faint crackling sound made by the burning charcoal in the brass vessel near her. Wisps of blue-gray smoke arose through the perforated lid, and she began to watch them fascinatedly, so lithe. They seemed like wraiths of serpents creeping up the green draperies. So she was seated, her foot still restlessly tapping, but her gaze arrested by the hypnotic movements of the smoke, when at last a sound from the outer world penetrated to the room. A church clock struck the hour of seven, its clangor intruding upon the silence only as a muffled boom. Almost coincident with the last stroke, came the sweeter note of a silver gong from somewhere close at hand. Mrs. Irvin started, and her eyes turned instantly in the direction of the greenly draped wall before her. Her pupils had grown suddenly dilated, and she clenched her hands tightly. The light above her head went out. Now that the moment was come to which she had looked forward with mingled hope and terror, long pent-up emotion threatened to overcome her, and she trembled wildly. Out of the darkness dawned a vague light, and in it a shape seemed to take form. As the light increased, the effect was as though part of the wall had become transparent, so as to reveal the interior of an inner room where a figure was seated in a massive ebony chair. The figure was that of an oriental, richly robed and wearing a white turban. His long slim hands of the color of old ivory rested upon the arms of the chair and on the first finger of the right hand gleamed a big talismanic ring. The face of the seated man was lowered, but from under heavy brows his abnormally large eyes regarded her fixedly. So dim the light remained that it was impossible to discern the details with anything like clearness, but that the clean-shaven face of the man which those wonderful eyes was strikingly and intellectually handsome, there could be no doubt. This was Kazma the dream reader, and although Mrs. Irvin had seen him before, his statuesque repose and the weirdness of his unfaltering gaze thrilled her uncannily. Kazma slightly raised his hand in greeting. The big ring glittered in the subdued light. Tell me your dream, came a curious mocking voice, and I will read its portent. 
Such was the set formula with which Kazma opened all interviews. He spoke with a slight and not unmusical accent. He lowered his hand again. The gaze of those brilliant eyes remained fixed upon the woman's face. Moistening her lips, Mrs. Irvin spoke. Dreams? Why, I have to say, does not belong to dreams, but to reality. She laughed unmirthfully. You know well enough why I'm here. She paused. Why are you here? You know, you know. Suddenly into her voice had come the unmistakable note of hysteria. Your theatrical tricks do not impress me. I know what you are. A spy, an eavesdropper who watches, watches and listens. But you may go too far. I am nearly desperate, do you understand? Nearly desperate. Speak, move, answer me. But Kazma preserved his uncanny repose. You are distracted, he said. I am sorry for you. But why do you come to me with your stories of desperation? You have insisted upon seeing me. I am here. And you play with me, taunt me. The remedy is in your hands. For the last time, I tell you, I will never do it. Never, never, never. Then why do you complain? If you cannot afford to pay for your amusements, and you refuse to compromise in a simple manner, why do you approach me? Oh, my God, she moaned and swayed dizzily. Have pity on me. Who are you? What are you? That you can bring a ruin to a woman because... She uttered a choking sound, but continued hoarsely. Raise your head. Let me see your face. As heaven is my witness, I am ruined, ruined. Tomorrow. I cannot wait for tomorrow. That quivering, hoarse cry betrayed a condition of desperate febrile excitement. Mrs. Irvin was capable of proceeding to the wildest extremities. Clearly, the mysterious Egyptian recognized this to be the case, for slowly raising his hand. I will communicate with you, he said and their words were spoken almost hurriedly. Depart in peace. A formula wherewith he terminated every seance. He lowered his hand. The silver gong sounded again, and the dim light began to fade. Thereupon the unhappy woman acted. The long-suppressed outburst came at last. Stepping rapidly to the green transparent veil behind which Kazma was seated, she wrenched it asunder and leapt toward the figure in the black chair. You shall not trick me, she planted. Hear me out, or I go straight to the police, now, now. She grasped the hands of Kazma as they rested motionless on the chair arms. Complete darkness came. Out of it rose a husky, terrified cry, a second louder cry, and then a long, wailing scream, horror-laden as that of one who has touched some slumbering reptile. End of chapter 3. Recording by Marboy. Chapter 4 of Dope. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dope by Sax Romer. Chapter 4. The Closed Door. Rather less than five minutes later, a taxicab drew up in Old Bond Street, and from it Quentin Gray leapt out impetuously and ran in at the doorway leading to Kazma's stairs. So hurried was his progress that he collided violently with a little man who, carrying himself with a pronounced stoop, was slinking furtively out. The little man reeled at the impact and almost fell, but, "'Hang it all!' cried Gray irritably. "'Why the devil don't you look where you're going?' He glared angrily into the face of the other. It was a peculiar and rememberable face, notable because of a long, sharp, hooked nose and very little foxy brown eyes, a sly face to which a small, fair mustache only added insignificance. It was crowned by a wide-brimmed bowler hat, which the man wore pressed down upon his ears like a Jew peddler. "'Why,' cried Gray, "'this is the second time tonight you've jostled me.' He thought he'd recognized the man for the same who had been following himself, Mrs. Irvin, and Sir Lucian Pine along Old Bond Street. A smile, intended to be propitiatory, appeared upon the pale face. "'No, excuse me, sir.' "'Don't deny it,' said Gray angrily. "'If I had the time, I should give you in charge as a suspicious loiterer.' 
Calling to the cabman to wait, he ran up the stairs to the second floor landing. Before the painted door bearing the name of Kazma, he halted, and as the door did not open, stamped impatiently, but with no better result. At that, since there was neither bell nor knocker, he raised his fist and banged loudly. No one responded to the summons. "'Hi there!' he shouted. "'Open the door! Pine! Rita!' Again he banged, and yet again. Then he paused, listening, his ear pressed to the panel. He could detect no sound of movement within. Fists clenched, he stood staring at the closed door, and his fresh color slowly deserted him and left him pale. "'Damn him!' he muttered savagely. "'Damn him! He has fooled me!' Passionate and self-willed, he was shaken by a storm of murderous anger. That Pine had planned this trick, with Rita Irvin's consent, he did not doubt. And his passive dislike of the man became active hatred of the woman he dared not think. He had for long looked upon Sir Lucian in the light of a rival, and the irregularity of his own infatuation for another's wife in no degree lessened his resentment. Again he pressed his ear to the door and listened intently. Perhaps they were hiding within. Perhaps this charlatan, Casma, was an accomplice in the pay of Sir Lucian. Perhaps this was a secret place of rendezvous. To the manifest absurdity of such a conjecture he was blind in his anger. But that he was helpless, befooled, he recognized. And with a final muttered imprecation he turned and slowly descended the stair. A lingering hope was dispelled when, looking right and left along Bond Street, he failed to perceive the missing pair. The cabman glanced at him interrogatively. "'I shall not require you,' said Gray, and gave the man half a crown. Busy with his poisonous conjectures, he remained all unaware of the presence of a furtive, stooping figure, which lurked behind the railings of the arcade at this point, linking Old Bond Street to Abramel Street." nor had the stooping stranger any wish to attract Gray's attention. Most of the shops in the narrow lane were already closed, although the florists at the corner remained open. But of the shadow which lay along the greater part of the arcade, this alert watcher took every advantage. From the recess formed by a shop door, he peered out at Gray, where the light of a street lamp fell upon him, studying his face, his movements, with unrelaxing vigilance. Gray, following some moments of indecision, strode off towards Piccadilly. The little man came out cautiously from his hiding place and looked after him. Out of a dark porch, ten paces along Bond Street, appeared a burly figure to fall into step a few yards behind Gray. The little man licked his lips appreciatively and returned to the doorway below the premises of Casma. Reaching Piccadilly, Gray stood for a time on the corner, indifferent to the jostling of passers-by. Finally he crossed, walked along to Prince's restaurant, and entered the lobby. He glanced at his wristwatch. It registered the hour of 7.25. He cancelled his order for a table, and was standing staring moodily towards the entrance, when the doors swung open, and a man entered who stepped straight up to him, hand extended, and, "'Glad to see you, Gray,' he said. "'What's the trouble?' Quentin Gray stared as if incredulous at the speaker, and it was with an unmistakable note of welcome in his voice that he replied, Seaton, Seaton Pasha. The frown disappeared from Gray's forehead, and he gripped the other's hand in hearty greeting. But stick to plain Seaton, said the newcomer, glancing rapidly about him. Ottoman titles are not fashionable. The speaker was a man of arresting personality. Above medium height, well but leanly built, the face of Seaton Pasha was burned to a deeper shade than England's wintry sun is capable of producing. He wore a close-trimmed beard and mustache, and the bronze on his cheeks enhanced the brightness of his gray eyes and rendered very noticeable a slight frosting of the dark hair above his temples. He had the indescribable air of a sure man, a sound man to have beside one in a tight place. And looking into the rather grim face, Quentin Gray felt suddenly ashamed of himself. From Seton Pasha he knew that he could keep nothing back. He knew that presently he should find himself telling this quiet, brown-skinned man the whole story of his humiliation, and he knew that Seton would not spare his feelings. "'My dear fellow,' he said, "'you must pardon me if I sometimes fail to respect your wishes in this matter. When I left the East the name of Seton Pasha was on everybody's tongue. But are you alone?' "'I am.' 
I only arrived in London tonight, and in England this morning. Were you thinking of dining here? No, I saw you through the doorway as I was passing. But this will do as well as another place. I gather that you are disengaged. Perhaps you will dine with me? Splendid, cried Gray. Wait a moment. Perhaps my table hasn't gone. He ran off in his boyish, impetuous fashion, and Seaton watched him, smiling quietly. The table proved to be available, and ere long the two were discussing an excellent dinner. Gray lost much of his irritability and began to talk coherently upon topics of general interest. Presently, following an interval during which he had been covertly watching his companion, "'Do you know, Seaton?' he said. "'You are the one man in London whose company I could have tolerated tonight. My arrival was particularly opportune.' "'Your arrivals are always particularly opportune.' Gray stared at Seaton with an expression of puzzled admiration. I don't think I shall ever understand your turning up immediately before the Senussi raid in Egypt. Do you remember? I was with the armored cars. I remember perfectly. Then you vanished in the same mysterious fashion, and the CEO was a sphinx on the subject. I next saw you strolling out of the gate at Baghdad. How the devil you'd got to Baghdad, considering that you hadn't come with us, and that you weren't with the cavalry, heaven only knows. No, said Seaton judiciously gazing through his uplifted wine-glass. When one comes to consider the matter without prejudice, it is certainly odd. But do I know the lady to whose non-appearance I owe the pleasure of your company to-night? Quentin Gray stared at him blankly. Really, Seaton, you amaze me. Did I say that I had an appointment with a lady? My dear Gray, when I see a man standing, biting his nails and glaring out into Piccadilly from a restaurant entrance, I ask myself a question. When I learn that he has just cancelled an order for a table for two, I answer it. Gray laughed. You always make me feel so infernally young, Seaton. Good. Yes, it's good to feel young, but bad to feel a young fool. And that's what I feel, and what I am. Listen. Leaning across the table so that the light of the shaded lamp fell fully upon his flushed, eager face, Gray, not without embarrassment, told his companion of the dirty trick, so he phrased it, which Sir Lucian Pine had played upon him. In conclusion, "'What would you do, Seaton?' he asked. Seaton sat regarding him in silence with a cool, calculating stare, which some men had termed insolent, absently tapping his teeth with the gold rim of a monocle, which he carried but apparently never used for any other purpose. And it was at about this time that a long, low car passed near the door of the restaurant, crossing the traffic stream of Piccadilly to draw up at the corner of Old Bond Street. From the car, Monty Irvin alighted, and telling the man to wait, set out on foot. Ten paces along Bond Street he encountered a small, stooping figure, which became detached from the shadows of a shop door. The light of a street lamp shone down upon the sharp, hooked nose and into the cunning little brown eyes of Brisley, of Spinker's detective agency. Monty Irvin started. Ah, Brisley, he said. I was looking for you. Are they still there? Mm, probably, sir, Brisley licked his lips. My colleague Gunn reports no one came out whilst I was away phoning. But the whole thing seems preposterous. Are there no other offices in the block where they might be? I personally saw Mr. Gray, Sir Lucian Pine, and the lady go into Casma's. At that time, roughly ten to seven, all the other offices had been closed approximately one hour. There is absolutely no possibility that they might have come out unseen by you? None, sir. I should not have troubled a client if in doubt. Here's Gunn. Old Bond Street now was darkened and deserted. The yellow mist had turned to a fine rain, and Gunn, his hands thrust in his pockets, was sheltering under the porch of the arcade. Gunn possessed a purple complexion, which attained to full vigor of coloring in the nasal region. His mustache of dirty gray was stained brown in the center, as if by frequent potations of stout, and his bulky figure was artificially enlarged by the presence of two overcoats, the outer of which was a waterproof, and the inner a blue garment appreciably longer both in sleeve and skirt than the former. The effect produced was one of great novelty. Gunn touched the brim of his soft felt hat, which he wore turned down all round, apparently in imitation of a flower-pot. "'All snug, sir,' he said, hoarsely and confidentially, bending forward and breathing the words into Irvin's ear. "'Snug as a bee in a hive. 
You're as good as a bachelor again. Monty Irvin mentally recoiled. Lead the way to the door of this place, he said tersely. Yes, sir. By the way, sir, be careful of the step there. You may remark that the outer door is not yet closed. I'm informed upon reliable authority, as the last to go locks the door. Hence we perceive that the last has not yet gone. It is likewise opened by the first to come of a morning. Here we are, sir, door on the right. The landing was in darkness, but as Gunn spoke, he directed the ray of a pocket lamp upon a bronze plate bearing the name Casma. He rested one hand upon his hip. All snug, he repeated, as snug as an eel in mud. The decree Nisi is yours, sir. As an alderman of the City of London and a justice of the peace, you are entitled to call a police officer. Hold your tongue, rapped Irvin. You've been drinking, and I place no reliance whatever in your evidence. I do not believe that my wife or anyone else but ourselves is upon these premises. The watery eyes of the insulted man protruded unnaturally. Drinkin', he whispered, drink. But indignation now deprived Gunn of speech, and— Excuse me, sir, interrupted the nasal voice of Brisley, but I can absolutely answer for Gunn. Reputation of the agency at stake, worked with us for three years, parties undoubtedly on the premises, as reported— drink whispered gunn i shall be glad said monty irvin and his voice shook emotionally if you will lend me your pocket lamp i am naturally upset will you kindly both go downstairs i will call if i want you the two men obeyed gunn muttering hoarsely to brisley and monty irvin was left standing on the landing the lamp in his hand he waited until he knew from the sound of their footsteps that the pair had regained the street then resting his arm against the closed door, and pressing his forehead to the damp sleeve of his coat, he stood a while, the lamp, which he held limply, shining down upon the floor. His lips moved, and almost inaudibly he murmured his wife's name. End of chapter 4 Recorded by Olivia Chapter 5 of Dope. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dope by Sax Romer. Chapter 5 The Door is Opened. Quentin Gray and Seaton strolled out of Prince's and both paused while Seaton lighted a long black cheroot. "'It seems a pity to waste that box,' said Gray. "'Suppose we look in at the gaiety for an hour.' His humor was vastly improved, and he watched the passing throngs with an expression more suited to his boyish good looks than that of anger and mortification which had rested upon him an hour earlier. Seaton Pasha tossed a match into the road. "'My official business is finished for the day.' he replied. I place myself unreservedly in your hands. Well, then, began Gray, and paused. A long, low car, the chauffeur temporarily detained by the stoppage of a motor bus ahead, had slowed up within three yards of the spot where they were standing. Gray seized Seaton's arm in a fierce grip. Seaton, he said, his voice betraying intense excitement. Look, there is Monty Irvin. In the car? Yes, yes, but he has two police with him. Seaton, what can it mean? The car moved away, swinging to the right across the traffic stream and clearly heading for Old Bond Street. Quentin Gray's mercurial color deserted him, and he turned to Seaton a face grown suddenly pale. Good God, he whispered, something has happened to Rita. Neglectful of his personal safety, he plunged out into the traffic, dodging this way and that, and making after Monty Irving's car. Of the fact that his friend was close behind him, he remained unaware until, on the corner of Old Bond Street, a firm grip settled upon his shoulder. Gray turned angrily, but the grip was immovable, and he found himself staring into the unemotional face of Seaton Pasha. Seaton, for God's sake, don't detain me. I must learn what's wrong. Pull up, Gray. Quentin Gray clenched his teeth. Listen to me, Seaton. This is no time for interference. I, you, are about to become involved in some very unsavory business. And I repeat, 
pulled up. In a moment we shall learn all there is to be learned. But are you determined openly to thrust yourself into the family affairs of Mr. Monty Irvin? If anything has happened to Rita, I'll kill that damned cur pine. You are determined to intrude upon this man in your present frame of mind at a time of evident trouble? But Gray was deaf to the promptings of prudence and good taste alike. I'm going to see the thing through, he said hoarsely. Quite so. Rely upon me. But endeavor to behave more like a man of the world and less like a dangerous lunatic, or we shall quarrel atrociously. Quentin Gray audibly gnashed his teeth but the cool stare of the other's eyes was swelling, and now, as their glances met and clashed, a sympathetic smile softened the lines of Seaton's grim mouth, and, I quite understand, old chap, he said, licking his arm in Gray's, but can't you see how important it is, for everybody's sake, that we should tackle the thing coolly? Seaton, Gray's voice broke, I'm sorry, I know I'm mad, but I was with her only an hour ago, and now... And now her husband appears on the scene, accompanied by a police inspector and a sergeant. What are your relations with Mr. Monty Irving? They were walking rapidly again along Bond Street. What do you mean, Seaton? asked Gray. I mean, does he approve of your friendship with his wife, or is it a clandestine affair? Clandestine? Certainly not. I was on my way to call at the house when I met her with Pine this evening. That is what I wanted to know. Very well. Since you intend to follow the thing up, it simplifies matters somewhat. Here is the car. At Casma's door. What in heaven's name does it mean? It means that we shall get a very poor reception if we intrude. Question the chauffeur. But Gray had already approached the man, who touched his cap in recognition. What's the trouble, Patterson? he demanded breathlessly. I saw police in the car a moment ago. Yes, sir. I don't rightly know, sir, what's happened. But Mr. Irvin drove from home to the corner of Old Bond Street a quarter of an hour ago and told me to wait, then came back again and drove round to Vine Street to fetch the police. They're inside now. Even as he spoke, with excitement ill-concealed, a police sergeant came out of the doorway and... Move on there, he said to Seaton and Gray. You mustn't hang about this door. Excuse me, sergeant, cried Gray. But if the matter concerns Mrs. Monty Irving, I can probably supply information. The sergeant stared at him hard, saw that both he and his friend wore evening dress, and grew proportionally respectful. What is your name, sir? he asked. I'll mention it to the officer in charge. Quentin Gray. Inform Mr. Monty Irving that I wish to speak to him. Very good, sir. He turned to the chauffeur. Hand me out the bag I gave you at Vine Street. Patterson leaned over the door at the front of the car and brought out a big leather grip. With this in hand, the police sergeant returned into the doorway. We're in for it now, said Seaton grimly, whatever it is. Gray returned no answer, moving restlessly up and down before the door in a fever of excitement and dread. Presently, the sergeant reappeared. Step this way, please, he said. Followed by Seaton and Gray, he led the way up to the landing before Cosma's apartments. It was vaguely lighted by two police lanterns. Four men were standing there, and four pairs of eyes were focused upon the stairhead. Monty Irvin, his features a distressing ashen color, spoke. That you, Gray? Quentin Gray would not have recognized the voice. Thanks for offering your help. God knows I need all I can get. You were with Rita tonight. What happened? Where is she? Heaven knows where she is, cried Gray. I left her here with Pine shortly after seven o'clock. He paused, fixing his gaze upon the face of Brizzly, whose shifty eyes avoided him, and who was licking his lips in the manner of a dog who has seen the whip. Why, said Gray, I believe you are the fellow who has been following me all night for some reason. He stepped towards the foxy little man, but... Never mind, Gray, interrupted Irving. I was to blame. But he was following my wife, not you. Tell me quickly, why did she come here? Gray raised his hand to his brow in a gesture of bewilderment. To consult this man, Casma. I actually saw her enter the inner room. I went to get a cab, and when I returned, the door was locked. 
You knocked? Of course. I made no end of a row. But I could get no reply and went away. Monty Irving turned, a pathetic figure, to the inspector who stood beside him. We may as well proceed, Inspector Whiteleaf, he said. Mr. Gray's evidence shows no light on the matter at all. Uh, very well, sir, was the reply. We have the warrant, and have given the usual notice to whoever may be hiding inside. Burton? The sergeant stepped forward, placing the letter bag on the floor, and stooping, opened it, revealing a number of burglarious-looking instruments. Shall I try to cut through the panel? he asked. No, no, cried Monty Irving. Waste no time. You have a crowbar here. Force the door from its hinges. Hurry, man. It doesn't work on hinges, Gray interrupted excitedly. It slides to the right by means of some arrangement concealed under the mat. Pass that lantern, directed Burton, glancing over his shoulder to Gunn. Sitting it beside him, the sergeant knelt and examined the threshold of the door. Hmm, a metal plate, he said. The weight moves a lever, I suppose, which opens the door if it isn't locked. The lock will be on the left of the door as it opens to the right. Let's see what we can do. He stood up, crowbar in hand, and inserted the chisel blade of the implement between the edge of the door and the door case. Hold steady, said the inspector, standing at his elbow. The dull metallic sound of hammer blows on steel echoed queerly around the well of the staircase. Brisley and Gunn, standing very close together on the bottom step of the stair to the third floor, watched the police furtively. Irvin and Gray found a common fascination in the door itself, and Seaton, cheroot in mouth, looked from group to group with quiet interest. Right, cried the sergeant. The blows ceased. Firmly grasping the bar, Burton brought all his weight to bear upon it. There was a dull cracking sound and a sort of rasping. The door moved slightly. That's where it locks, said the inspector, directing the light of a lantern upon the crevice created. Three inches lower, but it may be bolted as well. We'll soon get at the bolts, replied Burton, the lust of destruction now strong upon him. Wrenching the crowbar from its place, he attacked the lower panel of the door, and amid a loud splintering and crashing, created a hole big enough to allow the passage of a hand and arm. The inspector reached in, groped about, and then uttered an exclamation of triumph. I've unfastened the bolt, he said. If there isn't another at the top, you ought to be able to force the door now, Burton. The jimmy was thrust back into position, and... Stand clear, cried Burton. Again he threw his weight upon the bar, and again. Drive it further in, said Monty Irving, and snatching up the heavy hammer, he rained blows upon the steel butt. Now try. Burton exerted himself to the utmost. Take hold up here somewhat, he panted. Two of us can pull. Gray leapt forward, and the pair of them bent to the work. There came a dull report of parting mechanism, more sounds of splintering wood, and the door rolled open. A moment of tense silence. Then, Is anyone inside there? cried the inspector loudly. Not a sound came from the dark interior. The lantern, whispered Monty Irving. He stumbled into the room, from which a heavy smell of perfume swept out upon the landing. Quentin Gray, snatching the lantern from the floor where it had been replaced, was the next to enter. Look for the switch and turn the lights on, called the inspector, following. Even as he spoke, Gray had found the switch, and the apartment of Kazma became flooded with subdued light. A glance showed it to be unoccupied. Gray ran across to the Mashravia cabinet and jerked the curtains aside. There was no one in the cabinet. It contained a chair and a table. Upon the latter was a telephone and some papers and books. This way, he cried, his voice high-pitched and unnatural. He burst through the doorway into the inner room which he had seen Mrs. Irving enter. The air was laden with the smell of frankincense. A lantern, he called. I left one on the divan. But Monty Irving had caught it up and was already at his elbow. His hand was shaking so that the light danced wildly now upon the carpet now upon the green walls. This room also was deserted. A black gap in the curtain showed where the material had been roughly torn. Suddenly, My God, look, muttered the inspector, who, with the others, now stood in the curious draped apartment. A thin stream of blood was trickling out from beneath the torn hangings. Monty Irving staggered and fell back against the inspector, clutching at him for support. 
but Sergeant Burton, who carried the second lantern, crossed the room and wrenched the green draperies bodily from their fastenings. They had masked a wooden partition or stout screen, having an aperture in the center which could be closed by means of another of the sliding doors. A space some five feet deep was thus walled off from this second room. It contained a massive ebony chair. Behind the chair, and dividing the second room into yet a third section, extended another wooden partition in one end of which was an ordinary office door, and immediately at the back of the chair appeared a little opening or window, some three feet up from the floor. The sound of a groan, followed by that of a dull thud, came from the outer room. Hello, cried Inspector Wheatleaf. Mr. Irving has fainted. Lend a hand. I am here, replied the quiet voice of Seton Pasha. My God, whispered Gray. Seton, Seton. Touch nothing, cried the inspector from outside, until I come. And now the narrow apartment became filled with all the awe-stricken company, excepting only Monty Irving and Brisley, who was attending to the swooning man. Flat upon the floor, between the door and the ebony chair, arms extended and eyes staring upward at the ceiling, lay Sir Lucian Pine, his white shirt front really dyed. In the hush which had fallen, the footsteps of Inspector Whiteleaf sounded loudly as he opened the final door and swept the interior of an inner room with the rays of the lantern. The room was barely furnished as an office. There was another half-glazed door opening onto a narrow corridor. This door was locked. Pine, whispered Gray, pale now to the lips. Do you understand, Seaton? It's Pine. Look, he has been stabbed. Sergeant Burton knelt down and gingerly laid his hand upon the stained linen over the breast of Sir Lucian. Dead? asked the inspector, speaking from the inner doorway. Yes. You say, sir, turning to Quentin Gray, that this is Sir Lucian Pine? Yes. Inspector Whiteley rather clumsily removed his cap. The odor of Seton Charroot announced itself above the oriental perfume with which the place was laden. Burton? Yes. See if this telephone in the office is in order. It seems to be an extension from the outer room. While the others stood grouped about that still figure on the floor, Sergeant Burton entered the little office. Hello, he cried. Yes. A momentary interval, then. It's all right, sir. What number? Gentlemen, said the inspector firmly and authoritatively, I am about to telephone to Vine Street for instructions. No one will leave the premises. Amid an intense hush, Ur Region 201, called Sergeant Burton. End of Chapter 5 Recording by Todd Chapter 6 of Dope This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dope by Sax Romer Chapter 6 Red Carey Chief Inspector Carey of the Criminal Investigation Department stood before the empty grate of his cheerless office in New Scotland Yard, one hand thrust into the pocket of his blue reefer jacket and the other twirling a Malacca cane, which was heavily silver-mounted and which must have excited the envy of every sergeant major beholding it. Chief Inspector Carey wore a very narrow-brimmed bowler hat, having two ventilation holes conspicuously placed immediately above the band. He wore this hat tilted forward and to the right. Red Carey wholly merited his sobriquet, for the man was as red as fire. His hair, which he wore cropped close as a pugilist's, was brightly red, and so was his short, wiry, aggressive mustache. His complexion was red, and from beneath his straight red eyebrows he surveyed the world with a pair of unblinking, intolerant, steel-blue eyes. He never smoked in public, as his taste inclined towards Irish twist and a short clay pipe, but he was addicted to the use of chewing gum, and as he chewed, and he chewed incessantly, he revealed a perfect row of large, white, and positively savage-looking teeth. High cheekbones and prominent maxillary muscles enhanced the truculence indicated by his chin. But next to this truculence, which was the first and most alarming trait to intrude itself upon the observer's attention, 
The outstanding characteristic of Chief Inspector Carey was his compact neatness. Of no more than medium height, but with shoulders like an acrobat, he had slim straight legs and the feet of a dancing master. His attire, from the square-pointed collar down to the neat black brogues, was spotless. His reefer jacket fitted him faultlessly, but his trousers were cut so unfashionably narrow that the protuberant thigh muscles and the line of a highly developed calf could quite easily be discerned. The hand twirl in the cane was small but also muscular, freckled and covered with light down. Red Carey was built on the lines of a whippet, but carried the equipment of an Irish terrier. The telephone bell rang. Inspector Carey moved his square shoulders in a manner oddly suggestive of a wrestler, laid the Malacca cane on the mantel shelf, and crossed to the table. Taking up the telephone, Yes, he said, and his voice was high-pitched and imperious. He listened for a moment. Very good, sir. He replaced the receiver, took off a wet oilskin overall from the back of a chair, and the cane from the mantel shelf. Then, rolling chewing gum from one corner of his mouth into the other, he snapped off the electric light and walked from the room. Along the corridor he went with a lithe, silent step, moving from the hips and swinging his shoulders. Before a door marked private, he paused. From his waistcoat pocket, he took a little silver convex mirror and surveyed himself critically therein. He adjusted his neat tie, replaced the mirror, knocked at the door, and entered the room of the assistant commissioner. This important official was a man constructed on huge principles, a man of military bearing, having tired eyes and a bewildered manner. He conveyed the impression that the collection of documents, books, telephones, and other paraphernalia bestrewing his table had reduced him to a state of stupor. He looked up wearily and met the fierce gaze of the chief inspector with a glance almost apologetic. Ah, Chief Inspector Carey, he said with vague surprise. Yes, I told you to come. Really, I ought to have been at home hours ago. It's most unfortunate. I have to do the work of three men. This is your department, is it not, Chief Inspector? He handed Carey a slip of paper, at which the Chief Inspector stared fiercely. Murder! Sir Lucian Pine! Yes, sir, I am still on duty. His speech, in moments of interest, must have suggested to one overhearing him from an adjoining room, for instance, the operation of a telegraphic instrument. He gave to every syllable the value of a rap, and certain words he terminated with an audible snap of his teeth. Ah, murmured the assistant commissioner. Yes. Divisional inspector, uh, somebody, I cannot read the name, has detained all the parties. But you had better report at Vine Street. It appears to be a big case. He sighed wearily. Very good, sir. With your permission, I will glance at Sir Lucian's pedigree. Uh, certainly, certainly, said the assistant commissioner, waving one large hand in the direction of a bookshelf. Carey crossed the room, laid his oilskin and cane upon a chair, and from the shelf where it reposed took a squat volume. The assistant commissioner, hand pressed to brow, began to study a document which lay before him. Here we are, said Carey, sotto voce. Pine. Sir Lucian, St. Alban, 4th Baronet, son of General Sir Christian Pine, KCB, hmm, born Malta, hmm, Oriel College, first in classics, hmm, blue, India, Burma, contested Wigan, attached British legation, hmm. He returned the book to its place, took up his overall and cane, and, Very good, sir, he said. I will proceed to Vine Street. Oh, certainly, certainly, murmured the assistant commissioner, glancing up absently. Good night. Good night, sir. Oh, uh, chief inspector? Carey turned, his hand on the doorknob. Sir? I, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, oh, yes. The social importance of the murdered man raises the case from the, um, well, you follow me? Public interest will become acute, no doubt. I have therefore selected you for your well-known discretion. I met Sir Lucian once. Very sad. Good night. Good night, sir. Carey passed out into the corridor, closing the door quietly. The assistant commissioner was a man for whom he entertained the highest respect. Despite the bewildered air and wandering manner, 
he knew this big, tired-looking soldier for an administrator of infinite capacity and inexhaustible energy. Proceeding to a room further along the corridor, Chief Inspector Carey opened the door and looked in. Detective Sergeant Coombs, he snapped, and rolled chewing gum from side to side of his mouth. Detective Sergeant Coombs, a plump, short man having lank black hair and a smile of sly contentment perpetually adorning his round face, rose hurriedly from the chair upon which he had been seated. Another man who was in the room rose also, as if galvanized by the glare of the fierce blue eyes. I'm going to Vine Street, said Carey succinctly. You are coming with me, turned and went on his way. Two taxicabs were standing in the yard, and into the first of these Inspector Carey stepped, followed by Coombs, the latter breathing heavily and carrying his hat in his hand, since he had not yet found time to put it on. Vine Street, shouted Carey. Brisk. He leaned back in the cab, chewing industriously. Coombs, having somewhat recovered his breath, assayed speech. Is it something big? he asked. Sure, snapped Carey. Do they send me to stop dogfights? Knowing the man and recognizing the mood, Coombs became silent, and this silence he did not break all the way to Vine Street. At the station, Wait, said Chief Inspector Carey, and went swinging in, carrying his overall and having the Malacca cane tucked under his arm. A few minutes later he came out again and re-entered the cab. Piccadilly, corner of Old Bond Street, he directed the man. Is it burglary? asked Detective Sergeant Coombs with interest. No, said Carey. It's murder, and there seems to be stacks of evidence. Sharpen your pencil. Oh, murmured Coombs. They were almost immediately at their destination, and Chief Inspector Carey, dismissing the cabman, set off along Bond Street with his lithe swinging gait, looking all about him intently. Rain had ceased, but the air was damp and chilly, and few pedestrians were to be seen. A car was standing before Cosmo's premises, the chauffeur walking up and down on the pavement and flapping his hands across his chest in order to restore circulation. The chief inspector stopped. Hi, my man, he said. The chauffeur stood still. Whose car? Mr. Monty Urban's. Carey turned on his heel and stepped to the office door. It was ajar, and Carey, taking an electric torch from his overall pocket, flashed a light upon the nameplate. He stood for a moment, chewing and looking up the darkened stairs. Then, torch in hand, he ascended. Cosmo's door was closed, and the chief inspector rapped loudly. It was opened at once by Sergeant Burton, and Carey entered, followed by Coombs. The room at first sight seemed to be extremely crowded. Monty Irvin, very pale and haggard, sat upon the divan beside Quentin Gray. Seaton was standing near the cabinet, smoking. These three had evidently been conversing at the time of the detective's arrival, with an alert-looking, clean-shaven man whose bag, umbrella, and silk hat stood upon one of the little inlaid tables. Just inside the second door were Brisley and Gunn, both palpably ill at ease, and glancing at Inspector Whiteleaf, who had been interrogating them. Carey chewed silently for a moment, bestowing a fierce stare upon each face in turn. Then, "'Who's in charge?' he snapped. "'I am,' replied Whiteleaf. Why is the lower door open? I thought, don't think. Shut the door. Post your sergeant inside. No one is to go out. Grab anybody who comes in. Where's the body? This way, said Inspector Whiteleaf hurriedly. Then, over his shoulder, go down to the door, Burton. He led Carey toward the inner room, Coombs at his heels. Brisley and Gunn stood aside to give them passage. Gray and Monty Irvin prepared to follow. At the doorway, Carey turned. You will all be good enough to stay where you are, he said. He directed the aggressive stare in Seaton's direction. And if the man smoking a cheroot is not satisfied that he has quite destroyed any clue perceptible by the sense of smell, I should be glad to send out for some fireworks. He tossed his oilskin and cane on the divan and went into the room of seance, savagely biting at a piece of apparently indestructible chewing gum. The torn green curtain had been laid aside and the electric lights turned on in the inside rooms. Pallid, Sir Lucian Pine lay by the ebony chair, glaring horribly upward. Always with the keen eyes glancing this way and that, Inspector Carey crossed the little audience room and entered the enclosure contained between the two screens. By the side of the dead man he stood, 
looking down silently. Then he dropped upon one knee and peered closely into the white face. He looked up. He has not been moved? No. Harry bent yet lower, staring closely at a discolored abrasion on Sir Lucian's forehead. His glance wandered from thence to the carved ebony chair. Still kneeling, he drew from his waistcoat pocket a powerful lens contained in a wash-leather bag. He began to examine the backs and sides of the chair. Once he laid his finger lightly on a protruding point of the carving, and then scrutinized his finger through the glass. He examined the dead man's hands, his nails, his garments. Then he crawled about, peering closely at the carpet. He stood up suddenly. The doctor! he snapped. Inspector Whiteleaf retired, but returned immediately with the clean-shaven man to whom Monty Irving had been talking when Carey arrived. Good evening, doctor, said Carey. Do I know your name? Start your notes, Coombs. My name is Dr. Wilbur Weston, and I live in Arbemarle Street. Who called you? Inspector Whiteleaf telephoned to me about half an hour ago. You examined the dead man? I did. You avoided moving him? It was unnecessary to move him. He was dead, and the wound was in the left shoulder. I pulled his coat open and unbuttoned his shirt. That was all. How long dead? I should say he has been dead not more than an hour when I saw him. What caused death? A stab of some long, narrow-bladed weapon, such as a stiletto. Why a stiletto? Carrie's fierce eyes challenged him. Did you ever see a wound made by a stiletto? Several, in Italy, and one on Saffron Hill. They are characterized by very little external bleeding. Right, doctor. It had reached his heart? Yes. The blow was delivered from behind. How do you know? The direction of the wound is forward. I have seen an almost identical wound in the case of an Italian woman stabbed by a jealous rival. He would fall on his back. Oh, no. He would fall on his face, almost certainly. But he lies on his back. In my opinion, he had been moved. Right. I know he had. Good night, doctor. See him out, inspector. Dr. Weston seemed rather startled by this abrupt dismissal, but the steel-blue eyes of Inspector Carey were already bent again upon the dead man, and murmuring good night, the doctor took his departure, followed by Whiteleaf. Shut the door, snapped Carey after the inspector. I will call when I want you. You stay, Coombs. Got it all down? Sergeant Coombs scratched his head with the end of a pencil, and... Yes, he said with hesitancy. That is, except for the word after... Narrow-bladed weapon such as a... I've got what looks like stilhato. Carey glared. Try taking the cotton wool out of your ears, he suggested. The word was stiletto. S-T-I-L-E-T-T-O. Stiletto. Oh, said Coombs. Thanks. Silence fell between the two men from Scotland Yard. Carey stood a while, chewing and staring at the ghastly face of Sir Lucian. Then... Go through all the pockets, he directed. Sergeant Coombs placed his notebook and pencil upon the seat of the chair and set to work. Carey entered the inside room, or office. It contained a writing table, upon which was a telephone and a pile of old newspapers, a cabinet, and two chairs. Upon one of the chairs lay a crush hat, a cane, and an overcoat. He glanced at some of the newspapers, then opened the drawers of the writing table. They were empty. The cabinet proved to be locked, and a door which he saw must open upon a narrow passage running beside the suite of rooms, was locked also. There was nothing in the pockets of the overcoat, but inside the hat he found pasted the initials L.P. He rolled chewing gum, stared reflectively at the little window immediately above the table, through which a glimpse might be obtained of the ebony chair, and went out again. Nothing, reported Coombs. What do you mean, nothing? His pockets are empty. All of them? Every one. Good, said Carey. Make a note of it. He wears a real pearl stud and a good signet ring, also a gold wristwatch, face broken and hands stopped at 7.15. That was the time he died. He was stabbed from behind as he stood where I'm standing now, fell forward, struck his head on the leg of the chair, and lay face downwards. I've got that, murmured Coombs. What stopped the watch? Broken as he fell. There are tiny fragments of glass stuck in the carpet, showing the exact position in which his body originally lay. And for God's sake, stop smiling. Carrie threw open the door. 
"'Who first found the body?' he demanded of the silent company. "'I did,' cried Quentin Gray, coming forward. "'I and Seton Pasha.' "'Seton Pasha!' Carrie's teeth snapped together so that he seemed to bite off the words. "'I don't see a Turk present.' Seton smiled quietly. "'My friend uses a title which was conferred upon me some years ago by the ex-Khadive,' he said. "'My name is Greville Seton.' Inspector Carey glanced back across his shoulder. "'Notes,' he said. "'I'll knock your ears, Coombs.' He looked at Gray. "'What is your name?' "'Quentin Gray.' "'Who are you, and in what way are you concerned in this case?' "'I am the son of Lord Wexborough, and I—' He paused, glancing helplessly at Seton. He had recognized that the first mention of Rita Irving's name in the police evidence must be made by himself. "'Speak up, sir,' snapped Carey. "'Sergeant Coombs is deaf.' Gray's face flushed, and his eyes gleamed angrily. "'I should be glad, Inspector,' he said, "'if you would remember that the dead man was a personal acquaintance, "'and that other friends are concerned in this ghastly affair.' "'Coombs will remember it,' replied Carey frigidly. "'He's taking notes.' "'Look here,' began Gray. Seaton laid his hand upon the angry man's shoulder. "'Pull up, Gray,' he said quietly. "'Pull up, old chap.' He turned his cool regard upon Chief Inspector Carey, twirling the cord of his monocle about one finger. "'I may remark, Inspector Carey, for I understand this to be your name, that your conduct of the inquiry is not always characterized by the best possible taste.' Carey rolled chewing gum, meeting Seton's gaze with a stare intolerant and aggressive. He imparted the odd writhing motion to his shoulders. "'For my conduct I am responsible to the Commissioner,' he replied." and if he's not satisfied, the commissioner can have my written resignation at any hour in the twenty-four that he's short of a pipe lighter. If it would not inconvenience you to keep quiet for two minutes, I will continue my examination of this witness. End of chapter 6 Recording by Todd Chapter 7 of Dope This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Friend. Dope by Sax Romer. Chapter 7. Further Evidence. The examination of Quentin Gray was three times interrupted by telephone messages from Vine Street, and to the unsatisfactory character of these, the growing irascibility of Chief Inspector Carey bore testimony. Then the divisional surgeon arrived, and Burton incurred the wrath of the chief inspector by deserting his post to show the doctor upstairs. "'If inspired idiocy can help the law,' shouted Carey, "'the man who did this job is as good as dead.' He turned his fierce gaze to Gray's direction. "'Thank you, sir. I need trouble you no further.' "'Do you wish me to remain?' "'No. Inspector Whiteleaf, see these two gentlemen pass the sergeant on duty.' "'But damn it all!' cried Gray, his pent-up emotions at last demanding an outlet. "'I won't submit to your infernal dragooning. "'Do you realize that while you're standing here doing nothing, absolutely nothing, "'an unhappy woman is, I realize,' snapped Carey, showing his teeth in canine fashion, "'that if you're not outside in ten seconds, there's going to be a cloud of dust on the stairs.' White with passion, Gray was on the point of uttering other angry and provocative words when Seaton took his arm in a firm grip. Gray, he said sharply, you leave with me now or I leave alone. The two walked from the room, followed by Whiteleaf. As they disappeared, read all the times mentioned in the last witness's evidence, directed Carey, undisturbed by the recontra. Sergeant Combs smiled rather uneasily, consulting his notebook. At about half past six, I drove to Bond Street, he began. I said the times, rapped Carey. I know to what they refer. Just give me the times as mentioned. Oh, murmured Combs. Yes. About half past six, he ran his finger down the page, a quarter to seven, seven o'clock, twenty-five minutes past seven, eight o'clock. Stop, said Carey. That's enough. He fixed a baleful glance upon Gunn, who from a point of the room discreetly distant from the terrible red man was watching with watery eyes. Who's the smart in all the overcoats, he demanded. My name is James Gunn, replied the greatly insulted man in a husky voice. Who are you? What are you? What are you doing here? I'm employed by Spinker's agency and... Oh, shouted Carey, moving his shoulders. He approached the speaker and glared menacingly into his purple face. 
Ho ho, so you're one of the queer birds out of that roost, are you? Spinker's agency. Ah, uh, yes. He fixed his gaze now upon the pale features of Bristly. I've seen you before, haven't I? Yes, Chief Inspector, said Bristly, licking his lips. Hayward's Heath. We have been retained by... You have been retained, shouted Carey. You have! He twisted round upon his heel, facing Mont Mervyn, angry words trembling on his tongue. But at sight of the broken man who sat there alone, haggard, a subtle change of expression crept into his fierce eyes, and when he spoke again the high-pitched voice was almost gentle. You have employed these men, sir, to watch, he paused, glancing towards Whiteleaf, who had just entered again, and then in the direction of the inner room where the divisional surgeon was at work. To watch my wife, Inspector. Thank you. But all the world will know tomorrow. I might as well get used to it. Mont Irvin's pallor grew positively alarming. He swayed suddenly and extended his hands in a significant groping fashion. Carey sprang forward and supported him. All right, Inspector, all right, muttered Irvin. Thank you. It has been a great shock. At first I feared. You thought your wife had been attacked, I understand. Well, it's not so bad as that, sir. I'm going to walk downstairs to the car with you. But there is so much you will want to know. It can keep until tomorrow. I've enough work in this peep show here to have me busy all night. Come along. Lean on my arm. Mont Irvin rose unsteadily. He knew that there was cardiac trouble in his family, but he had never realized before the meaning of his heritage. He felt physically ill. Inspector, his voice was a mere whisper, have you any theory to explain Mrs. Irvin's disappearance? Don't worry, sir. Without exactly having a theory, I think I may say that, in my opinion, she will turn up presently. God bless you, murmured Irvin, as Carey assisted him out onto the landing. Inspector Whiteleaf held back the sliding door, the mechanism of which had been broken so that the door now automatically remained half-closed. Funny, isn't it, said Gunn, as the two disappeared and Inspector Whiteleaf re-entered, that a man should be so upset about the disappearance of a woman he was going to divorce. Damn funny, said Whiteleaf, whose temper was badly frayed by contact with Carrie. I should have a good laugh if I were you. He crossed the room, going into where the surgeon was examining the victim of this mysterious crime. Gunn stared after him dismally. A person doesn't get much sympathy from the police, Bristly, he declared. That one's almost as bad as him, jerking his thumb in the direction of the landing. Bristly smiled in a somewhat sickly manner. Red Carey is a holy terror, he agreed, sotto voce, glancing aside to where Combs was checking his notes. Look out, here he comes. Now, cried Carey, swinging into the room, what's the game? Plotting to defeat the ends of justice? He stood with hands thrust in reefer pockets, feet wide apart, glancing fiercely from Bristly to Gunn and from Gunn back again to Bristly. Neither of the representatives of Spinsker's agency ventured any remark, and, "'How long have you been watching Mrs. Mont Irvin?' demanded Carey. "'Nearly a fortnight,' replied Bristly. "'Got your evidence in writing?' "'Yes. Up to tonight?' "'Yes.' "'Dictate to Sergeant Combs.' He turned on his heel and crossed to the divan upon which his oilskin overall was lying. Rapidly he removed his reefer and his waistcoat, folded them, and placed them neatly beside his overall. He retained his bowler at its jaunty angle. A cut of presumably flavorless chewing gum he deposited in a brass bowl, and from a little packet which he had taken out of his jacket pocket he drew a fresh piece, redolent of mint. This he put into his mouth, and returned the packet to its resting place. A slim, trim figure, he stood looking round him reflectively. Now, he muttered, what about it? End of chapter 7「8 of Dope. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Friend. Dope by Sax Romer. Chapter 8. Carey Consults the Oracle. The clock of Brixton Town Hall was striking the hour of 1 a.m. as Chief Inspector Carey inserted his key in the lock of the door of his house in Spencer Road. A light was burning in the hallway, and from the little dining room on the left the reflection of a cheerful fire danced upon the white paint of a half-open door. Carey deposited his hat, cane, and overall upon the rack, and moving very quietly entered the room and turned on the light. A modestly furnished and scrupulously neat apartment was revealed. On the sheepskin rug before the fire a Manx cat was dozing beside a pair of carpet slippers. 
On the table, some kind of cold repast was laid, the viands concealed under china covers. At a large bottle of Guinness Extra Stout, Kerry looked with particular appreciation. He heaved a long sigh of contentment and opened the bottle of stout, having poured out a glass of the black and foaming liquid and satisfied an evidently urgent thirst, he explored beneath the covers and presently was seated before a spread of ham and tongue, tomatoes and bread and butter. A door opened somewhere upstairs and... Is that your Dan? inquired a deep but musical female voice. Sure it is, replied Carey, and no one who had heard the high official tones of the imperious chief inspector would have supposed that they could be so softened and modulated. You should have been asleep hours ago, Mary. Have ye to go out again? I have. Bad luck. But don't trouble to come down. I've all I want and more. If tis a new case, I'll come down. It's the devil's own case, but you'll get your death of cold. Sounds of movement in the room above followed, and presently footsteps on the stairs. Mrs. Carey, enveloped in a woolen dressing gown, which obviously belonged to the inspector, came into the room. Upon her, Carey directed a look from which all fierceness had been effaced, and which expressed only an undying admiration. And indeed, Mary Carey was in many respects a remarkable character. Half an inch taller than Carey, she fully merited the compliment designed by the trite apophthegm, quote, a fine woman, close quote. Large boned but shapely, as she came in with her long dark hair neatly plaited, it seemed to her husband, who had remained her lover, that he saw before him the rosy cheeked lass whom ten years before he had met and claimed on the chilly shores of Loch Broom. By all her neighbors, Mrs. Carey was looked upon as a proud, reserved person who had held herself much aloof since her husband had become chief inspector, and the reputation enjoyed by Red Carey was that of an aggressive and uncompanionable man. Now here was a lover's meeting, not lacking the shy, downward glance of dark eyes as steel-blue eyes flashed frank admiration. Carey, who quarreled with everybody except the assistant commissioner, had only found one cause of quarrel with Mary. He was a devout Roman Catholic, and for five years he had clung with the bulldog tenacity which was his to the belief that he could convert his wife to the faith of Rome. She remained true to the Scottish Free Church, in which precepts she had been reared, and at the end of the five years Carey gave it up and admired her all the more for her Caledonian strength of mind. Many and heated were the debates he had held with worthy Father O'Callaghan respecting the validity of a marriage not solemnized by a priest, but of late years he had grown reconciled to the parting of the ways on Sunday morning, and as the early mass was over before the Scottish service, he was regularly to be seen outside a certain Presbyterian chapel waiting for his heretical spouse. He pulled her down to his knee and kissed her. "'It's twelve hours since I saw you,' he said. She rested her arm on the back of the saddleback chair, and her dark head close beside Carrie's fiery red one. "'My kinney ye had a new case on,' she said, "'when it grew so late.' How long can ye stay? An hour, no more. There's a lot to do before the papers come out in the morning. By breakfast time, all England, including the murderer, will know I'm in charge of the case. I wish I could muzzle the press. Tis a murder, then? The Lord give us grace. Ye'd be wishing to tell me? Yes, I'm stumped. You've time for a rest and a smoke. Put your slippers on. I've no time for that, Mary. She stood up and took the slippers from the hearth. Put your slippers on, she repeated firmly. Carey stooped without another word and began to unlace his brogues. Meanwhile, from a side table, his wife brought a silver tobacco box and a stumpy Irish clay. The slippers substituted for his shoes, Carey lovingly filled the cracked and blackened bowl with strong Irish twist, which he first teased carefully in his palm. The bowl rested almost under his nostrils when he put the pipe in his mouth, and how he contrived to light it without burning his mustache was not readily apparent. He succeeded, however, and soon was puffing clouds of pungent smoke into the air with the utmost contentment. Now, said his wife, seating herself upon the arm of the chair, tell me then. Thereupon began a procedure identical to that which had characterized the outset of every successful case of the chief inspector. He rapidly outlined the complexities of the affair in Old Bond Street, and Mary Carey surveyed the problem with a curious and almost fey detachment of mind, which enabled her to see light where all was darkness to the man on the spot. With the clarity of a trained observer, Carey described the apartments of Cosma, the exact place where the murdered man had been found, and the construction of the rooms. 
he gave the essential points from the evidence of the several witnesses, quoting the exact times at which various episodes had taken place. Mary Carey, looking straightly before her with unseeing eyes, listened in silence until he ceased speaking. Then, There are really but two rooms, she said in a faraway voice. But the sack of these partitioned into three parts? That's it. A door free the landing opens upon the first room. A door free a passage opens upon the second. Where does yon passage lead? From the main stair along beside Cosmo's rooms to a small back stair. This back stair goes from top to bottom of the building, from the end of the same hallway as the main stair. There's no either way out but the front door? No. Then if the evidence of the spinker man is above suspicion, Mrs. Irvin and this Cosma were still on the premises when ye arrived. Exactly. I gathered that much at Vine Street before I went on to Bond Street. The whole block was surrounded five minutes after my arrival, and still is. What other offices are in this passage? None. It's a blank wall on the left, and the one door on the right, the one opening into Cosma's office. There are other premises on the same floor, but they are across the landing. What premises? A solicitor and a commission agent. The floor below? It's all occupied by a Medista, Renan. The top floor? Cabana Cigarette Company, a servants and an electrician. Nay more? No more. Where does Jean Baxter open on the top meist floor? In a corridor similar to that alongside Cosmas. It has two windows, on the right overlooking a narrow roof and the top of the arcade, and on the left is the Cubana Cigarette Company. The other officers are across the landing. Mary Carey stared into space a while. Cosma and Mrs. Irwin could have come down the first floor, or gin up to the third floor unseen by the Spintker man, she said dreamily. But they couldn't have reached the street, my dear, cried Carey. No, they couldn't have gained the street. She became silent again her husband watching her expectantly. Then, if poor Sir Lucian Payne was killed at a quarter after seven, the time his watch was broken, the native siren did not kill him. Fry the spinker's evidence a black man went out before then, she said. Mrs. Irvin? Carey shook his head. From all accounts, a slip of a woman, he replied. It was a strong hand that struck the blow. Cosma? Probably. Mr. Quentin Gray came back with a cab and went upstairs, free the spinker's evidence, at about a quarter after seven, and came doon five minutes later, sire pale and fretful. Carey surrounded himself and the speaker with wreaths of stifling smoke. We have only the bare word of Mr. Gray that he didn't go in again, Mary, but I believe him. He's a hot-headed fool, but square. Then twas Jan Cosma, announced Mrs. Carey. Who is Cosma? Her husband laughed shortly. That's the point at which I got stumped, he replied. We've heard of him at the yard, of course. We know that under the cloak of a dealer in eastern perfumes, he carried on a fortune-telling business. He managed to avoid prosecution, though. It took me over an hour tonight to explore the thought-reading mechanism. It's a sort of masculine's mysteries, work from the inside room. But who Cosma is or what's his nationality, I know no more than the man in the moon. Perfume? queried the faraway voice. Yes, Mary. The first room is a sort of miniature scent bazaar. There are funny little imitation antique flasks of Cosma's preparations, creams, perfumes, and incense. Also small square wooden boxes of a kind of Turkish delight, and a stock of Egyptian mummy heads, statuettes, and the like, which may be genuine for all I know. Nigh books or letters? Not a thing, except his own advertisements, a telephone directory, and so on. The inside office bureau? empty as Mother Hubbard's cupboard. The place was ransacked by the same folk that emptied the dead man's pockets as to leave no clue, pronounced the sibyl-like voice. Mr. Gray said he had chocolates with him. Where did he leave him? Mary, you're a wonder, exclaimed the admiring Carrie. The box was lying on the divan in the first room where he said he had left it on going out for a cab. Does not all the evidence show if Mrs. Irvin had been at Cosmos before? Yes, she went there fairly regularly to buy perfume. Not for the fortune-telling. No, according to Mr. Gray, to buy perfume. Had Mr. Gray been with her before? No, Sir Lucian Pine seems to have been her pretty constant companion. Do you suspect she was his lady, love? I believe Mr. Gray suspects something of the kind. And Mr. Gray? He's not such an old friend as Sir Lucian was, but I fancy, nevertheless, it was Mr. Gray that her husband doubted. Do you suspect the poor soul had cause, then? 
No, replied Carrie promptly. I don't. The boy is mad about her, but I fancy she just liked his company. He's the heir of Lord Rexborough, and Mrs. Irvin used to be a stage beauty. It's the usual state of affairs, and more often than not means nothing. I dinna ken such folk, declared Mary Carey. They almost deserve all they get. They are bound to come to a good end. Where did you say Sir Lucien lived? Albemarle Street, just round the corner. You told me that he only kept twa servants, a cook, housekeeper, who lived a, on a man, a foreigner. A kind of half-baked dago, named Juan Marino, a citizen of the United States, according to his own account. You didn't like Juan Marino. He's a hateful swine, flashed Carey with a sudden venom. I'm watching Marino very closely. Combs is at work upon Sir Lucian's papers. His life was a bit of a mystery. He seems to have had no relations living, and I can't find that he even employed a solicitor. You'll be searching for the Egyptian? The servant? Yes, we'll have him by the morning, and then we shall know who Cosma is. Meanwhile, in which of the offices is Cosma hiding? Mary Carey was silent for so long that her husband repeated the question. In which of the offices is Cosma hiding? In none, she said dreamily. Ye surrounded the buildings too late, akin. Huh? cried Carey, turning his head excitedly. But the man bristly was at the door all night. It doesn't matter. They escaped. Carey scratched his close-cropped head in angry perplexity. You're always right, Mary, he said. But hang me if... Never mind. When we get the servant, we'll soon get Cosma. Aye, murmured his wife. If you had not got Cosma, then I will. But Mary, this isn't helping me. It's mystifying me deeper than ever. It's not clear no Don. But for sure, behind this mystery of the death of Sir Lucian, there's a darker mystery still. Sire dark. Tis the biggest case you ever had. Dinna look for Cosma. Look to find why the woman went to him, and try to find the meaning of the small window behind the big chair. Yes, she seemed to be staring at some distant, visible object. Watch the man, Marino. But Mrs. Irvin is in God's good keeping. You don't think she's dead? She is worse than dead. Her sins have found her out. The frayed light suddenly left her eyes, and they became filled with tears. She turned impulsively to her husband. Oh, Dan, you must find her. You must find her. Poor weak heart. Dinny, you can how she is suffering. My dear, he said, putting his arms around her. What is it? What is it? She brushed the tears from her eyes and tried to smile. Tis something like the second sight, Dan, she answered simply. And it's escaped me again. Almost had the clue to it, and oh, there's some horrible wickedness in it, and cruelty and shame. The clock on the mantel shelf began to peal. Carrie was watching his wife's rosy face with a mixture of loving admiration and wonder. She looked so very bonny and placid and capable that he was puzzled anew at the strange gift which she seemingly inherited from her mother, who had been equally shrewd, equally comely, and similarly endowed. God bless us all, he said, kissed her heartily, and stood up. Back to bed you go, my dear. I must be off. There's Mr. Irvin to see in the morning, too. A few minutes later, he was swinging through the deserted streets, his mind wholly occupied with lover-like reflections to the exclusion of those professional matters which properly should have been engaging his attention. As he passed the end of a narrow court near the railway station, the gleam of his silver-mounted malacca attracted the attention of a couple of loafers who were leaning one on other side of an iron pillar in the shadow of the unsavory alley. Not another pedestrian was in sight, and only the remote night sounds of London broke the silence. Twenty paces beyond, the footfall silently closed in upon their prey. The taller of the pair reached him first, only to receive a backhanded blow full in the face which sent him reeling a couple yards. Round leapt the assaulted man to face his second assailant. If you two smarts really want handling, he rapped ferociously, say the word and I'll bash you flat. As he turned, the light of a neighboring lamp shone down upon the savage face, and a smothered yell came from the shorter ruffian. Blimey, Bill! It's Red Carey! Whereupon, as men pursued by devils, the pair made off like the wind. Carey glared after the retreating figures for a moment, and a grin of fierce satisfaction revealed his gleaming teeth. He turned again and swung on his way toward the main road. The incident had done him good. It had banished domestic matters from his mind, and he was become again the highly trained champion of justice, standing an unseen buckler between society and the criminal. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of Dope 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia. Dope by Sax Romer. Chapter 9. A Packet of Cigarettes. Following their dismissal by Chief Inspector Carey, Seaton and Gray walked around to the latter's chambers in Piccadilly. They proceeded in silence, Gray too angry for speech, and Seaton busy with reflections. As the man admitted them, "'Has anyone phoned, Willis?' asked Gray. "'No one, sir.' They entered a large room which combined the characteristics of a library with those of a military gymnasium. Gray went to a side table and mixed drinks. Placing a glass before Seaton, he emptied his own at a draft. "'If you'll excuse me for a moment,' he said, "'I should like to ring up and see if by any possible chance there's news of Rita.' He walked out to the telephone, and Seaton heard him making a call. Then, "'Hello. Is that you, Hinks?' he asked. "'Yes, speaking. Is Mrs. Irvin at home?' A few moments of silence followed, and, "'Thanks. Goodbye,' said Gray. He rejoined his friend. "'Nothing,' he reported, and made a gesture of angry resignation. "'Evidently Hinks is still unaware of what has happened. "'Irvin hasn't returned yet. "'Seaton, this business is driving me mad.' "'He refilled his glass, and having looked in his cigarette case, "'began to ransack a small cupboard. "'Damn it all!' he exclaimed. "'I haven't got a cigarette in the place.' "'I don't smoke them myself,' said Seaton. "'But I can offer you a cheroot.' Mm, "'Thanks. They're a trifle too strong.' Oh, hello, here are some. From the back of a shelf he produced a small, plain brown packet and took out of it a cigarette, at which he stared oddly. Seaton, smoking one of the inevitable cheroots, watched him, tapping his teeth with the rim of his eyeglass. Poor old Pine, muttered Gray, and, looking up, met the inquiring glance. Pine left these here only the other day, he explained awkwardly. I don't know where he got them, but they are something very special. I suppose I might as well. He lighted one, and, uttering a weary sigh, threw himself into a deep leather-covered armchair. Almost immediately he was up again. The telephone bell had rung. His eyes alight with hope, he ran out, leaving the door open, so that his conversation was again audible to the visitor. Yes, yes, speaking. What? His tone changed. Oh, it's you, Margaret. What? Certainly, delighted. No, there's nobody here but old Seton Pasha. What? You've heard the fellows talk about him who were out east? Yes, that's the chap. Come right along. You don't propose to lionize me, I hope, Gray, said Seaton, as Gray returned to his seat. The other laughed. I forgot you could hear me, he admitted. It's my cousin, Margaret Halley. You'll like her. She's a tip-top girl, but eccentric. Goes in for pilling. Pilling? inquired Seaton gravely. Doctoring. She's an MRCS, and only about twenty-four or so. Frightfully clever kid. Makes me feel an infant. Flat heels, spectacles, and a judicial manner? Flat heels, yes, but not the other. She's awfully pretty, and used to look simply terrific and khaki. She was an M.O. in Serbia, you know, and afterwards at some nurse's hospital in Kent. She's started in practice for herself now, round in Dover Street. I wonder what she wants. Silence fell between them for, although prompted by differing reasons, both were undesirous of discussing the tragedy, and this silence prevailed until the ringing of the doorbell announced the arrival of the girl. Willis, opening the door, she entered composedly, and Gray introduced Seaton. "'I'm so glad to have met you at last, Mr. Seaton,' she said laughingly. "'From Quentin's many accounts, I'd formed the opinion that you were a kind of Arabian Nights myth.' "'I'm glad to disappoint you,' replied Seaton." finding something very refreshing in the company of this pretty girl who wore a creased Burberry and stray locks of whose abundant bright hair floated about her face in the most careless fashion imaginable. She turned to her cousin, frowning in a rather puzzled way. Whatever have you been burning here? she asked. There is such a curious smell in the room. Gray laughed more heartily than he had laughed that night, glancing in Seaton's direction. So much for your taste in cigars, he cried. Oh, said Margaret, I'm sure it's not Mr. Seaton's cigar. It isn't a smell of tobacco. I don't believe they're made of tobacco, cried Gray, laughing louder yet, though his merriment was forced. Seaton smiled good-naturedly at the joke, but he had perceived at the moment of Margaret's entrance the fact that her gaiety also was assumed. 
Serious business had dictated her visit, and he wondered the more to note how deeply this odor, real or fancied, seemed to intrigue her. She sat down in the chair which Gray placed by the fireside, and her cousin unceremoniously slid the brown packet of cigarettes across the little table in her direction. "'Try one of these, Margaret,' he said. "'They're great, and will quite drown the unpleasant odor of which you complain.' Whereupon the observant Seaton saw a quick change take place in the girl's expression. She had the same clear coloring as her cousin, and now this freshness deserted her cheeks, and her pretty face became quite pale. She was staring at the brown packet. "'Where did you get them?' she asked quietly. A smile faded from Gray's lips. Those five words had translated him in spirit to that green-draped room in which Sir Lucian Pine was lying dead. He glanced at Seaton in the appealing way which sometimes made him appear so boyish. Uh, from Pine, he replied. I, I must tell you, Margaret. Sir Lucian Pine, she interrupted. Yes, not from Reed Irvin. Quentin Gray started upright in his chair. No, but, but why do you mention her? Margaret bit her lip in sudden perplexity. Oh, I don't know. She glanced apologetically toward Seaton. He rose immediately. My dear Miss Halley, he said, I perceive, indeed I had perceived all along, that you have something of a private nature to communicate to your cousin. But Gray stood up and, Seaton, Margaret, he said, looking from one to the other. I, I mean to say, Margaret, if you've anything to tell me about Rita, have you, have you? He fixed his gaze eagerly upon her. I have, yes. Seaton prepared to take his leave, but Gray impetuously thrust him back, immediately turning again to his cousin. Perhaps you haven't heard, Margaret, he began. I have heard what has happened tonight to Sir Lucian. Both men stared at her silently for a moment. Seaton has been with me all the time, said Gray. If he will consent to stay, with your permission, Margaret, I should like him to do so. Why, certainly, agreed the girl. In fact, I shall be glad of his advice. Seaton inclined his head, and without another word resumed his seat. Gray was too excited to sit down again. He stood on the tiger-skin rug before the fender, watching his cousin and smoking furiously. Firstly, then, continued Margaret, please throw that cigarette in the fire, Quentin. Gray removed the cigarette from between his lips and stared at it dazedly. He looked at the girl, and the clear gray eyes were watching him with an inscrutable expression. Right-ho, he said awkwardly, and tossed the cigarette in the fire. You used to smoke like a furnace, Margaret. Is this some new cult? I still smoke a great deal more than is good for me, she confessed. But I don't smoke opium. The effect of these words upon the two men who listened was curious. Gray turned an angry glance upon the brown packet lying on the table, and <laughs> he exclaimed, and drawing a handkerchief from his sleeve, began disgustedly to wipe his lips. Seaton stared hard at the speaker, tossed his cheroot into the fire, and taking up the packet, withdrew a cigarette and sniffed at it critically. Margaret watched him. He tore the wrapping off and tasted a strand of the tobacco. "'Good heavens!' he whispered. "'Gray, these things are doped!' End of chapter 9Chapter 10 of Dope. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Friend. Dope by Sax Romer. Chapter 10. Sir Lucian's Study Window. Old Bond Street presented a gloomy and deserted prospect to Chief Inspector Carey as he turned out of Piccadilly and swung along toward the premises of Cosma. He glanced at the names on some of the shop windows as he passed, and wondered if the furriers, jewelers, and other merchants dealing in costly wares properly appreciated the services of the Metropolitan Police Force. He thought of the peacefully slumbering tradesmen in their suburban homes, the safety of their stocks wholly dependent upon the vigilance of that unsleeping eye, for to an unsleeping eye he mentally compared the service of which he was a member. A constable stood on duty before the door of the block. Red Carey was known by sight and reputation to every member of the force, and the constable saluted as the celebrated chief inspector appeared. Anything to report, constable? Yes, sir. What? The ambulance has been for the body, and another gentleman has been. Carey stared at the man. Another gentleman? Who the devil's the other gentleman? I don't know, sir. He came with Inspector Whiteleaf and was inside for nearly an hour. Inspector Whiteleaf is off duty. 
What time was this? Twenty thirty, sir. Carey chewed reflectively, ere nodding to the man and passing on. Another gentleman, he muttered, entering the hallway. Why didn't Inspector Worley report this? Who the devil, deep in thought, he walked upstairs, finding his way by the light of the pocket torch which he carried. A second constable was on duty at Cosmo's door. He saluted. Anything to report, rapped Carey. Yes, sir. The body has been removed, and the gentleman with Inspector, damn that for a tale, describe this gentleman. Rather tall, pale, dark, clean-shaven, wore a fur-collared overcoat, collar turned up. He was accompanied by Inspector Whiteleaf. Hmm. Anything else? Yes. About an hour ago, I heard a noise on the next floor. Eh? Ah! Snapped Carrie and shone the light subtly into the man's face so that he blinked furiously. Ah! What kind of noise? Very slight. Like something moving. Like something. Like what thing? A cat or an elephant? More like, say, a box or a piece of furniture. And you did what? I went up to the top landing and listened. What did you hear? Nothing at all, Chief Inspector Carey chewed audibly. All quiet, he snapped. Absolutely, but I'm certain I heard something all the same. How long had Inspector Whiteleaf and this dark horse in the fur coat been gone at the time you heard the noise? About a half hour, sir. Do you think the noise came from the landing or from one of the offices above? An office, I should say. It was very dim. Chief Inspector Carey pushed upon the broken door and walked into the rooms of Cosma. Flashing the ray of his torch on the wall, he found the switch and snapped up the lights. He removed his overall and tossed it on the divan with his cane. Then, tilting his bowler further forward, he thrust his hands into his reefer pockets and stood staring toward the door, beyond which lay the room of the murder in darkness. Who is he? he muttered. What's it mean? Taking up the torch, he walked through and turned on the lights in the inner rooms, for a long time, he stood staring at the little square window low down behind the ebony chair, striving to imagine uses for it as his wife had urged him to do. The globular green lamp in the second apartment was worked by three switches situated in the inside room, and he had discovered that in this way the visitor who came to consult Cosmo was treated to the illusion of a gradually falling darkness. Then, the door in the first partition being opened, Whoever sat in the ebony chair would become visible by the gradual uncovering of a light situated above the chair. On this light being covered again, the figure would apparently fade away. It was ingenious, and, so far, quite clear. But two things badly puzzled the inquirer. The little window down behind the chair, and the fact that all the arrangements for raising and lowering the lights were situated not in the narrow chamber in which Cosmo's chair stood, and in which Sir Lucian had been found, but in the room behind it the room with which the little window communicated. The table upon which the telephone rested was set immediately under this mysterious window. The window was provided with a green blind, and the switchboard controlling the complicated lighting scheme was also within reach of anyone seated at the table. Carey rolled mint gum from side to side of his mouth and absently tried the handle of the door opening out from this interior room, evidently the office of the establishment, into the corridor. He knew it to be locked, Turning, he walked through the suite and out onto the landing, passing the constable and going upstairs to the top floor, torch in hand. From the main landing, he walked along the narrow corridor until he stood at the head of the back stairs. The door nearest to him bore the name, Cubanus Cigarette Company. He tried the handle. The door was locked, as he had anticipated. Kneeling down, he peered into the keyhole, holding the electric torch close beside his face and chewing industriously. Ere long he stood up, descended again, but by the back stair, and stood staring reflectively at the door communicating with Cosma's inner room, then walking along the corridor to where the man stood on the landing. He went in again to the mysterious apartments, but only to get his cane and his overall and to turn out the lights. Five minutes later, he was ringing the late Sir Lucian's doorbell. A constable admitted him, and he walked straight through into the study where Combs, Looking very tired, but smiling undauntedly, sat at a littered table studying piles of documents. Anything to report, rapped Carey. The man, Marino, has gone to bed, and the expert from the home office has been Inspector Carey brought his cane down with a crash upon the table, whereat Combs started nervously. So that's it, he shouted furiously. An expert from the home office. So that's the dark horse in the fur coat. Combs, I'm fed up to the back teeth with this gun from the home office. If I'm not to have entire charge of the case, I'll throw it up. I'll stand for no blasted overseer checking my work. Wait till I see the assistant commissioner. What the devil has the job to do with the home office? 
can't say, murmured Cones, but he's evidently a big bug from the way Whiteleaf treated him. He instructed me to stay in the kitchen and keep an eye on Marino while he prowled about in here. Instructed you, cried Carey, his teeth gleaming and his steel blue eyes creating upon Combs' mind an impression that they were emitting sparks. Instructed you. I'll ask you a question, Detective Sergeant Combs. Who is in charge of this case? Well, I thought you were. You thought I was? Well, you are. I am. Very well. You were saying... I was saying that I went into the kitchen. Before that, something about instructed. Poor Combs smiled pathetically. Look here, he said, bravely meeting the ferocious glare of his superior. As man to man, what could I do? You could stop smiling, snapped Carrie. Hell, he paced several times up and down the room. Go ahead, Combs. Well, there's nothing much to report. I stayed in the kitchen, and the man from the home office was in here alone for about half an hour. Alone? Inspector Whiteleaf stayed in the dining room. Had he been instructed to? I expected so. I think he just came along as a sort of guide. Ah, muttered Carey savagely. A sort of guide. Any idea what the boogeyman did in here? He opened the window. I heard him. That's funny. It's exactly what I'm going to do. This smart from Whitehall hasn't got a corner in notions yet, Combs. The room was a large and lofty one and had been used by a former tenant as a studio. The top lights had been roofed over by Sir Lucian, however, but the raised platform, approached by two steps, which had probably been used as a model's throne, was a permanent fixture of the apartment. It was backed now by bookcases, except where a blue plush curtain was draped before a French window. Carey drew the curtain back and threw open the folding leaves of the window. He found himself looking out upon the leads of Albemarle Street. No stars and no moon showed through the gray clouds draping the wintry sky, but a dim and ghostly half-light nevertheless rendered the ugly expanse visible from where he stood. On one side loomed a huge tank, to the brink of which a rickety wooden ladder invited the explorer to ascend. Beyond it were a series of iron gateways and ladders forming part of the fire emergency arrangements of the neighboring institution. Straight ahead, a section of building jutted up and revealed two small windows, which seemed to regard him like watching eyes. He walked out onto the roof, looking all about him. Beyond the tank opened a frowning gully, the arcade connecting Albemarle Street with Old Bond Street. On the other hand, the scheme of fire gangways was continued. He began to cross the leads, going in the direction of Bond Street. Combs watched him from the study. When he came to the more northerly of the two windows, which had attracted his attention, he knelt down and flashed the ray of his torch through the glass. A kind of small warehouse was revealed, containing stacks of packages. Immediately inside the window was a rough wooden table, and on this table lay a number of smaller packages, apparently containing cigarettes. Carey turned his attention to the fastening of the window. A glance showed him that it was unlocked. Resting the torch on the leads, he grasped the sash and gently raised the window, noting that it opened almost noiselessly. Then, taking up the torch again, he stooped and stepped in on to the table below. It moved slightly beneath his weight. One of the legs was shorter than his fellow's, but he reached the floor as quietly as possible and instantly snapped off the light of the torch. A heavy step sounded from outside. Someone was mounting the stairs, and a disk of light suddenly appeared upon the ground glass panel of the door. Carey stood quite still, chewing steadily. "'Who's there?' came the voice of the constable posted on Cosma's landing. The inspector made no reply. "'Is there anyone here?' cried the man. The disk of light disappeared, and the alert constable could be heard moving along the corridor to inspect the other officers. But the ray had shone upon the frosted glass long enough to enable Carey to read the words painted there in square black letters. They had appeared reversed, of course, and had read thus. Och Edoragus Cinebuke. End of chapter 10. Chapter 11 of Dope. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Friend. Dope by Sax Romer. Chapter 11. The Drug Syndicate. At 6.30 that morning, Margaret Haley was aroused by her maid, the latter but half awake, and sitting up in bed and switching on the lamp, she looked at the card which the servant had brought to her and read the following. Chief Inspector Carey, CID, New Scotland Yard, SWI. Oh, dear, she said sleepily. What an appallingly early visitor. Is the bath ready yet, Janet? 
I'm afraid not, replied the maid, a plain elderly woman of the old-fashioned useful servant type. Shall I take a kettle into the bathroom? Yes, that will have to do. Tell Inspector Carey that I shall not be long. Five minutes later, Margaret entered her little consulting room, where Carey, having adjusted his tie, was standing before the mirror in the overmantel, staring at a large photograph of the charming lady doctor in military uniform. Carrie's fierce eyes sparkled appreciatively as his glance rested on the tall figure arrayed in a woolen dressing gown, the masculine style of which by no means disguised the beauty of Margaret's athletic figure. She had hastily arranged her bright hair with deliberate neglect of all affectation. She belonged to that ultra-modern school which scorns to sue masculine admiration, but which cannot dispense with it nevertheless. She aspired to be assessed upon an intellectual basis, an ambition which her unfortunate good looks rendered difficult of achievement. "'Good morning, Inspector,' she said composedly. "'I was expecting you.' "'Really, Miss,' Carrie stated curiously. "'Then you know what I've come about.' "'I think so. Won't you sit down? I'm afraid the room is rather cold. Is it about Sir Lucian Pine?' "'Well,' replied Carrie, "'it concerns him, certainly.' I've been in communication by telephone with Hinks, Mr. Monte Irvin's butler, and from him I learned that you were professionally attending Mrs. Irvin. I was not her regular medical advisor, but Margaret hesitated, glancing rapidly at the inspector and then down at the writing table before which she was seated. She began to tap the blotting pad with an ivory paper knife, Carrie watching her intently. Upon your evidence, Miss Haley, he said rapidly, may depend the life of the missing woman. Oh, cried Margaret. Whatever can have happened to her? I rang up as late as two o'clock this morning. After that, I abandoned hope. There's something underlying the case that I don't understand, miss. I look to you to put me wise. She turned to him impulsively. I will tell you all I know, Inspector, she said. I will be perfectly frank with you. Good, rapped Carrie. Now, you have known Mrs. Monte Irvin for some time. For about two years. You didn't know her when she was on the stage? No, I met her at a Red Cross concert at which she sang. Do you think she loved her husband? I know she did. Was there any prior attachment? Not that I know of. Mr. Quinton Gray? Margaret smiled, rather mirthlessly. He is my cousin, Inspector, and it was I who introduced him to Rita Irvin. I sincerely wish I had never done so. He lost his head completely. There was nothing in Mrs. Irvin's attitude towards him to justify her husband's jealousy? She was always frightfully indiscreet, Inspector, but nothing more. You see, she is greatly admired and is used to the company of silly, adoring men. Her husband doesn't really understand the ways of these bohemian folks. I knew it would lead to trouble sooner or later. Ah! Chief Inspector Carey thrust his hands into the pockets of his jacket. Now, Sir Lucian. Margaret tapped more rapidly with the paper knife. Sir Lucien belonged to a set of which Rita had been a member during her stage career. I think... He admired her. In fact, I believe he had offered her marriage, but she did not care for him in the least, in that way. Then in what way did she care for him, rapped Carrie. Well, now we are coming to the point. Momentarily she hesitated. Then, they were both addicted. Yes, to drugs. Eh? Carrie's eyes grew hard and fierce in a moment. What drugs? All sorts of drugs. Shortly after I became acquainted with Rita Irvin, I learned that she was a victim of the drug habit, and I tried to cure her. I regret to say that I failed. At that time, she had acquired a taste for opium. Carrie said not a word, and Margaret raised her head and looked at him pathetically. I can see that you have no pity for the victims of this ghastly vice, Inspector Carey, she said. I haven't, he snapped fiercely. I admit I haven't, miss. It's bad enough in the heathens, but for an Englishwoman to dope herself is downright unchristian and beastly. Yet I have come across so many of these cases during the war and since that I have begun to understand how easy, how dreadfully easy it is for a woman especially to fall into the fatal habit. Bereavement, or that most frightful of all mental agonies, suspense, will too often lead the poor victim into the path that promises forgetfulness. Rita Irvin's case is less excusable. I think she must have begun drug-taking because of the mental and nervous exhaustion resulting from late hours and overmuch gaiety. The demands of her profession proved too great for her impaired nervous energy, and she sought some stimulant which would enable her to appear bright on the stage when actually she should have been recuperating, in sleep, that loss of vital force which can be recuperated in no other way. But opium, snapped Carrie. 
I am afraid her other drug habits had impaired her will and shaken her self-control. She was tempted to try opium by its promise of a new and novel excitement. Her husband, I take it, was ignorant of this? I believe he was. Quinton, Mr. Gray, had no idea of it either. Then it was Sir Lucian Pine who was in her confidence in this matter. Margaret nodded slowly, still tapping the blotting pad. He used to accompany her to places where drugs could be obtained, and on several occasions, I cannot say how many, I believe he went with her to some den in Chinatown. It may have been due to Mr. Irvin's discovery that his wife could not satisfactorily account for some of these absences from home, which led him to suspect her fidelity. Ah! shouted Carey hardly. I shouldn't wonder. And now, he thrust out a pointing finger, where did she get these drugs? Margaret met the fierce stare composedly. I have said that I shall be quite frank, she replied. In my opinion, she obtained them from Cosma. Cosma, shouted Carey. Excuse me, miss, but I see I've been wearing blinkers without knowing it. Cosma's was a dope shop? That has been my belief for a long time, Inspector. I may add that I have never been able to obtain a shred of evidence to prove it. I am so keenly interested in seeing the people who pander to this horrible vice, unmasked and dealt with as they merit, that I have tried many times to find out if my suspicion was correct. Inspector Carey was wreathing his shoulders excitedly. Did you ever visit Cosma? he asked. Yes, I asked Rita Irvin to take me, but she refused, and I could see that the request embarrassed her, so I went alone. Describe exactly what took place. Margaret Haley stared reflectively at the blotting pad for a moment, and then described a typical seance at Cosmas. In conclusion, As I came away, she said, I bought a bottle of every kind of perfume on sale, some of the incense, and also a box of sweetmeat, but they all proved to be perfectly harmless. I analyzed them. Carrie's eyes glistened with admiration. We could do with you at the yard, miss, he said. Excuse me for saying so. Margaret smiled rather wanly. Now, this man, Cosma, resumed the chief inspector, did you ever see him again? Never. I have been trying for months and months to find out who he is. Carrie's face became very grim. About ten trained men are trying to find that out at the present moment, he rapped. Do you think he wore a makeup? He may have done so, Margaret admitted. But his features were obviously undisguised, and his eyes one would recognize anywhere. They were larger than any human eyes I have ever seen. He couldn't have been the Egyptian who looked after the shop, for instance. Impossible. He did not remotely resemble him. Besides, the man to whom you refer remained outside to receive other visitors. Oh, that's out of the question, Inspector. The light was very dim? Very dim indeed. And Cosma never once raised his head. Indeed, except for a dignified gesture of greeting and one of dismissal, he never moved. His immobility was rather uncanny. Carey began to pace up and down the narrow room, and he bore no resemblance to the late Sir Lucian Pine, for instance, he rapped. Margaret laughed outright, and her laughter was so inoffensive and so musical that the chief inspector laughed also. That's more hopeless than ever, she said. Poor Sir Lucian had strong, harsh features and rather small eyes. He wore a mustache, too, but Sir Lucian, I feel sure, was one of Cosmas' clients. Ah, said Carey. And what leads you to suppose, Miss Haley, that this Cosma dealt in drugs? Well, you see, Rita Irvin was always going there to buy perfumes, and she frequently sent her maid as well. But, Carrie stared, you say that the perfume was harmless. That which was sold to casual visitors was harmless, Inspector. But I strongly suspect that regular clients were supplied with something quite different. You see, I know no fewer than thirty unfortunate women in the West End of London alone who are simply helpless slaves to various drugs, and I think it more than a coincidence that upon their dressing tables I have almost invariably found one or more of Cosmos' peculiar antique flasks. Chief Inspector Carey's jaw muscles protruded conspicuously. You speak of patience, he asked. Margaret nodded her head. When a woman becomes addicted to the drug habit, she explained, she sometimes shuns her regular medical advisor. I have many patients who came to me originally simply because they dared not face their family doctor. In fact, since I gave up army work, my little practice has threatened to develop into that of a drug habit specialist. Have you taxed any of these people with obtaining drugs from Cosma? Not directly. It would have been undiplomatic. But I have tried to surprise them into telling me. Unfortunately, these poor people are as cunning as any other kind of maniac. For, of course, it becomes a form of mania. 
they recognize that confession might lead to a stoppage of supplies, the eventuality they most dread. Did you examine the contents of any of these flasks found on dressing tables? I rarely had an opportunity, but when I did, they proved to contain perfume when they contained anything. Hmm, mused Carrie, and although in deference to Margaret, he had denied himself chewing gum, his jaws worked automatically. I gather that Mrs. Mont Irvin had expressed a wish to see you last night. Yes, apparently she was threatened with a shortage of cocaine. Cocaine was her drug. One of them. She had tried them all, poor silly girl. You must understand that for a habitual drug taker, suddenly to be deprived of drugs would lead to complete collapse, perhaps death. And during the last few days, I had noticed a peculiar nervous symptom in Rita Urban, which had interested me. Finally, the day before yesterday, she confessed that her usual source of supply had been closed to her. Her words were very vague, but I gathered that some form of coercion was being employed. With what object? I have no idea, but she used the words, they will drive me mad, and seemed to be in a dangerously nervous condition. She said that she was going to make a final attempt to obtain a supply of the poison which had become indispensable to her. I cannot do without it, she said, but if they refuse, will you give me some? What did you say? I begged of her, as I had done on many previous occasions, to place herself in my hands. But she evaded a direct answer, as is the way of one addicted to this vice. If I cannot get some by tomorrow, she said, I shall go mad or dead. Can I rely on you? I told her that I would prescribe cocaine for her on the distinct understanding that from the first dose she was to place herself under my care for a cure. She agreed? She agreed. Yesterday afternoon, while I was away at an important case, she came here. Poor Rita. Margaret's soft voice trembled. Look, she left this note. From a letter rack, she took a square sheet of paper and handed it to the chief inspector. He bent his fierce eyes upon the writing, large, irregular, and shaky. Dear Margaret, he read aloud, why aren't you at home? I am wild with pain and I feel I'm going mad. Come to me directly you return and bring enough to keep me alive. I, hello, there is no finish. He glanced up from the page. Margaret Haley's eyes were dim. She despaired of my coming and went to Cosma, she said. Can you doubt that that was what she went for? No, snapped Carrie savagely. I can't. But do you mean to tell me, Miss Haley, that Mrs. Irvin couldn't get cocaine anywhere else? I know for a fact that it's smuggled in regularly, and there's more than one receiver. Margaret looked at him strangely. I know it too, Inspector, she said quietly. Owing to the lack of enterprise on the part of our British drug houses, even reputable chemists are sometimes dependent upon illicit stock from Japan and America. But do you know that the price of these smuggled drugs has laterly become so high as to be prohibitive in many cases? I don't. What are you driving at, miss? At this. Somebody has made a corner in contraband drugs. The most wicked syndicate that ever was formed has got control of the lives of, it may be, thousands of drug slaves. Carrie's teeth closed with a sharp snap. At last, he said, I see where the smart from the home office comes in. The Secretary of State has appointed a special independent commissioner to inquire into this hellish traffic, replied Margaret quietly. I am glad to say that I have helped in getting this done by the representations which I have made to my uncle, Lord Rexborough. But I give you my word, Inspector Carey, that I have withheld nothing from you any more than from him. Him? snapped Carey, eyes fiercely ablaze. From the Home Office representative, before whom I have already given evidence. Chief Inspector Carey took up his hat, cane, and overall from the chair upon which he had placed them and, his face a savage red mask, bowed with a fine curtsy. He burned to learn particulars. He disdained to obtain them from a woman. Good morning, Miss Haley, he said. I am greatly indebted to you. He walked stiffly from the room and out of the flat without waiting for a servant to open the door. End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve of Dope. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia. Dope by Sax Romer. Part Second. Mrs. Sin. Chapter Twelve. The Maid of the Mask. The past life of Mrs. Monty Irvin, in which at this time three distinct groups of investigators became interested, namely those of Whitehall, Scotland Yard and Fleet Street, 
was of a character to have horrified the prudish, but to have excited the compassion of the wise. Daughter of a struggling suburban solicitor, Rita Esden, at the age of 17, from a delicate and rather commonplace child, began to develop into a singularly pretty girl of an elusive and fascinating type of beauty. Almost ethereal in her dainty coloring, and possessed of large and remarkably fine eyes, together with a wealth of copper-red hair, a crown which seemed too heavy for her slender neck to support. Her father viewed her increasing charms and ever-growing list of admirers with the gloomy apprehension of a disappointed man who has come to look upon each gift of the gods as a new sorrow cunningly disguised. Her mother, on the contrary, fanned the girl's natural vanity and ambition with a success which rarely attended the enterprises of this foolish old woman. And Rita, proving to be endowed with a moderately good voice, a stage career was determined upon without reference to the contrary wishes of Mr. Esden. Following the usual brief training, which is counted sufficient for an aspirant to musical comedy honors, Rita, by the prefixing of two letters to her name, set out to conquer the play-going world as Rita Dresden. Two years of hard work and disappointment served to dispel the girl's illusions. She learned to appreciate, at its true value, that masculine admiration which, in an unusual degree, she had the power to excite. Those of her admirers who were in a position to assist her professionally were only prepared to use their influence upon terms which she was unprepared to accept. Those whose intentions were strictly credible, by some malignancy of fate, possessed no influence whatever. She came to regard herself as a particularly unlucky girl, being ignorant of the fact that fortune, an impish hierophant, imposes identical tests upon every candidate who aspires to the throne of a limelight princess. Matters stood thus when a new suitor appeared in the person of Sir Lucian Pine. When his card was brought up to Rita, her heart leaped because of a mingled emotion of triumph and fear which the sight of the baronet's name had occasioned. He was a director of the syndicate in whose production she was playing, a man referred to with awe by every girl in the company as having it in his power to make or mar a professional reputation. Not that he took any active part in the affairs of the concern. On the contrary, he was an aristocrat who held himself aloof from all matters smacking of commerce, but at the same time one who invested his money shrewdly. Sir Lucian's protege of today was London's idol of tomorrow. And even before Rita had spoken to him, she had fought and won a spiritual battle between her true self and that vain, admiration-loving Rita Dresden who favored capitulation. She knew that Sir Lucian's card represented a signpost at the crossroads where many a girl, pretty but not exceptionally talented, had hesitated with beating heart. It was no longer a question of remaining a member of the chorus, an understudy for a small part, or of accepting promotion to lead in a new production. It was that of accepting whatever Sir Lucian chose to offer, or of retiring from the profession so far as this powerful syndicate was concerned. Such was the reputation enjoyed at this time by Sir Lucian Pine among those who had every opportunity of forming an accurate opinion. Nevertheless, Rita was determined not to succumb without a struggle. She did not count herself untalented, nor a girl to be lightly valued, and Sir Lucian might prove to be less black than rumor had painted him. As presently appeared, both in her judgment of herself and in that of Sir Lucian, she was at least partially correct. He was very courteous, very respectful, and highly attentive. Her less favored companions smiled significantly when the familiar Rolls-Royce appeared at the stage door night after night, never doubting that Rita Dresden was chosen to star in the forthcoming production, but with rare exceptions, frankly envying her this good fortune. Rita made no attempt to disillusion them, recognizing that it must fail. She was resigned to being misjudged. If she could achieve success at that price, success would have been purchased cheaply. That Sir Lucian was deeply infatuated, she was not slow to discover, and with an address perfected by experience and a determination to avoid the easy path inherited from a father whose scrupulous honesty had ruined his professional prospects, she set to work to win esteem as well as admiration. Sir Lucian was first surprised, then piqued, and finally interested by such unusual tactics. 
The second phase was a dangerous one for Rita, and during a certain luncheon at Romano's, her fate hung in the balance. Sir Lucian realized that he was in peril of losing his head over this tantalizingly pretty girl, who gracefully kept him at a distance, fencing with an adroitness which was baffling and Sir Lucian Pine had set out with no intention of doing anything so preposterous as falling in love. Keenly intuitive, Rita scented danger and made a bold move, carelessly rolling a bread crumb along the cloth. I am giving up the stage when this run finishes, she said. Indeed, replied Sir Lucian imperturbably. Why? I am tired of stage life. I have been invited to go and live with my uncle in New York and have decided to accept. You see... She bestowed upon him a swift glance of her brilliant eyes. Men in the theatrical world are not all like you. Real friends, I mean. It isn't very nice sometimes. Sir Lucian deliberately lighted a cigarette. If Rita was bluffing, he mused, she had the pluck to make good her bluff. And if she did so, he dropped the extinguished match upon a plate. Did he care? He glanced at the girl who was smiling at an acquaintance on the other side of the room. Fortune's wheel spins upon a needlepoint, by an artistic performance occupying less than two minutes, but suggesting that Rita possessed qualities which one day might spell success. She had decided her fate. Her heart was beating like a hammer in her breast, but she preserved an attitude of easy indifference. Without for a moment believing in the American uncle, Sir Lucian did believe, correctly, that Rita Dresden was about to elude him. He realized, too, that he was infinitely more interested than he had ever been hitherto, and more interested than he intended to become. This seemingly trivial conversation was a turning point, and twelve months later, Rita Dresden was playing the title role in The Maid of the Mask. Sir Lucian had discovered himself to be really in love with her, and he might possibly have offered her marriage, even if a dangerous rival had not appeared to goad him to that desperate leap for so he regarded it. Monty Irvin, though considerably Rita's senior, had much to commend him in the eyes of the girl, and in the eyes of her mother, who still retained a curious influence over her daughter. He was much more wealthy than Pine, and although the latter was a baronet, Irvin was certain to be knighted ere long, so that Rita would secure the appendage of lady in either case. Also, his reputation promised a more reliable husband than Sir Lucian could be expected to make. Moreover, Rita liked him, whereas she had never sincerely liked and trusted Sir Lucian. And there was a final reason, of which Mrs. Esden knew nothing. On the first night that Rita had been entrusted with a part of any consequence, and this was shortly after the conversation at Romano's, she discovered herself to be in a state of hopeless panic. All her scheming and fencing would have availed her nothing if she were to break down at the critical moment. It was an eventuality which Sir Lucian had foreseen, and he seized the opportunity at once of securing a new hold upon the girl, and of rendering her more pliable than he had hitherto found her to be. At this time, the idea of marriage had not presented itself to Sir Lucian. Some hours before the performance, he detected her condition of abject fright, and from his waistcoat pocket he took a little gold snuff-box. At first the girl declined to follow advice which instinctively she distrusted, and Sir Lucian was too clever to urge it upon her. But he glanced casually at his wristwatch, and poor Rita shuddered. The gold box was hidden again in the baronet's pocket. To analyze the process which thereupon took place in Rita's mind would be a barren task, since its result was a foregone conclusion. Daring ambition, rather than any merely abstract virtue, was the keynote of her character. She had rebuffed the advances of Sir Lucian as she had rebuffed others, primarily because her aim in life was set higher than mere success in light comedy. This she counted but a means to a more desirable end, a wealthy marriage. To the achievement of such an alliance, the presence of an accepted lover would be an obstacle. And true love Rita Dresden had never known. Yet, short of this final sacrifice, which some women so lightly made, there were few scruples which she was not prepared to discard in furtherance of her designs. Her morality, then, was diplomatic, for the vice of ambition may sometimes make for virtue. Rita's vivacious beauty and perfect self-possession on the fateful night earned her a permanent place in stageland. Rita Dresden became a star. She had won a long and hard-fought battle. 
but in avoiding one master, she had abandoned herself to another. The triumph of her debut left her strangely exhausted. She dreaded the coming of the second night almost as keenly as she had dreaded the ordeal of the first. She struggled, poor victim, and only increased her terrors. Not until the clock showed her that in twenty minutes she must make her first entrance did she succumb. But Sir Lucian's gold snuff-box lay upon her dressing table, and she was trembling. When at last she heard the last sustained note of the oboe in the orchestra giving the pitch to the answering violins, she raised the jeweled lid of the box. So she entered upon the path which leads down to destruction, and since, to conjure with the drug which pharmacists know as methylbenzoid econine, is to raise the demon insomnia, ere long she found herself exploring strange bypaths in quest of sleep. By the time that she was entrusted with the leading part in The Maid of the Mask, she herself did not recognize how tenacious was the hold which this fatal habit had secured upon her. In the company of Sir Lucian Pine she met other devotees, and for a time came to regard her unnatural mode of existence as something inseparable from the bohemian life. To the horrible side of it she was blind. It was her meeting with Monty Irvin during the run of this successful play which first awakened a dawning comprehension, not because she ascribed his admiration to her artificial vivacity, but because she realized the strength of the link subsisting between herself and Sir Lucian. She liked and respected Irvin, and as a result began to view her conduct from a new standpoint. His life was so entirely open and free from reproach, while part of her own was dark and secret. She conceived a desire to be done with that dark and secret life. This was a shadowland over which Sir Lucian Pine presided, and which must be kept hidden from Monty Irvin, and it was not until she thus contemplated cutting herself adrift from it all that she perceived the Gordian knot which bound her to the drug coterie. How far, yet how smoothly, by all but imperceptible stages, she had glided down the stream since that night when the gold box had lain upon her dressing table. Casma's drug store in Bond Street had few secrets for her, or so she believed. She knew that the establishment of the strange, immobile Egyptian was a source from which drugs could always be obtained. She knew that the dream-reading business served some double purpose, but she did not know the identity of Casma. Two of the most insidious drugs familiar to modern pharmacy were wooing her to slavery, and there was no strong hand to hold her back. Even the presence of her mother might have offered some slight deterrent at this stage of Rita's descent, but the girl had quitted her suburban home as soon as her salary had rendered her sufficiently independent to do so, and had established herself in a small but elegant flat situated in the heart of theater land. But if she had walked blindly into the clutches of cocaine and veronal, her subsequent experiments with Chandu were prompted by indefensible curiosity and a false vanity which urged her to do everything that was done by the ultra-smart and vicious set of which she had become a member. Her first introduction to opium smoking was made under the auspices of an American comedian then appearing in London, an old devotee of the poppy, and it took place shortly after Sir Lucian Pine had proposed marriage to Rita. This proposal she had not rejected outright. She had pleaded time for consideration. Monty Irvin was away, and Rita secretly hoped that on his return he would declare himself. Meanwhile, she indulged in every new craze which became fashionable among her associates. A Chandu party took place at the American's flat in Duke Street, and Rita, who had been invited and who had consented to go with Sir Lucian Pine, met there for the first time the woman variously known as Lola and Mrs. Sin. End of chapter 12 Read by Olivia Chapter 13 of Dope This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Friend. Dope by Sax Romer. Chapter 13. A Chandu Party. From the restaurant at which she had had supper with Sir Lucian, Rita proceeded to Duke Street. Alighting from Pine's car at the door, they went up to the flat of the organizer of the opium party, Mr. Cyrus Kilfane. One other guest was already present a slender, fair woman who was introduced by the American as Molly Gretna, but whose weakly pretty face Rita recognized as that of a notorious society divorcee, 
foremost in the van of every new craze, a past mistress of the smartest vices. Kilfane had sallow, expressionless features and drooping, light-colored eyes. His straw-hued hair, brushed back from a sloping brow, hung lankly down upon his coat collar. Long familiarity with China's ruling vice and contact with those who practiced it had brought about that mysterious physical alteration, apparently reflecting a mental change, so often to be seen in one who has consorted with Chinamen. Even the light eyes seem to have grown slightly oblique. The voice, the unimpassioned greeting, were those of a son of Cathay. He carried himself with a stoop and had a queer, shuffling gait. "'Ah, my dear daughter,' he murmured in a solemnly fastidious manner, "'how glad I am to welcome you to our poppy circle.' He slowly turned his half-closed eyes in Pine's direction and slowly turned them back again. "'Do you seek forgetfulness of old joys?' he asked. "'This is my own case and Pine's. "'Or do you, as Molly does, seek new joys, youth's eternal quest?' Rita laughed with a careless abandon which belonged to that part of her character veiled from the outer world. "'I think I agree with Miss Greta,' she said lightly. "'There is not so much happiness in life that I want to forget the little I had.' "'Happiness,' murmured Kilfane. "'There is no real happiness. Happiness is smoke. Let us smoke.' "'I am curious, but half afraid,' declared Rita. "'I have heard that opium sometimes has no other effect than to make one frightfully ill.' "'Oh, my dear!' cried Miss Greta, with a foolish, giggling laugh. "'You will love it! Such fascinating dreams! Such delightful adventures!' "'Other drugs,' drawled Sir Lucian, "'merely stimulate one's normal mental activities. "'Chandu is a key to another life. "'Cocaine, for instance, enhances our capacity for work. "'It is only a heretic like De Quincey "'who prostitutes the magic gum to such base purposes.' Chandu is misunderstood in Europe. In Asia, it is the companion of the aesthete's leisure. But surely, said Rita, one pipe of opium will not produce all these wonders. Some people never experience them at all, interrupted Miss Gretna. The great idea is to get into a comfortable position and just resign yourself. Let yourself go. Oh, it's heavenly. Cyrus Kilfane turned his dull eyes in Rita's direction. A question of temperament and adaptability, he murmured. De Quincey, Pine, slowly turning towards the baronet, is didactic, of course, but his confessions may be true, nevertheless. He forgets, you see, that he possessed an unusual constitution and the temperament of a Norwegian herring. He forgets, too, that he was a laudanum drinker, not an opium smoker. Now you, my daughter, the lusterless eyes again sought Rita's flushed face, are vivid intensely vital. If you can succeed in resigning yourself to the hypnosis induced, your experiences will be delightful. Trust your uncle sigh. Leaving Rita chatting with Miss Gretna, Kilfane took Pine aside, offering him a cigarette from an ornate jeweled case. Hello, said the baronet. Can you still get these? With the utmost difficulty, murmured Kilfane, returning the case to his pocket. Lola charges me five guineas a hundred for them, and only supplies them as a favor. I should be glad to get back home, Pine. The right stuff is the wrong price in London. Sir Lucian laughed sardonically, lighting Kilfane's cigarette and then his own. I find it so myself, he said. Everything except opium is to be had at Cosmas, and nothing except opium interests me. He supplies me with cocaine, murmured the comedian. His figure works out, as nearly as I can estimate it, at ten shillings, seven and a half pence a grain. I saw him about it yesterday afternoon, pointing out to the brown guy that as the wholesale price is roughly two and a quarter pence, I regarded his margin of profit as somewhat broad. Indeed! The first time I had ever seen him pine, I brought an introduction from Dr. Silver of New York, and Cosma supplied me without question, at a price. You always saw Rashid? Yes. If there were other visitors, I waited. But yesterday I made a personal appointment with Cosma. He pretended to think I had come to have a dream interpreted. He is clever, Pine. He never moved a muscle throughout the interview, but finally he assured me that all the receivers in England had amalgamated, and that the price he charged represented a very narrow margin of profit. Of course, he is a liar. He is making a fortune. Do you know him personally? No, replied Sir Lucian. Outside his Bond Street home of mystery, he is unknown. A clever man, as you say. You obtain your opium from Lola? Yes. 
Cosma sent her to me. She keeps me on ridiculously low rations, and if I had not brought my own outfit, I don't think she would have sold me one. Of course, her game is beating up clients for the Limehouse dive. You have visited the House of a Hundred Raptures many times at weekends. Opium, like wine, is better enjoyed in company. Does she post you the opium? Oh, no. My man goes to Limehouse for it. Ah, here she is. A woman came in, carrying a brown leather attaché case. She had left her hat and coat in the hall and wore a smart blue serge skirt and a white blouse. She was not tall, but she possessed a remarkably beautiful figure which the cut of her garments was not intended to disguise, and her height was appreciably increased by a pair of suede shoes having the most wonderful heels which Rita ever remembered to have seen worn on or off the stage. They seemed to make her small feet appear smaller, and lent to her slender ankles an exaggerated frontal curve. Her hair was of that true glossy black which suggests the blue sheen of raven's plumage, and her thickly fringed eyes were dark and southern as her hair. She had full, voluptuous lips and a bold self-assurance. In the swift, calculating glance which she cast about the room, there was something greedy and evil, and when it rested upon Rita Dresden's dainty beauty, to the evil greed was added cruelty. "'Another little sister, dear Lola,' murmured Kilfane. Of course, you know who it is. This, my daughter, turning the sleepy glance towards Rita, is our officiating priestess, Mrs. Sin. The woman so strangely named revealed her gleaming teeth in a swift, unpleasant smile. Then her nostrils dilated, and she glanced about her suspiciously. Someone smokes the Chandu cigarettes, she said, speaking in a low tone, which, nevertheless, failed to disguise her harsh voice and with a very marked accent. I am the offender, dear Lola, said Kilthane, dreamily waving his cigarette towards her. I have managed to make the last hundred spin out. You have brought me a new supply? Oh, no, indeed, replied Mrs. Sin, tossing her head in a manner oddly reminiscent of a once famous Spanish dancer. Next Tuesday you get some more. Ah, oh, it is no good. You talk and talk, and it cannot alter anything. Until they come, I cannot give them to you. But it appears to me, murmured Kilthane, that the supply is always growing less. Of course, the best goes all to Edinburgh now. I have only three sticks of yes left of all my stock. But the cigarettes are from Buenos Aires? Yes, but Buenos Aires must get the opium before we get the cigarettes, eh? Five cases come to London on Tuesday, Sigh. Be of good courage, my dear. She patted the sallow cheek of the American with her jeweled fingers and turned aside, glancing about her. Yes, murmured Kilthane. We are all present, Lola. I have had the room prepared. Come, my children, let us enter the poppy portico. He opened a door and stood aside, waving one thin yellow hand between the first two fingers of which smoldered the drugged cigarette. Led by Mrs. Sin, the company filed into an apartment evidently intended for a drawing room, but which had been hastily transformed into an opium divan. Tables, chairs, and other items of furniture had been stacked against one of the walls and the floor spread with rugs, skins, and numerous silk cushions. A gas fire was alight, but before it had been placed an ornate Japanese screen whereupon birds of dazzling plumage hovered amid the leaves of gilded palm trees. In the center of the room stood a small card table, and upon it were a large brass tray and an ivory pedestal exquisitely carved in the form of a nude figure having one arm upraised. The figure supported a lamp, the light of which was subdued by a barrel-shaped shade of Chinese workmanship. Molly Gretna giggled hysterically. "'Make yourself comfortable, dear!' she cried to Rita, dropping down upon a heap of cushions stacked in a recess beside the fireplace. "'I'm going to take off my shoes. The last time, Cyrus, when I woke up, my feet were quite numb.' "'You should come down to my place,' said Mrs. Sin, setting the leather case on the little card table beside the lamp. You have there your own little room and silken sheets to lie in, and it is quiet, so quiet. Oh, cried Molly Gretna, I must come, but I daren't go alone. Will you come with me, dear? Turning to Rita. I don't know, was the reply. I may not like opium, but if you do, and I know you will. Why, said Rita, glancing rapidly at Pine, I suppose it would be a novel experience. Let me arrange it for you, came the harsh voice of Mrs. Sin. Lucy will drive you both down, won't you, my dear? The shadowed eyes glanced aside at Sir Lucian Pine. Certainly, he replied. I am always at the lady's service. 
Rita Dresden settled herself luxuriously in a nest of silk and fur in another corner of the room, regarding the baronet coquettishly through her half-lowered lashes. "'I won't go unless it is my party, Lucy,' she said. "'You must let me pay.' "'A detail,' murmured Pine, crossing and standing beside her. Interest now became centered upon the preparations being made by Mrs. Sin. From the attaché case she took out a lacquered box, silken lined like a jewel casket. It contained four singular-looking pipes, the parts of which she began to fit together. The first and largest of these had a thick bamboo stem, an amber mouthpiece, and a tiny, disproportionate bowl of brass. The second was much smaller and was of some dark, highly polished wood, mounted with silver conceived in an ornate Chinese design, representing a long-tailed lizard. The mouthpiece was of jade. The third and fourth pipes were yet smaller, a perfectly matched pair in figured ivory of exquisite workmanship, delicately gold-mounted. These for the ladies, said Mrs. Sin, holding up the pair. You, glancing at Kilfane, have got your own pipe, I know. She laid them upon the tray, and now took out of the case a little copper lamp, a smaller lacquered box, and a silver spatula, her jeweled fingers handling the queer implements with a familiarity bred of habit. What a strange woman, whispered Rita to Pine. Is she an Oriental? Cuban Jewess, he replied in a low voice. Mrs. Sin carefully lighted the lamp, which burned with a short, bluish flame, and, opening the lacquered box, she dipped the spatula into the thick, gummy substance which it contained and twisted the little instrument round and round between her fingers, presently withdrawing it with a globule of chandu, about the size of a bean, adhering to the end. She glanced aside at Kilfane. "'Chinese way, eh?' she said. She began to twirl the prepared opium above the flame of the lamp. From it a slight, sickly-smelling vapor arose. No one spoke, but all watched her closely, and Rita was conscious of a growing, pleasurable excitement. When by evaporation the chandu had become reduced to the size of a small pea, and a vague, spirituous blue flame began to dance round the end of the spatula, Mrs. Sin pressed it adroitly into the tiny bowl of one of the ivory pipes. Having first held the bowl inverted for a moment over the lamp, she turned to Rita. The guest of the evening, she said, do not be afraid. Inhale, oh so gentle, and blow the smoke from the nostrils. You know how to smoke? The same as a cigarette? asked Rita excitedly as Mrs. Sin bent over her. The same, but very, very gentle. Rita took the pipe and raised the mouthpiece to the lips. End of chapter 13. Chapter 14 of Dope. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Friend. Dope by Sax Romer. Chapter 14. In the Shade of the Lonely Palm. Persian opium of good quality contains from 10 to 15 percent morphine, and Chandu, made from opium of Yezd, would contain perhaps 25 percent of this potent drug. But because in the act of smoking, distillation occurs, nothing like this quantity of morphine reaches the smoker. To the distilling process, also, may be due the different symptoms resulting from smoking Chandu and injecting morphia, or drinking tincture of opium, as De Quincey did. Rita found the flavor of the preparation to be not entirely unpleasant, having overcome an initial aversion caused by its marked medicinal tang. She grew reconciled to it and finished her first smoke without experiencing any other effect than a sensation of placid contentment. Deftly, Mrs. Sin renewed the pipe. Silence had fallen upon the party. The second pill was no more than half consumed when a growing feeling of nausea seized upon the novice, becoming so marked that she dropped the ivory pipe weakly and uttered a faint moan. Instantly, silently, Mrs. Sin was beside her. Lean forward so, she whispered softly, as if fearful of intruding her voice upon these sacred rites. In a moment you will be better. Then, if you feel faint, lie back. It is the sleep. Do not fight against it. The influence of the stronger will prevailed. Self-control and judgment are qualities among the first to succumb to opium. Rita ceased to think longingly of the clean, fresh air, of escape from these sickly fumes which seemed now to fill the room with a moving vacuum. She bent forward, her chin resting upon her breast, 
and gradually the deathly sickness passed. Mentally, she underwent a change, too. From an active state of resistance, the ego traversed a descending curve ending in absolute passivity. The floor had seemingly begun to revolve and was moving insidiously, so that the pattern of the carpet formed a series of concentric rings. She found this imaginary phenomenon to be soothing rather than otherwise, and resigned herself almost eagerly to the delusion. Mrs. Sin allowed her to fall back upon the cushions, so gently and so slowly that the operation appeared to occupy several minutes and to resemble that of sinking into innumerable layers of swan's down. The sinuous figure bending over her grew taller with the passage of each minute, until the dark eyes of Mrs. Sin were looking down at Rita from a dizzy elevation. As often occurs in the case of a neurotic subject, Delusion as to time and space had followed the depression of the sensory cells. But surely, she mused, this could not be Mrs. Sin who towered so loftily above her. Of course, how absurd to imagine that a woman could remain motionless for so many hours, and Rita thought, now that she had been lying for several hours beneath the shadow of that tall, graceful, and protective shape. Why, it was a slender palm tree, which stretched its fan-like foliage over her. Far, far above her head the long, dusty green fronds projected from the mast like trunk. The sun, a ball of fiery brass, burned directly in the zenith, so that the shadow of the foliage lay like a carpet about her feet. That which she had mistaken for the ever-receding eyes of Mrs. Sin, wondering with a delightful vagueness why they seemed constantly to change color, proved to be a pair of brilliantly plumaged parakeets perched upon a lofty branch of the palm. This was an equatorial noon, and even if she had not found herself to be under the influence of a delicious abstraction, Rita would not have moved, for, excepting the friendly palm, not another vestige of vegetation was visible right away to the horizon, nothing but an ocean of sand whereupon no living thing moved. She and the parakeets were alone in the heart of the great Sahara. But stay! Many, many miles away, a speck on the dusty carpet of the desert, Something moved. Hours must have elapsed before that tiny figure, provided it were approaching, could reach the solitary palm. Delightedly, Rita contemplated the infinity of time. Even if the figure moved ever so slowly, she should be waiting there beneath the palm to witness its arrival. Already she had been there for a period which she was far too indolent to strive to compute. A week, perhaps. She turned her attention to the parakeets. One of them was moving, and she noted with delight that it had perceived her far below, and was endeavoring to draw the attention of its less observant companion to her presence. For many hours she lay watching it, and wondering why, since the one bird was so singularly intelligent, its companion was equally dull. When she lowered her eyes and looked out again across the sands, the figure had approached so close as to be recognizable. It was that of Mrs. Sin. Rita appreciated the fitness of her presence and experienced no surprise, only a mild curiosity. This curiosity was not concerned with Mrs. Sin herself, but with the nature of the burden which she bore upon her head. She was dressed in a manner which Rita dreamily thought would have been inadequate in England or even in Cuba, but which was appropriate in the Great Sahara. How exquisitely she carried herself, mused the dreamer, no doubt this fine carriage was due in part to her wearing golden shoes with heels like stilts, and in part to her having been trained to bear heavy burdens upon her head. Rita remembered that Sir Lucian had once described to her the elegant deportment of the Arab women, ascribing it to their custom of carrying water jugs in that way. The appearance of the speck on the horizon had marked the height of her trance. Her recognition of Mrs. Sin had signalized the decline of the Chantu influence. Now, the intrusion of a definite, uncontorted memory was evidence of returning cerebral activity. Rita had no recollection of the sunset. Indeed, she had failed to perceive any change in the form and position of the shadow cast by the foliage. It had spread an ebony patch equally about the bowl of the tree, so that the sun must have been immediately overhead. But, of course, she had lain watching the parakeets for several hours, and now night had fallen. The desert mounds were touched with silver. The sky was a nest of diamonds, and the moon cast a shadow of the palm like a bar of ebony right across the prospect to the rim of the sky dome. 
Mrs. Sin stood before her, one half of her lithe body concealed by this strange black shadow, and the other half gleaming in the moonlight, so that she resembled a beautiful ivory statue which some iconoclast had cut in two. Placing her burden upon the ground, Mrs. Sin knelt down before Rita and reverently kissed her hand, whispering, I am your slave, my poppy queen. She spoke in a strange language, no doubt some African tongue, but one which Rita understood perfectly. Then she laid one hand upon the object which she had carried on her head, and which now proved to be a large lacquered casket covered with Chinese figures and bound by three hoops of gold. It had a very curious shape. Do you command that the chest be opened? she asked. Yes, answered Rita languidly. Mrs. Sin threw up the lid, and from the interior of the casket, which, because of the glare of the moonlight, seemed every moment to assume a new form, drew out a bronze lamp. The sacred lamp, she whispered, and placed it on the sand. Do you command that it be lighted? Rita inclined her head. The lamp became lighted. In what manner she did not observe, nor was she curious to learn. Next from the large casket, Mrs. Sin took another smaller casket and a very long, tapering silver bodkin. The first casket had perceptibly increased in size. It was certainly much larger than Rita had supposed, for now, out from its shadowy interior, Mrs. Sin began to take pipes, long pipes and short pipes, pipes of gold and pipes of silver, pipes of ivory and pipes of jade. Some were carved to represent the heads of demons. Some had the bodies of serpents wreathed about them. Others were encrusted with precious gems and filled the night with the venomous sheen of emeralds, the blood rays of rubies, and golden glow of topaz, while the spear points of diamonds flashed a challenge to the stars. "'Do you command that the pipes be lighted?' asked the harsh voice. Rita desired to answer no, but heard herself say, "'Yes.' Thereupon, from a thousand bowls linking that lonely palm to the remote horizon, a thousand elven fires arose, blue-tongued and spiritous. Gray pencilings of smoke stole straightly upward to the sky, so that look where she would, Rita could discern nothing but these countless thin, faintly wavering vertical lines of vapor. The dimensions of the lacquered casket had increased so vastly as to conceal the kneeling figure of Mrs. Sin, and staring at it wonderingly, Rita suddenly perceived that it was not an ordinary casket. She knew at last why its shape had struck her as being unusual. It was a Chinese coffin. The smell of the burning opium was stifling her. Those remorseless threads of smoke were closing in, twining themselves about her throat. It was becoming cold, too, and the moonlight was growing dim. The position of the moon had changed, of course, as the night had stolen on towards morning, and now it hung dimly before her. The smoke obscured it. But was this smoke obscuring the moon? Rita moved her hands for the first time since she had found herself under the palm tree, weakly fending off those vaporous tentacles which were seeking to entwine themselves about her throat. Of course, it was not smoke obscuring the moon, she decided. It was a lamp upheld by an ivory figure a lamp with a Chinese shade. A subdued roaring sound became audible, and this was occasioned by the gas fire burning behind the Japanese screen on which gaily plumaged birds sported in the branches of golden palms. Rita raised her hands to her eyes. Mist obscured her sight. Swiftly, now, reality was asserting itself and banishing the phantasmagoria conjured up by Chen Du. In her dim, cushioned corner, Molly Gretna lay back against the wall, her face pale and her weak mouth foolishly agape. Cyrus Kilfane was indistinguishable from the pile of rugs amid which he sprawled by the table, and of Sir Lucian Pine nothing was to be seen but the outstretched legs and feet which projected grotesquely from a recess. Seated, oriental fashion, upon an improvised divan near the grand piano and propped up by a number of garish cushions, Rita beheld Mrs. Sin. The long bamboo pipe had fallen from her listless fingers. Her face wore an expression of mystic rapture like that characterizing the features of some Chinese Buddhas. Fear, unaccountable but uncontrollable, suddenly seized upon Rita. She felt weak and dizzy, but she struggled partly upright. Lucy, she whispered. Her voice was not under control, and once more she strove to call to Pine. Lucy! came the hoarse whisper again. 
The fire continued its muted roaring, but no other sound answered to the appeal. A horror of the companionship in which she found herself thereupon took possession of the girl. She must escape from these sleepers, whose spirits had been expelled by the potent necromancer, Opium. From these empty tenements whose occupants had fled, the idea of the cool night air in the open streets was delicious. She staggered to her feet, swaying drunkenly, but determined to reach the door. She shuddered because of a feeling of internal chill which assailed her, but step by step crept across the room, opened the door, and tottered out into the hallway. There was no sound in the flat. Presumably Kilfane's man had retired, or perhaps he too was a devotee. Rita's fur coat hung upon the rack, and although her fingers appeared to have lost all their strength and her arm to have become weak as that of an infant, she succeeded in detaching the coat from the hook. Not pausing to put it on, she opened the door and stumbled out on to the darkened landing. Whereas her first impulse had been to awaken someone, preferably Sir Lucian, now her sole desire was to escape undetected. She began to feel less dizzy, and having paused for a moment on the landing, she succeeded in getting her coat on. Then she closed the door as quietly as possible, and clutching the handrail began to grope her way downstairs. There was only one flight, she remembered, and a short passage leading to the street door. She reached the passage without mishap and saw a faint light ahead. The fastenings gave her some trouble, but finally her efforts were successful and she found herself standing in deserted Duke Street. There was no moon, but the sky was cloudless. She had no idea of the time, but because of the stillness of the surrounding streets, she knew that it must be very late. She set out for her flat, walking slowly and wondering what explanation she should offer if a constable observed her. Oxford Street showed deserted as far as the eye could reach, and her light footsteps seemed to awaken a hundred echoes. Having proceeded for some distance without meeting anyone, she observed, and experienced a childish alarm, the headlights of an approaching car. Instantly, the idea of hiding presented itself to her, but so rapidly did the big automobile speed along the empty thoroughfare that Rita was just passing a street lamp as the car raced by and she must therefore have been clearly visible to the occupants. Never for a moment glancing aside, Rita pressed on as quickly as she could. Then her vague alarm became actual terror. She heard the brakes being applied to the car, and heard the gritty sound of the tires upon the roadway as the vehicle's headlong progress was suddenly checked. She had been seen, perhaps recognized, and whoever was in the car proposed to return to speak to her. If her strength had allowed, she would have run, but now it threatened to desert her altogether, and she tottered weakly. A pattering of footsteps came from behind. Someone was running back to overtake her. Recognizing escape to be impossible, Rita turned just as the runner came up with her. Rita, he cried rather breathlessly. Miss Dresden. She stood very still, looking at the speaker. It was Mont Irvin. End of chapter 14《ハッピー・オブ・ドープ》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Friend.《Dope》by Sax Romer.《ハッピー・メタモルフィシス》。As Irvin seized her hands and looked at her eagerly, half fearfully, Rita achieved sufficient composure to speak. Oh, Mr. Irvin, she said, and found that her voice was not entirely normal. What must you think? He continued to hold her hands, and I think you are very indiscreet to be out alone at three o'clock in the morning, he answered gently. I was recalled to London by urgent business and returned by road, fortunately, since I have met you. How can I explain? I don't ask you to explain, Miss Dresden. I have no right and no desire to ask, but I wish I had the right to advise you. How good you are, she began, and I, her voice failed her completely, and her sensitive lips began to tremble. Monty Irvin drew her arm under his own and led her back to meet the car, which the chauffeur had turned and which was now approaching. I will drive you home, he said, and if I may call in the morning, I should like to do so. Rita nodded. She could not trust herself to speak again, and having placed her in the car, Monty Irvin sat beside her, reclaiming her hand and grasping it reassuringly and sympathetically throughout the short drive. They parted at her door. 
Good night, said Urban, speaking very deliberately because of an almost uncontrollable desire which possessed him to take Rita in his arms, to hold her fast, to protect her from her own pathetic self and from those influencers dimly perceived about her, but which intuitively he knew to be evil. If I call at eleven, will that be too early? No, she whispered. Please come early. There is a matinee tomorrow. You mean today, he corrected. Poor little girl. How tired you will be. Good night. Good night, she said, almost inaudibly. She entered, and having closed the door, stood leaning against it for several minutes. Bleakness and nausea threatened to overcome her anew, and she felt that if she essayed another step, she must collapse upon the floor. Her maid was in bed, and had not been awakened by Rita's entrance. After a time, she managed to grope her way to her bedroom, where, turning up the light, she sank down helplessly upon the bed. Her mental state was peculiar, and her thoughts revolved about the journey from Oxford Street homeward. A thousand times she mentally repeated the journey, speaking the same words over and over again, and hearing Monty Irvin's replies. In those few minutes during which they had been together, her sentiments in regard to him had undergone a change. She had always respected Irvin, but this respect had been curiously compounded of the personal and the mercenary. His well-ordered establishment at Prince's Gate had loomed behind the figure of the man forming a pleasing background to the portrait. Without being showy, he was a splendid match for any woman. His wife would have access to good society, and would enjoy every luxury that wealth could procure. This was the picture lovingly painted and constantly retouched by Rita's mother. Now it had vanished. The background was gone, and only the man remained the strong, reserved man whose deep voice had spoken so gently, whose devotion was so true and unselfish that he only sought to shield and protect her from follies the nature of which he did not even seek to learn. She was stripped of her vanity and felt loathsome and unworthy of such a love. Oh, she moaned, rocking to and fro. I hate myself. I hate myself. Now that the victory so long desired seemed at last to be won, she hesitated to grasp the prize. One solacing reflection she had. She would put the errors of her past behind her. Many times of late she had found herself longing to be done with the feverish life of the stage, envied by those who had been her companions in the old chorus days, and any one of whom would have counted ambition crowned could she have played the maid of the mask, Rita thought otherwise. The ducal mansions and rose-bowered Riviera hotels through which she moved nightly had no charm for her. She sighed for reality, and had wearied long ago of the canvas palaces and the artificial southern moonlight. In fact, stage life had never truly appealed to her, save as a means to an end. Again and yet again her weary brain reviewed the episodes of the night since she had left Cyrus Kilfane's flat, so that nearly an hour had elapsed before she felt capable of the operation of undressing. Finally, however, she undressed, shuddering although the room was warmed by an electric radiator. The weakness and sickness had left her, but she was quite wide awake, although her brain demanded rest from that incessant review of the events of the evening. She put on a warm wrap and seated herself at the dressing table, studying her face critically. She saw that she was somewhat pale and that she had an indefinable air of dishevelment. Also, she detected shadows beneath her eyes, the pupils of which were curiously contracted. Automatically, as a result of habit, she unlocked her jewel case and took out a tiny vial containing minute cachets. She shook several out onto the palm of her hand and then paused, staring at her reflection in the mirror. For fully half a minute she hesitated. Then, I shall never close my eyes all night if I don't, she whispered, as if in reply to a spoken protest, and I should be a wreck in the morning. Thus, in the very apogee of her resolve to reform, did she drive one more rivet into the manacles which held her captive to Cosma and company. Upon a little spirit stove stood a covered vessel containing milk, which was placed there nightly by Rita's maid. She lighted the burner and warmed the milk. Then, swallowing three of the cachets from the vial, she drank the milk. Each cachet contained three decigrams of meloria, the insidious drug notorious under its trade name of veronal. She slept deeply and was not awakened until ten o'clock. Her breakfast consisted of a cup of strong coffee, but when Monty Irvin arrived at eleven, Rita exhibited no sign of nerve exhaustion. 
She looked bright and charming, and Irvin's heart leapt hotly in his breast at sight of her. Following some desultory and unnatural conversation, "'May I speak quite frankly to you?' he said, drawing his chair nearer to the settee upon which Rita was seated. She glanced at him swiftly. "'Of course,' she replied. "'Is it about my late hours?' He shook his head, smiling rather sadly. "'That is only one phase of your rather feverish life, little girl,' he said. "'I don't mean that I want to lecture you or reproach you. I only want to ask if you are satisfied.' satisfied echoed rita twirling a tassel that hung from a cushion beside her yes you have achieved success in your profession he strove in vain to banish bitterness from his voice you are a star and your photograph is to be seen frequently in the smartest illustrated papers you are clever and beautiful and have hosts of admirers but are you satisfied she stared absently at the silk tassel twirling it about her white fingers more and more rapidly. Then, no, she answered softly. Monty Irvin hesitated for a moment, ere bending forward and grasping her hands. I am glad you are not satisfied, he whispered. I always knew you had a soul for something higher, better. She avoided his ardent gaze, but he moved to the settee beside her and looked into the bewitching face. Would it be a great sacrifice to give it all up? He whispered in yet a lower tone. Rita shook her head, persistently staring at the tassel. For me? She gave him a swift, half-frightened glance, pressing her hands against his breast and leaning back. Oh, you don't know me! You don't know me! She said, the good that was in her touched to life by the man's sincerity. I don't deserve it! Rita, he murmured, I won't hear you say that. You know nothing about my friends, about my life. I know that I want you for my wife so that I can protect you from those friends. He took her in his arms, and she surrendered her lips to him. My sweet little girl, he whispered. I cannot believe it. Yet. But the die was cast, and when Rita went to the theater to dress for the afternoon performance, she was pledged to sever her connection with the stage on the termination of her contract. She had luncheon with Monty Irvin and had listened almost dazedly to his plans for the future. His wealth was even greater than her mother had estimated it to be, and Rita's most cherished dreams were dwarfed by the prospects which Monty Irvin opened up before her. It almost seemed as though he knew and shared her dearest ambitions. She was to winter beneath real southern palms, and to possess a cruising yacht, not the one of boards and canvas like that which figured in The Maid of the Mask. Real southern palms, she mused guiltily not those conjured up by opium. That he was solicitous for her health, the nature of his schemes revealed. They were to visit Switzerland and proceed thence to a villa which he owned in Italy. Christmas they would spend in Cairo, explore the Nile to Aswan in a private dahabia, and return home via the Riviera in time to greet the English spring. Rita's delicate, swiftly changing color, her almost ethereal figure, her intense nervous energy he ascribed to a delicate constitution. She wondered if she would ever dare tell him the truth, if she ought to tell him. Pine came to her dressing room just before the performance began. He had telephoned at an early hour in the morning, and had learned from her maid that Rita had come home safely and was asleep. Rita had expected him, but the influence of Monty Irvin, from whom she had parted at the stage door, had prevailed until she actually heard Sir Lucian's voice in the corridor. She had resolutely refrained from looking at the little jeweled casket engraved from Lucy to Rita, which lay in her makeup box upon the table. But the imminence of the ordeal which she dreaded intensely weakened her resolution. She swiftly dipped a little nail file into the white powder which the box contained, and when Pine came in, she turned to him composedly. I'm so sorry if I gave you a scare last night, Lucy, she said, but I woke up feeling sick and had to go out into the fresh air. I was certainly alarmed, drawled Pine, whose swarthy face looked more than usually worn in the hard light created by the competition between the dressing room lamps and the gray wintry daylight which crept through the windows. Do you feel quite fit again? Quite, thanks, Rita glanced at a ring which she had not possessed three hours before. Oh, Lucy, I don't know how to tell you, she turned in her chair, looking up wistfully at Pine, who was standing behind her. His jaw hardened, and his glance sought the white hand upon which the costly gems glittered. He coughed nervously. Perhaps, his drawing manner of speech temporarily deserted him, he spoke jerkily, perhaps 
I can guess. She watched him in a pathetic way, and there was a threat of tears in her beautiful eyes. For whatever his earlier intentions may have been, Sir Lucian had proved a staunch friend and, according to his own peculiar code, an honorable lover. Is it Irvin? he asked jerkily. Rita nodded, and a tear glistened upon her darkened lashes. Sir Lucian cleared his throat again, then coolly extended his hand, once more master of his emotions. Congratulations, Rita, he said. The better man wins. I hope you will be very happy. He turned and walked quietly out of the dressing room. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of Dope This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia. Dope by Sax Romer. Chapter 16. Limehouse. It was on the following Tuesday evening that Mrs. Sin came to the theatre, accompanied by Molly Gretna. Rita instructed that she should be shown up to the dressing room. The personality of this singular woman interested her keenly. Mrs. Sin was well known in certain bohemian quarters, but was always spoken of as one speaks of a pet vice. Not to know Mrs. Sin was to be outside the magic circle, which embraces the exclusively smart people who practiced the latest absurdities. The so-called artistic temperament is compounded of great strength and great weakness. Its virtues are whiter than those of ordinary people, and its vices blacker. For such a personality, Mrs. Sin embodied the idea of secret pleasure. Her bold good looks repelled Rita, but the knowledge in her dark eyes was alluring. I arrange for you for Saturday night, she said. Sy Kilfane is coming with Molly, and you bring... Oh, replied Rita hesitatingly, I'm sorry you've gone to so much trouble. No trouble, my dear, Mrs. Sin assured her. Just a little matter of business, and you can pay the bill when it suits you. I'm frightfully excited, cried Molly Gretna. It's so nice of you to have asked me to join your party. Of course, Cy goes practically every week, but I've always wanted another girl to go with. Oh, I shall be in a perfectly delicious panic when I find myself all among funny Chinamen and things. I think there's something so magnificently wicked-looking about a pigtail, and the very name of Limehouse thrills me to the soul. That fixity of purpose which had enabled Rita to avoid the cunning snares set for her feet, and to snatch triumph from the very cauldron of shame without burning her fingers, availed her not at all in dealing with Mrs. Sin. The image of Monty receded before this appeal to the secret, pleasure-loving woman of insatiable curiosity, primitive and unmoral, who dwells, according to a modern cynic philosopher, within every daughter of Eve touched by the fire of genius. She accepted the arrangement for Saturday, and before her visitors had left the dressing room, her mind was busy with plausible deceits to cover the sojourn in Chinatown. Something of Molly Gretna's foolish enthusiasm had communicated itself to Rita. Later in the evening, Sir Lucian called, and, on hearing of the scheme, grew silent. Rita, glancing at his reflection in the mirror, detected a black and angry look upon his face. She turned to him. "'Why, Lucy,' she said, "'don't you want me to go?' He smiled in his sardonic fashion. "'Your wishes are mine, Rita,' he replied." She was watching him closely. "'But you don't seem keen,' she persisted. "'Are you angry with me?' "'Angry? We are still friends, aren't we?' "'Of course. Do you doubt my friendship?' Rita's maid came in to assist her in changing for the third act, and Pine went out of the room. But in spite of his assurances, Rita could not forget that fierce, almost savage expression which had appeared upon his face when she had told him of Mrs. Sin's visit. Later she taxed him on the point— but he suffered her inquiry with imperturbable sang-froid, and she found herself no wiser respecting the cause of his annoyance. Painful twinges of conscience came during the ensuing days, when she found herself in her fiancé's company, but she never once seriously contemplated dropping the acquaintance of Mrs. Sin. She thought, vaguely, as she had many times thought before, of cutting adrift from the entire clique, but there was no return of that sincere emotional desire to reform— 
which she had experienced on the day that Monty Irvin had taken her hand in blind trust and had asked her to be his wife. Had she analyzed, or been capable of analyzing, her intentions with regard to the future, she would have learned that daily they inclined more and more towards compromise. The drug habit was sapping will and weakening morale insidiously, imperturbably. She was caught in a current of that sacred river seen in an opium trance by Coleridge, and which ran through caverns measureless to man, down to a sunless sea. Pine's big car was at the stage door on that fateful Saturday night, for Rita had brought her dressing case to the theater, and having called for Kilfane and Molly Gretna, they were to proceed direct to Limehouse. Rita, as she entered the car, noticed that Juan Marino, Sir Lucian's man, and not the chauffeur with whom she was acquainted, sat at the wheel. As they drove off, "'Why is Marino driving tonight, Lucy?' she asked. Sir Lucian glanced aside at her. "'He is in my confidence,' he replied. "'Fraser is not.' "'Oh, I see. You don't want Fraser to know about the Limehouse journey?' "'Naturally I don't. He would talk to all the men at the garage, and from South Audley Street the titbit of scandal would percolate through every stratum of society.' Rita was silent for a few moments, then. "'Were you thinking about Monty?' she asked diffidently. Pine laughed. "'He'd scarcely approve, would he?' "'No,' replied Rita. "'Was that why you were angry when I told you I was going? This anger to which you constantly revert had no existence outside your own imagination, Rita. But,' he hesitated, "'you will have to consider your position, dear, now that you are the future Mrs. Monty.' Rita felt her cheeks flush and she did not reply immediately. "'I don't understand you, Lucy,' she declared at last. "'How odd you are!' "'Am I? Well, never mind. We will talk about my eccentricity later. Here is Cyrus.' Kilfane was standing in the entrance to the stage door of the theatre at which he was playing. As the car drew up, he lifted two leather grips on to the step, and Marino, descending, took charge of them. "'Come along, Molly,' said Kilfane, looking back. Miss Gretna, very excited, ran out and got into the car beside Rita. Pine lowered two of the collapsible seats for Kilfane and himself, and the party set out for Limehouse. "'Oh!' cried the fair-haired Molly, grasping Rita's hand. "'My heart began palpitating with excitement the moment I woke up this morning. Oh, how calm you are, dear!' "'I'm only calm outside,' laughed Rita. The joie de vivre and apparently unimpaired vitality of this woman, for whom— if half that which rumor whispered were true, vice had no secrets, astonished Rita. Her physical resources were unusual, no doubt, because the demand made upon them by her mental activities was slight. As the car sped along the strand, where theater-goers might still be seen making for the tube, omnibus, and tram-car, and entered Fleet Street, where the car and taxicab traffic was less, a mutual silence fell upon the party. Two, at least, of the travelers were watching the lighted windows of the great newspaper offices with a vague sense of foreboding, and thinking how, bound upon a secret purpose, they were passing along the avenue of publicity. It is well that man lacks prescience. Neither Rita nor Sir Lucian could divine that a day was shortly to come when the hidden presses which throbbed about them that night should be busy with the story of the murder of one and the disappearance of the other. Around St. Paul's churchyard whirled the car, its engine running strongly and almost noiselessly. The great bell of St. Paul's boomed out the half hour. Oh, cried Molly Gretna, how that made me jump! What a beautifully gloomy sound! Kilfane murmured some inaudible reply, but neither Pine nor Rita spoke. Cornhill and Leadenhall Street, along which presently their route lay, offered a prospect of lamp-lighted emptiness but at Aldgate they found themselves amid East End throngs which afforded a marked contrast to those crowding theatre land, and from thence, through Whitechapel and the seemingly endless commercial road, it was a different world into which they had penetrated. Rita hitherto had never seen the East End on a Saturday night, and the spectacle afforded by these busy marts, lighted by naphtha flames, in whose smoky glare Jews and Jewesses, Poles, Swedes, Easterns, dagos and half-castes moved feverishly, was a fascinating one. She thought how utterly alien they were, the men and women of a world unknown to that society upon whose borders she dwelled. 
She wondered how they lived, where they lived, why they lived. The wet pavements were crowded with nondescript humanity. The night was filled with the unmusical voices of Hebrew hucksters and the air laden with the smoky odor of their lamps. Tram cars and motor buses were packed unwholesomely with these children of Shadowland, drawn together from the seven seas by the magnet of London. She glanced at Pine, but he was seemingly lost in abstraction, and Kilfane appeared to be asleep. Molly Gretna was staring eagerly out on the opposite side of the car at a group of three Dago sailors, whom Marino had nearly run down. But she turned at that moment and caught Rita's glance. "'Don't you simply love it?' she cried. "'Some of those men were really handsome, dear. If they would only wash, I'm sure I could adore them.' "'Even such charms as yours can be bought at too high a price,' drawled Sir Lucian. "'They would gladly do murder for you, but never wash.' Crossing Limehouse Canal, the car swung to the right into West India Dock Road. The uproar of the commercial thoroughfare was left far behind. Dark, narrow streets and sinister-looking alleys lay right and left of them, and into one of the narrowest and least inviting of all, Marino turned the car. In the dimly lighted doorway of a corner house, the figure of a Chinaman showed as motionless as a silhouette. Oh, sighed Molly Gretna rapturously. A Chinaman! I begin to feel deliciously sinful. The car came to a standstill. We get out here and walk, said Sir Lucian. It would not be wise to drive further. Marino will deliver our baggage by hand presently. But we shall all be murdered, cried Molly. Murdered in cold blood. I'm dreadfully frightened. Something of the kind is quite likely, drawled Sir Lucian, if you draw attention to our presence in the neighborhood so deliberately. Walk ahead, Kilfane, with Molly. Rita and I will follow at a discreet distance. Leave the door ajar. Temporarily subdued by Pine's icy manner, Miss Gretna became silent and went on ahead with Cyrus Kilfane, who had preserved an almost unbroken silence throughout the journey. Rita and Sir Lucian followed slowly. Oh, what a creepy neighborhood, whispered Rita. Look, someone is standing in that doorway over there, watching us. Take no notice, he replied. A cat could not pass along this street unobserved by the Chinese, but they will not interfere with us, provided we do not interfere with them. Kilfane had turned to the right, into a narrow court, at the entrance to which stood an iron pillar. As he and his companion passed under the lamp in a rusty bracket which projected from the wall, they vanished into a place of shadows. There was a ceaseless chorus of distant machinery, and above it rose the grinding and rattling solo of a steam winch. Once a siren hooted apparently quite near them, and looking upward at a tangled, interminable mass which overhung the street at this point, Rita suddenly recognized it for a ship's bowsprit. "'Why?' she said. "'We are right on the bank of the river.' "'Not quite,' answered Pine. "'We are skirting the dock basin. We are nearly at our destination.' Passing in turn under the lamp, they entered the narrow court, and from a doorway immediately on the left— a faint light shone out upon the wet pavement. Pine pushed the door fully open and held it for Rita to enter. As she did so, Hello, hello, croaked a harsh voice. Number one, please chop low. Sin, sin, wa. The uncanny cracked voice proceeded to give an excellent imitation of a police whistle and concluded with that of a clicking of castanets. Shut the door, Lucy, came the murmurous tones of Kilfane from the gloom of the stuffy little room in the center of which stood a stove, wherefrom had proceeded the dim light shining out upon the pavement. "'Light up, Sin Sin!' "'Sin Sin Wa! Sin Sin Wa!' shrieked the voice, and again came the rattling of imaginary castanets. "'Smartest leg in Buenos Aires! Buenos Aires! Please chop! Please chop low!' "'Oh!' whispered Molly Gretna in the darkness. "'I believe I'm going to scream!' Pine closed the door and a dimly discernible figure on the opposite side of the room stooped and opened a little cupboard in which was a lighted ship's lantern. The lantern being lifted out and set upon a rough table near the stove, it became possible to view the apartment and its occupants. It was a small, low-ceilinged place, having two doors, one opening upon the street and the other upon a narrow, uncarpeted passage. The window was boarded up. The ceiling had once been whitewashed, and a few limp, dark fragments of paper still adhering to the walls proved that some forgotten decorator had exercised his art upon them in the past. 
A piece of well-worn matting lay upon the floor, and there were two chairs, a table, and a number of empty tea chests in the room. Upon one of the tea chests, placed beside the cupboard which had contained the lantern, a Chinaman was seated. His skin was of so light a yellow color as to approximate to dirty white, and his face was pockmarked from neck to crown. He wore long, snake-like mustaches, which hung down below his chin. They grew from the extreme outer edges of his upper lip, the center of which, usually the most hirsute, was hairless as the lip of an infant. He possessed the longest and thickest pigtail which could possibly grow upon a human scalp, and his left eye was permanently closed, so that a smile which adorned his extraordinary countenance seemed to lack the sympathy of his surviving eye, which, oblique, beady, held no mirth in its glittering depths. The garments of the one-eyed Chinaman, who sat complacently smiling at the visitors, consisted of a loose blouse, blue trousers tucked into gray socks, and a pair of those native, thick-soled slippers which suggest to a Western critic the acme of discomfort. A raven, black as a bird of ebony, perched upon the Chinaman's shoulder, head a-tilt, surveying the newcomers with a beady, glittering left eye, which strangely resembled the beady, glittering right eye of the Chinaman. For, singular, uncanny circumstance, this was a one-eyed raven which sat upon the shoulder of his one-eyed master. Molly Gretna uttered a stifled cry. Oh, she whispered, I knew I was going to scream. The eye of Sin Sin Wa turned momentarily in her direction, but otherwise he did not stir a muscle. Are you ready for us, Sin? asked Sir Lucian. All ready. Lola had got ye topside loom ready, replied the Chinaman in a soft, crooning voice. Go ahead, Kilfane, directed Sir Lucian. He glanced at Rita, who was standing very near him, surveying the evil little room and its owner with ill-concealed disgust. This is merely the foyer, Rita, he said, smiling slightly. The state apartments are upstairs and in the adjoining house. Oh, she murmured, and no more. Kilfane and Molly Gretna were passing through the inner doorway, and Molly turned. "'Isn't it loathsomely delightful?' she cried. "'Smartest leg in Buenos Aires!' shrieked the raven. "'Sin, sin! Sin, sin!' Uttering a frightened exclamation, Molly disappeared along the passage. Sir Lucian indicated to Rita that she was to follow, and he, passing through the last of the party, closed the door behind him. Sin, sin, wa never moved and the raven, settling down upon the Chinaman's shoulder, closed his serviceable eye. End of chapter 16 Recording by Olivia Chapter 17 of Dope This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Mark Friend Dope by Sax Romer Chapter 17. The Black Smoke Up an uncarpeted stair, Cyrus Kilfane led the party, and into a kind of lumber room lighted by a tin oil lamp and filled to overflowing with heterogeneous and unsavory rubbish. Here were garments, male and female, no less than five dilapidated bowler hats, more tea chests, broken lamps, tattered fragments of coconut matting, steel bed lathes and straw mattresses, ruins of chairs the whole diffusing an indescribably unpleasant odor. Opening a cupboard door, Kilfane revealed a number of pendant, ragged garments and two more bowler hats. Holding the garments aside, he banged upon the back of the cupboard. Three blows, a pause, and then two blows. Following a brief interval, during which even Molly Gretna was held silent by the strangeness of the proceedings, "'Who is it?' inquired a muffled voice. "'Sigh, and the crowd,' answered Kilfane." Thereupon ensued a grating noise, and hats and garments swung suddenly backward, revealing a doorway in which Mrs. Sin stood framed. She wore a Japanese kimono of embroidered green silk and a pair of green and gold brocaded slippers which possessed higher heels than Rita remembered to have seen even Mrs. Sin mounted upon before. Her ankles were bare, and it was impossible to determine in what manner she was clad beneath the kimono. Undoubtedly she had a certain dark beauty, of a bold, abandoned type. Come right in, she directed. Mind your head, Lucy. 
the quartet filed through into a carpeted corridor, and Mrs. Sin reclosed the false back of the cupboard, which, viewed from the other side, proved to be a door fitted into a recess in the corridor of the adjoining house. This recess ceased to exist when a second and heavier door was closed upon the first. You know, murmured Kilfane, old Sin Sin has his uses, Lola. Those doors are perfectly made. Pooh, scoffed the woman with a flash of her dark eyes. He is half a ship's carpenter and half an ape. She moved along the passage, her arm linked in that of Sir Lucian. The others followed, and... Is she truly married to that dreadful Chinaman? whispered Molly Gretna. Yes, I believe so, murmured Kilfane. She is known as Mrs. Sinsinwa. Oh, Molly's eyes opened wily. I almost envy her. I have read that Chinamen tie their wives to beams in the roof and lash them with leather thongs until they swoon. I could die for a man who lashed me with leather thongs. Englishmen are so ridiculously gentle to women. Opening a door on the left of the corridor, Mrs. Sin displayed a room screened off into three sections. One shaded lamp high up near the ceiling served to light all the cubicles, which were heated by small charcoal stoves. These cubicles were identical in shape and appointment, each being draped with quaint Chinese tapestry and containing rugs, a silken divan, an armchair, and a low eastern table. Choose for yourself, said Mrs. Sin, turning to Rita and Molly Gretna. Nobody else come tonight. You two in this room, eh? Next door each other for company. She withdrew, leaving the two girls together. Molly clasped her hands ecstatically. Oh, my dear, she said, what do you think of it all? Well, confessed Rita, looking about her, personally, I feel rather nervous. My dear, cried Molly, I am simply quivering with delicious terror. Rita became silent again, looking about her and listening. The harsh voice of the Cuban Jewess could be heard from a neighboring room, but otherwise a perfect stillness reigned in the house of Sin Sinwa. She remembered that Mrs. Sin had said, It is quiet, so quiet. The idea of undressing and reclining on these divans in real oriental fashion, declared Molly, giggling, makes me feel that I am an odalisk already. I have dreamed that I was an odalisk, dear. After smoking, you know, it was heavenly. At least, I don't know that heavenly is quite the right word. And now that evil spirit of abandonment came to Rita, communicated to her possibly by her companion, Dread, together with a certain sense of moral reluctance, departed, and she began to enjoy the adventure at last. It was as though something in the faintly perfumed atmosphere of the place had entered into her blood, driving out reserve and stifling conscience. When Sir Lucian reappeared, she ran to him excitedly, her charming face flushed and her eyes sparkling. Oh, Lucy, she cried, how long will our things be? I'm keen to smoke. His jaw hardened and when he spoke, it was with a drawl more marked than usual. Marino will be here almost immediately, he answered. The tone constituted a rebuff, and Rita's coquetry deserted her, leaving her mortified and piqued. She stared at Pine, biting her lip. You don't like me tonight, she declared. If I look ugly, it's your fault. You told me to wear this horrid old costume. He laughed in a forced, unnatural way. You are quite well aware that you could never look otherwise than maddeningly beautiful, he said harshly. Do you want me to recall the fact to you again that you are shortly to be Monty Irvin's wife? Or should you prefer me to remind you that you have declined to be mine? Turning slowly, he walked away. But, oh, Lucy, whispered Rita. He paused, looking back. I know now why you didn't want me to come, she said. I, I'm sorry. The hard look left Sir Lucian's face immediately and was replaced by a curious, indefinable expression, an expression which rarely appeared there. You only know half the reason, he replied softly. At that moment, Mrs. Sin came in, followed by Marino carrying two dressing cases. Molly Gretna had run off to Kilfane and could be heard talking loudly in another room. But, called by Mrs. Sin, she now returned wide-eyed with excitement. Mrs. Sin cast a lightning glance at Sir Lucian and then addressed Rita. Which of these three rooms you choose? she asked, revealing her teeth in one of those rapid smiles which were mirthless as the eternal smile of Cincinwa. Oh, said Rita hurriedly, I don't know. Which do you want, Molly? I love this end one, cried Molly. It has cushions which simply reek of oriental voluptuousness and cruelty. It reminds me of a delicious book I have been reading called Musk, Hashish, and Blood. 
Hashish, said Mrs. Sin, and laughed harshly. One night you shall eat the hashish, and then... She snapped her fingers, glancing from Rita to Pine. Oh, really? Is that a promise? asked Molly eagerly. No, no, answered Mrs. Sin. It is a threat. Something in the tone of her voice as she uttered the last four words in mock dramatic fashion caused Molly and Rita to stare at one another questioningly. That suddenly altered tone had awakened an elusive memory, but neither of them could succeed in identifying it. Marino, a lean, swarthy fellow, his foreign cast of countenance accentuated by close-cut side whiskers, deposited Miss Gretna's case in the cubicle which she had selected, and, Rita pointing to that adjoining it, he disposed the second case beside the divan and departed silently. As the sound of a closing door reached them, "'You noticed how quiet it is?' asked Mrs. Sin. "'Yes,' replied Rita. "'It is extraordinarily quiet.' "'This is an empty house. To let,' explained Mrs. Sin. "'We watch it stay so. Sin the landlord, see? Windows all boarded up and everything padded. No sound outside, no sound inside. Sin call it the house of a hundred raptures, after the one he have in Buenos Aires.' The voice of Cyrus Kilfane came, querulous, from a neighboring room. "'Lola, my dear, I am almost ready.' Ho! Oh, Mrs. Sin uttered a deep-toned laugh. He is a glutton for the chandu. I am coming, Sai. She turned and went out. Sir Lucian paused for a moment, permitting her to pass, and, Good night, Rita, he said in a low voice. Happy dreams. He moved away. Lucy, called Rita softly. Yes. Is it, is it really safe here? Pine glanced over his shoulder towards the retreating figure of Mrs. Sin, then, I shall be awake, he replied. I would rather you had not come, but since you are here, you must go through with it. He glanced again along the narrow passage created by the presence of the partitions, and spoke in a voice lower yet. You have never really trusted me, Rita. You were wise, but you can trust me now. Good night, dear. He walked out of the room and along the carpeted corridor to a little apartment at the back of the house, furnished comfortably, but inexorably bad taste. A cheerful fire was burning in the grate, the flue of which had been ingeniously diverted by Cincinnois, so that the smoke issued from a chimney of the adjoining premises. On the mantel-shelf, which was garishly draped, were a number of photographs of Mrs. Sin in Spanish dancing costume. Pine seated himself in an armchair and lighted a cigarette. Except for the ticking of a clock, the room was silent as a padded cell. Upon a little Moorish table beside a deep, low settee lay a complete opium-smoking outfit. Lolling back in the chair and crossing his legs, Sir Lucian became lost in abstraction, and he was thus seated when, some ten minutes later, Mrs. Sin came in. Ah, she said, her harsh voice softened to a whisper. I wondered. So you wait to smoke with me? Pine slowly turned his head, staring at her as she stood in the doorway, one hand resting on her hip and her shapely figure boldly outlined by the kimono. No, he replied. I don't want to smoke. Are they all provided for? Mrs. Sin shook her head. Not Sai, she said. Two pipes are nothing to him. He will need two more, perhaps three. But you are not going to smoke? Not tonight, Lola. She frowned and was about to speak when, Lola, my dear, came a distant, querulous murmur. Give me another pipe. Sin tossed her head, turned, and went out again. Sir Lucian lighted another cigarette. When finally the woman came back, Cyrus Kilfane had presumably attained the opium smoker's paradise, for Lola closed the door and seated herself upon the arm of Sir Lucian's chair. She bent down, resting her dusky cheek against his. "'You smoke with me?' she whispered coaxingly. "'No, Lola, not tonight,' he said, patting her jewel-laden hand and looking aside into the dark eyes which were watching him intently. Mrs. Sin became silent for a few moments. Something has changed in you, she said at last. You are different lately. Indeed, drawled Sir Lucian. Possibly you are right. Others have said the same thing. You have lots of money now. Your investments have been good. You want to become respectable, eh? Pine smiled sardonically. Respectability is a question of appearance, he replied. The change to which you refer would seem to go deeper. Very likely, murmured Mrs. Sin. I know why you don't smoke. You have promised your pretty little friend that you will stay awake and see that nobody tries to cut her sweet white throat. Sir Lucian listened imperturbably. She is certainly nervous, he admitted coolly. I may add that I am sorry I brought her here. 
Oh, said Mrs. Sin, her voice rising half a note. Then why do you bring her to the house? She made the arrangement herself, and I took the easier path. I am considering your interests as much as my own, Lola. She is about to marry Monty Urban, and if his suspicions were aroused, he is quite capable of digging down to the hundred raptures. You brought her to Cosma's. She was not at the time engaged to Irvin. Ah, I see. And now everybody says you are changed. Yes, she is a charming friend. Pine looked up into the half-veiled dark eyes. She never has been and never can be any more to me, Lola, he said. At those words, designed to placate, the fire which smoldered in Lola's breast burst into sudden flame. She leapt to her feet, confronting Sir Lucian. I know! I know! she cried harshly. Do you think I am blind? If she had been like any of the others, do you suppose it would have mattered to me? But you respect her. You respect her! Eyes blazing and hands clenched, she stood before him, a woman mad with jealousy, not of a successful rival, but of a respected one. She quivered with passion, and Pine, perceiving his mistake too late, only preserved his wonted composure by dint of a great effort. He grasped Lola and drew her down on to the arm of the chair by sheer force, for she resisted savagely. His ready wit had been at work, and... "'What a little spitfire you are,' he said, firmly grasping her arms, which felt rigid to the touch. "'Surely you can understand. Rita amused me at first. Then, when I found she was going to marry Monty Irvin, I didn't bother about her any more. In fact, because I like and admire Irvin, I tried to keep her away from the dope. We don't want trouble with a man of that type, who has all sorts of influence. Besides, Monty Irvin is a good fellow.' Gradually, as he spoke, the rigid arms relaxed and the lithe body ceased to quiver. Finally, Lola sank back against his shoulder, sighing. I don't believe you, she whispered. You are telling me lies, but you have always told me lies. One more does not matter, I suppose. How strong you are. You have hurt my wrists. You will smoke with me now? For a moment, Pine hesitated. Then, very well, he said. Go and lie down. I will roast the chandu. End of chapter 17 Chapter 18 of Dope This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Friend. Dope by Sax Romer. Chapter 18 The Dream of Sinsinwa. For a habitual opium smoker, to abstain when the fumes of Chandu actually reach his nostrils is a feat of willpower difficult adequately to appraise. An ordinary tobacco smoker cannot remain for long among those who are enjoying the fragrant weed without catching the infection and beginning to smoke also. Twice to redouble the lure of my lady nicotine would be but loosely to estimate the seductiveness of the spirit of the poppy. Yet, Sir Lucian Pine smoked one pipe with Mrs. Sin, and perceiving her to be already in a state of dreamy abstraction, loaded a second, but in his own case with a fragment of cigarette stump which smoldered in a tray upon the table. His was that rare type of character whose possessor remains master of his vices. Following the fourth pipe, Pine, after the second, had ceased to trouble to repeat his feat of ledger domain. The sleep claimed Mrs. Sin. Her languorous eyes closed, and her face assumed that rapt expression of Buddha-like beautitude which Rita had observed at Kilfane's flat. According to some scientific works on the subject, sleep is not invariably induced in the case of Europeans by the use of Chandu. Loosely, this is true, but this type of European never becomes a habitué. The habitué always sleeps. That dream world to which opium alone holds the key becomes the real world, quote, for the delights of which the smoker gladly resigns all mundane interests. Close quote. The exiled Chinaman returns again to the sampan of his boyhood, floating joyously on the waters of some yellow lined canal. The Malay hears once more the mystic whispering in the mangrove swamps, or scents the fragrance of nutmeg and cinnamon in the far off golden Kersenese. Mrs. Sin doubtless lived anew the triumphs of earlier days in Buenos Aires when she had been La Bella Lola, the greatly beloved, and before she had met and married Sinsinwa. Gives much, but claims all, 
and he who would open the poppy gates must close the door of ambition and bid farewell to manhood. Sir Lucian stood looking at the woman, and although one pipe had affected him but slightly, his imagination momentarily ran riot, and a pageant of his life swept before him, so that his jaw grew hard and grim, and he clenched his hands convulsively. An unbroken stillness prevailed in the opium house of Sinsinwa. Recovering from his fit of abstraction, Pine, casting a final keen glance at the sleeper, walked out of the room. He looked along the carpeted corridor in the direction of the cubicles, paused, and then opened the heavy door masking the recess behind the cupboard. Next, opening the false back of the cupboard, he passed through to the lumber room beyond and partly closed the second door. He descended the stair and went along the passage, but ere he reached the door of the room on the ground floor, Hello! Hello! Sinsin! Sinsin wa! croaked the raven. Number one, please chop low! The note of a police whistle followed, rendered with uncanny fidelity. Pine entered the room. It presented the same aspect as when he had left it. The ship's lantern stood upon the table, and Sinsin Wa sat upon the tea chest, the great black bird perched on his shoulder. The fire in the stove had burned lower, and its downcast glow revealed less mercilessly the dirty condition of the floor. Otherwise, no one, nothing, seemed to have been disturbed. Pine leaned against the doorpost, taking out and lighting a cigarette. The eye of Sinsin Wa glanced sideways at him. Well, Sinsin, said Sir Lucian, dropping a match and extinguishing it under his foot, you see, I am not smoking tonight. No smoky? murmured the Chinaman. Very good stuff. Yes, this stuff is all right, Sin. Number one proper, crooned Sin Sin Wa, and relapsed into smiling silence. Number one, please, croaked the raven sleepily. Smartest! He even attempted the castanets imitation, but was overcome by drowsiness. For a while, Sir Lucian stood watching the singular pair and smiling in his ironical fashion. The motive which had prompted him to leave the neighboring house and to seek the companionship of Sinsinwa was so obscure and belonged so peculiarly to the superdelicacies of chivalry that already he was laughing at himself. But, nevertheless, in this house and not in its secret annex of a hundred raptures, he designed to spend the night. Presently, On le bas, please, patrol come, long plenty soon, murmured Sinsinwa. Indeed, said Sir Lucian glancing at his wristwatch. The door is open above. Sinsinwa raised one yellow forefinger, without moving either hand from the knee upon which it rested, and shook it slightly to and fro. Ali lighty, he murmured. No blubbery, ali peaceful fellows. Will they want to come in? Want you drink, replied Sinsinwa. Oh, I see. If I go out into the passage, it will be all right. Ali lighty. Even as he softly crooned the words came a heavy squelch of rubbers upon the wet pavement outside, followed by a rapping on the door. Sinsinwa glanced aside at Sir Lucian, and the latter immediately withdrew, partly closing the door. The Chinaman shuffled across and admitted two constables. The raven, remaining perched upon his shoulder, shrieked, Smartest leg in Buenos Aires! and fully awakened, rattled invisible castanets. The police strode into the stuffy little room without ceremony, a pair of burly fellows, fresh-complexioned, and genial as men are wont to be who have reached a welcome resting place on a damp and cheerless night. They stood by the stove, warming their hands, and one of them stooped, took up the little poker, and stirred the embers to a brighter glow. "'Been having a pipe, Sin?' he asked, winking at his companion. "'I can smell something like opium.' No smoky opium, murmured Sinsinwa complacently. Smoky wood pine. Ha <laughs> ha, laughed the other constable. I don't think. You likey try one PC pipe one time, inquired the Chinaman. Got ye flend makey smoky. The man who had poked the fire slapped his companion on the back. Now's your chance, Jim, he cried. You always said you'd like to have a cut at it. Hmm, muttered the other. A double O, that fifteen over proof Jamaica of your sin, will hit me in a tender spot tonight. Lum? murmured Sinsin blandly. No, I got. He resumed his seat on the tea chest, and the raven muttered sleepily, Sin, sin, sin. Hmm, repeated the constable. He raised the skirt of his heavy top coat, and from his trouser pocket drew out a leather purse. The eye of Sinsinwa remained fixed upon a distant corner of the room. 
From the purse, the constable took a shilling, ringing it loudly upon the table. Double rum, miss, please, he said fastidiously. There's no treason allowed nowadays, so my pals... I stood yours last night, Jim, anyway, cried the other, grinning. Go on, stump up. Jim rang a second shilling on the table. Two double rums, he called. Sinsinwa reached a long arm into the little cupboard beside him and withdrew a bottle and a glass. Leaning forward, he placed the bottle and glass on the table and adroitly swept the coins into his yellow palm. Number one, please chop, croaked the raven. You're right, old bird, said Jim, pouring out a stiff peg of the spirit and disposing of it at a drought. We should freeze to death on this blasted riverside beat if it wasn't for Sin Sin. He measured out a second portion for his companion, and the latter drank the raw spirit off as though it had been ale, replaced the glass on the table, and having adjusted his belt and lantern in that characteristic way which belongs exclusively to members of the Metropolitan Police Force, turned and departed. Good night, Sin, he said, opening the door. So long, murmured the Chinaman. Good night, old bird, cried Jim, following his colleague. So long. The door closed, and Sin Sin Wa, shuffling across, rebolted it. As Sir Lucian came out of his hiding place, Sin Sin Wa returned to his seat on the tea chest, first putting the glass unwashed and the rum bottle back into the cupboard. To the ordinary observer, the Chinaman presents an inscrutable mystery. His seemingly unemotional character and his racial inability to express his thoughts intelligibly in any European tongue stamp him as a creature apart, and one whom many are prone erroneously to classify very low in the human scale and not far above the ape. Sir Lucian usually spoke to Sin Sinwa in English, and the other replied in that weird jargon known as pigeon. But the silly Sinwa who murmured gibberish and the Sin Sinwa who could converse upon many and curious subjects in his own language were two different beings, as Sir Lucian was aware. Now, as the one-eyed Chinaman resumed his seat and the one-eyed raven sank into slumber, Pine suddenly spoke in Chinese, a tongue which he understood as it is understood by few Englishmen, that strange, sibilant speech which is alien from all Western conceptions of oral intercourse, as the Chinese institutions and ideals are alien from those of the rest of the civilized world. So you make a profit on your rums in Sinwa, he said ironically, at the same time that you keep in the good graces of the police. Sin Sinwa's expression underwent a subtle change at the sound of his native language. He moved his hands and became slightly animated. A great people of the West, most honorable sir, he replied in the pure Mandarin dialect, claim credit for having said that business is business, yet he who thus expressed himself was a Chinaman. You surprise me. The wise man must often find occasion for surprise, most honorable sir. Sir Lucian lighted a cigarette. I sometimes wonder, Sin Sinwa, he said slowly, what your aim in life can be. Your father was neither a ship's carpenter nor a shopkeeper. This I know. Your age I do not know and cannot guess, but you are no longer young. You covet wealth. For what purpose, Sin Sinwa? Standing behind the Chinaman, Sir Lucian's dark face, since he made no effort to hide his feelings, revealed the fact that he attached to this seemingly abstract discussion a greater importance than his tone of voice might have led one to suppose. Sin Sin Wa remained silent for some time. Then, Most honorable sir, he replied, when I have smoked the opium before my eyes, for in dreams I have to, a certain picture arises. It is that of a farm in the province of Honan. Beyond the farm stretch paddy fields as far as one can see. Men and women and boys and girls move about the farm, happy in their labors. And far, far away dwell the mountain gods, who send the great yellow river sweeping down through the valleys where the poppy is in bloom. It is to possess that farm, most honorable sir and thus paddy fields that I covet wealth. And in spite of the opium which you consume, you have never lost sight of this ideal? Never. But your wife? Sinsinwa performed a curious shrugging movement, peculiarly racial. A man may not always have the same wife, he replied cryptically. The honorable wife who now attends to my requirements 
laboring unselfishly in my miserable house and scorning the love of other men as she has always done and as an honorable and upright woman is expected to do may one day be gathered to her ancestors a man never knows or she may leave me i am not a good husband it may be that some little maiden of honan mild-eyed like the musk deer and modest and tender will consent to minister to my old age who knows sir lucian blew a thick cloud of tobacco smoke into the room and she will never love you sinsinwa he said almost sadly she will come to your house only to cheat you sinsinwa repeated the eloquent shrug we have a saying in honan most honorable sir he answered and it is this he who has tasted the poppy cup has nothing to ask of love she will cook for me this little one and stroke my brow when i am weary and light my pipe my eye will rest upon her with pleasure it is all i ask there came a soft rapping on the outer door three raps a pause and then two raps the raven opened his beady eye sinsinwa he croaked number one police chaplo sinsinwa glanced aside at sir lucian the traffic a consignment of opium he said sam took calls sir lucian consulted his watch and I should like to go with you, Sinsinwa, he said. Would it be safe to leave the house, with the upper door unlocked? Sinsinwa glanced at him again. All are asleep, most honorable sir? All. I will lock the room above and the outer door. It is safe. He raised a yellow hand, and the raven stepped sedately from his shoulder onto his wrist. Come, Tlingaling, crooned Sinsinwa. You go to bed, my little black friend. And one day you too shall see the paddy fields of Honan. Opening the useful cupboard, he stooped and in hopped the raven. Sinsinwa closed the cupboard and stepped out into the passage. I will bring you a coat and a cap and scarf, he said. Your magnificent apparel would be out of place among the low pigs who wait in my other disgusting cellar to rob me. Forgive my improper absence for one moment, most honorable sir. End of chapter 18《ハッピーバースデー》の時間は、LibriVox のコーディング。LibriVox のコーディングは、LibriVox のコーディングの時間は、LibriVox 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 のコーディング The odor of the outfit was disgusting, but this man's double life had brought him so frequently in contact with all forms of uncleanliness, including that of the Far East, compared with which the dirt of the West is hygienic, that he suffered it without complaint. A Chinese boy of indeterminable age, wearing a slop shop suit and a cap, was waiting outside the door, and when Sin Sin Hua appeared, carefully locking up, he muttered something rapidly in his own sibilant language. Sinsinwa made no reply. To his indoor attire, he had added a pea jacket and a bowler hat, and the oddly assorted trio set off westward, following the bank of the Thames in the direction of Limehouse Basin. The narrow, ill lighted streets were quite deserted, but from the river and the riverside arose that ceaseless jangle of industry which belongs to the great port of London. On the Surrey shore, whistles shrieked, and endless moving chains sent up their monstrous clangor into the night. Human voices sometimes rose above the din of machinery. In the silence, the three pursued their way, crossing inlets and circling around basins dimly divined, turning to the right into a lane flanked by high, eyeless walls, and again to the left, finally to emerge nearly opposite a dilapidated gateway giving access to a small wharf. On the rickety gates, bills were posted announcing, quote, This wharf to let. Close quote. The annex buildings appeared to be a mere shell. To the right again, they turned, and once more to the left, halting before a two story brick house which had apparently been converted into a barber shop. In one of the grimy windows were some loose packets of cigarettes, a soap maker's advertisement, and a card Sam Tuck, Barber. Opening the door with a key which he carried, the boy admitted Sir Lucian and Sinsinwa to the dimly lighted interior of a room, the pretensions of which to be regarded as a shaving salon. 
were supported by the presence of two chairs, a filthy towel, and a broken mug. Sin Sinwa shuffled across to another door and, followed by Sir Lucian, descended a stone stair to a little cellar apparently intended for storing coal. A tin lamp stood upon the bottom step. Removing the lamp from the step, Sin Sin Wa set it on the cellar floor, which was black with coal dust, then closed and bolted the door. A heap of nondescript litter lay piled in a corner of the cellar. This Sin Sin Wa disturbed sufficiently to reveal a movable slab in the roughly paved floor. It was so ingeniously concealed by coal dust that one who had sought it unaided must have experienced great difficulty in detecting it. Furthermore, it could only be raised in the following manner. A piece of strong iron wire, which lay among the other litter, was inserted in a narrow slot, apparently a crack in the stone, about an inch of the end of the wire being bent outward to form a right angle. When the seemingly useless piece of scrap iron had been thrust through the slab and turned, it formed a handle by means of which the trap could be raised. Again, Sinsinwa took up the lamp, placing it at the brink of the opening revealed. A pair of wooden steps rested below, and Sir Lucian, who evidently was no stranger to the establishment, descended awkwardly, since there was barely room for a big man to pass. He found himself in the mouth of a low passage, unpaved and shored up with rough timbers in the manner of a mine working. Sinsinwa followed with the lamp, drawing the slab down into its place behind him. Stooping forward and bending his knees, Sir Lucian made his way along the passage, the Chinaman following. It was of considerable length and terminated before a strong door bearing a massive lock. Sin Sin Wa reached over the stooping figure of Sir Lucian and unfastened the lock. The two emerged in a kind of dugout. Part of it had evidently been in existence before the ingenious Sin Sin Wa had exercised his skill upon it and was of solid brickwork and stone paved, palpably a storage vault. But it had been altered to suit the Chinaman's purpose and one end, that in which the passage came out, was timbered. It contained a long counter and many shelves, also a large oil stove and a number of pots, pans, and queer-looking jars. On the counter stood a ship's lantern. The shelves were laden with packages and bottles. Behind the counter sat a venerable and perfectly bald Chinaman. The only trace of hair upon his countenance grew on the shrunken upper lip, mere wisps of white down. His skin was shriveled like that of a preserved fig, and he wore big horn-rimmed spectacles. He never once exhibited the slightest evidence of life, and his head and face and the horn-rimmed spectacles might quite easily have passed for those of an unwrapped mummy. This was Sam Took. Bending over a box upon which rested a canvas-bound package was a burly seaman engaged in unknotting twine with which the canvas was kept in place. As Sin Sin Wa and Sir Lucian came in, he looked up revealing a red-bearded, ugly face, very puffy under the eyes. "'Watch her, Sin Sin,' he said gruffly. "'Who's your long pal?' "'Friend,' murmured Sin Sin Wa complacently. "'You got ye puka stuff this time, George?' "'I allus brings the puka stuff,' roared the seaman, ceasing to fumble with the knots and glaring at Sin Sin Wa. "'What's your mean puka stuff?' "'Got ye no use for bran,' murmured Sin Sin Wa. "'Got ye no use for tintac. Got ye no use for blue.' Brawn, roared the man, his glance and pose very menacing. Tin tacks and glue. Oh, the flamin' hell ever try to sell you glue. Me only want ye lemon to you, said Sinsinwa. No pigeon. George glared for a moment, breathing heavily. Then he stooped and resumed his task. Sinsinwa and Sir Lucian watching him in silence. A sound of lapping water was faintly audible. Opening the canvas wrappings, the man began to take out and place upon the counter a number of reddish balls of leaf opium, varying in weight from about eight ounces to a pound or more. Hmm, murmured Sinsinwa. Smyrna stuff. From a pocket of his pea jacket, he drew a long bodkin, and taking up one of the largest balls, he thrust the bodkin in and then withdrew it. The steel stained a coffee color. Sinsinwa smelled and tasted the substance, adhering to the bodkin weighed the ball reflectively in his yellow palm, and then set it aside. He took up a second, whereupon... Affamo, governor, cried the seaman furiously. You think I'm gonna wait here while you prods about in all the blasted lot? It's damn near I died. I shan't get out. Half time, savvy? Shove it on the scales. Sin Sin Wa shook his head. Too muchy slick, too muchy bobbery, he murmured. Sinsinwa gachi sabi what him catchy by or no pigeon. 
What's that game? inquired George menacingly. Don't you know a cake of Smyrna when you smells it? No sabi lead chop till plodum witty dipper, explained the Chinaman imperturbably. Lead, shouted the man. There ain't no bloody lead in em. Hmm, murmured Sinsinwa smilingly. So fashioner, all very proper. He calmly inserted the bodkin in the second cake, seemed to meet with some obstruction, and laid the ball down upon the counter. From beneath his jacket he took out a clasp knife attached to a steel chain. Undeterred by a savage roar from the purveyor, he cut the sticky mass in half, and digging his long nails into one of the halves, brought out two lead shots. He directed a glance of his beady eye upon the man. Bloody liar, he murmured sweetly. Lobba! Who's a robber? shouted George, his face flushing darkly and apparently not resenting the earlier innuendo. Who's a robber? One Sarsi Smyrna fella packy stuff so fashion, murmured Sinwawa. Thief fella lobby poor sailor man. George jerked his peaked cap from his head, revealing a tangle of unkept red hair. He scratched his skull with savage vigor. Blimey, he said pathetically. There's a go. I've been done brown, governor. Low luck, murmured Sinwawa, and resumed his examination of the cakes of opium. The man watched him now in silence, only broken by explanations of blimey and flymanel, when more shot was discovered. The tests concluded. Got ye some more? asked Sinsinwa. From the canvas wrapping, George took out and tossed on the counter a square packet wrapped in grease paper. Hmm, murmured Sinsinwa. Patna, where you catchy? Off of the Lasca, growled the man. The cake of Indian opium was submitted to the same careful scrutiny as that which the balls of Turkish had already undergone, but the Patna opium proved to be unadulterated. Reaching over the counter, Sinsinwa produced a pair of scales, and, watched keenly by George, weighed the leaf and then the cake. Ten six Smyrna, one Leban Patna, muttered Sinsinwa. You catch ye eighty jimmies. Eh? roared George. Eighty quid! Eighty quid, flaming blind O'Reilly. Here, think I'm up the po. Eighty quid, you balmy. Eighty ten, murmured Sinsinwa. Eighty Jimmy's opium, ten bob lead. Ah, give more than that for it, cried the seaman. And I damn near it, a police boat coming in too. Sir Lucian spoke a few words rapidly in Chinese. Sinsinwa performed his curious oriental shrug and taking a fat leather wallet from his hip pocket, counted out the sum of eighty-five pounds upon the counter. You catchy eighty-five, he murmured. Too muchy price. The man grabbed the money and pocketed it without a word of acknowledgement. He turned and strode along the room, his heavy iron-clamped boots ringing on the paved floor. Fetch a grim, Sin Sin, he cried. I'll never get out if I don't jump to it. Sin Sinwa took the lantern from the counter and followed. Opening a door at the further end of the place, he set the lantern at the head of three descending wooden steps discovered. With the opening of the door, the sound of lapping water had grown perceptibly louder. George clattered down the steps, which led to a second but much stouter door. Sinsinwa followed, nearly closing the first door, so that only a faint streak of light crept down to them. The second door was opened, and the clangor of the Surrey shore suddenly proclaimed itself. Cold, damp air touched them, and the faint light of the lantern above cast their shadows over unctuous gliding water, which lapped the step upon which they stood. Slimy shapes uprose dim and ghostly from its darkly moving surface. A boat was swinging from a ring beside the door, and into it George tumbled. He unhitched the lashings and strongly thrust the boat out upon the water. Coming to the first of the dim shapes, he grasped it and thereby propelled the skiff to another beyond. These indistinct shapes were the piles supporting the structure of a wharf. "'Good night, governor,' he cried hoarsely. "'So long,' muttered Sinsinwa. He waited until the boat was swallowed in the deeper shadows, then reclosed the water gate and ascended to the room where Sir Lucian awaited. Such was the receiving office of Sinsinwa. While the wharf remained untenanted, it was not likely to be discovered by the authorities, for even at low tide the river door was invisible from passing craft. Prospective leasees who had taken the trouble to inquire about the rental had learned that it was so high as to be prohibitive. Sinsinwa paid fair prices and paid cash. This was no more than a commercial necessity. For those who have opium, cocaine, veronal, and heroin to sell can always find a ready market in London and elsewhere. 
but one sufficiently curious and clever enough to have solved the riddle of the vacant wharf would have discovered that the mysterious owner who showed himself so loath to accept reasonable offers for the property could well afford to be thus independent. Those who control the traffic control El Dorado, a city of gold which, unlike the fabled Manoa, actually exists and yields its riches to the unscrupulous adventurer. Smiling his mirthless, eternal smile, Sinsinwa placed the newly purchased stock upon a shelf immediately behind Sam Took, and Sam Took exhibited the first evidence of animation which had escaped him throughout the progress of the deal. He slowly nodded his hairless head. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 of Dope This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Dope by Sax Romer, Chapter 20. Kazma's Methods Rita Dresden married Monty Irvin in the spring and bade farewell to the stage. The goal long held in view was attained at last, but another farewell, which at one time she had contemplated eagerly, no longer appeared desirable or even possible. To Cocomania had been added a tolerance for opium, and at the last party given by Cyrus Kilfane she had learned that she could smoke nearly as much opium as the American habitu. The altered attendance of Sir Lucian surprised and annoyed her. He, who had first introduced her to the spirit of the coca leaf and to the goddess of the poppy, seemed suddenly to have determined to convince her of the folly of these communions. He only succeeded in losing her confidence. She twice visited the House of a Hundred Raptures with Molly Gretna, and once with Molly and Kilfane, unknown to Sir Lucian. Urgent affairs of some kind necessitated his leaving England a few weeks before the date fixed for Rita's wedding, and as Kilfane had already returned to America, Rita recognized with a certain dismay that she would be left to her own resources, handicapped by the presence of a watchful husband. This subtle change in her view of Monty Irvin she was incapable of appreciating, for Rita was no psychologist but the effect of the drug habit was pointedly illustrated by the fact that, in a period of little more than six months, from regarding Monty Irvin as a rock of refuge, a chance of salvation, she had come to regard him in the light of an obstacle to her indulgence. Not that her respect had diminished. She really loved at last, and so well, that the idea of discovery by this man whose wholesomeness was the trait of character which most potently attracted her, was too appalling to be contemplated. The chance of discovery would be enhanced, she recognized, by the absence of her friends and accomplices. Of course, she was acquainted with many other devotees. In fact, she met so many of them that she had grown reconciled to her habits, believing them to be common to all smart people, a uh, part of the bohemian life. The truth of the matter was that she had become a prominent member of a coterie closely knit and associated by a bond of mutual vice a kind of masonry whereof Casma of Bond Street was grand master and Mrs. Sin grand mistress. The relations existing between Casma and his clients were of a most peculiar nature, too, and must have piqued the curiosity of any one but a drug slave. Having seen him once in his oracular cave, Rita had been accepted as one of the initiated. Therefore, she had had no occasion to interview the strange, immobile Egyptian, nor had she experienced any desire to do so. The method of obtaining drugs was a simple one. She had merely to present herself at the establishment in Bond Street and to purchase either a flask of perfume or a box of sweetmeats. There were several varieties of perfume and each corresponded to a particular drug. The sweetmeats corresponded to morphine. Rashid, the attendant, knew all Kazma's clients and with the bosk or flask he gave them a quantity of the required drug. This scheme was precautionary. For if a visitor should chance to be challenged on leaving the place, there was the legitimate purchase to show an evidence of the purpose of the visit. No conversation was necessarily, merely the selection of a scent and the exchange of a sum of money. Rashid retired to wrap up the purchase, and with it a second and smaller package was slipped into the customer's hand. That the prices charged were excessive, nay, ridiculous, did not concern Rita, for in common with the rest of her kind, she was careless of expenditure. Opium alone Kazma did not sell. 
He sold morphine, tincture of opium, and other preparations, but those who sought the solace of the pipe were compelled to deal with Mrs. Sin. She would arrange parties or would prepare the hundred raptures in Limehouse for visitors, but except in the form of opiated cigarettes, she could rarely be induced to part with any of the precious gum. Thus she cleverly kept a firm hold upon the devotees of the poppy. Drug takers form a kind of brotherhood, and outside the charmed circle they are secretive as members of the mafia, the camorra, or the catus menage. In this secrecy, which indeed is a recognized symptom of drug mania, lay Cosmos security. Rita experienced no desire to peer behind the veil, which, literally and metaphorically, he had placed between himself and the world. At first she had been vaguely curious and had questioned Sir Lucian and others, but nobody seemed to know the real identity of Casma, and nobody seemed to care, provided that he continued to supply drugs. They all led secret, veiled lives, these slaves of the laboratory, and that Casma should do likewise did not surprise them. He had excellent reasons. During this early stage of faint curiosity, she had suggested to Sir Lucian that for Casma to conduct a dream-reading business seemed to be to add to the likelihood of police interference. <laughs> the baronet had smiled sardonically. It is an additional safeguard, he had assured her. It corresponds to the method of a notorious Paris assassin who was very generally regarded by the police as a cunning pickpocket. Casma's business of dream-reading does not actually come within the act. He is clever enough for that. Remember, he does not profess to tell fortunes. It also enables him to bulk idle curiosity. At the time of her marriage, Rita was hopelessly in the toils and had been really panic-stricken at the prospect, once so golden, of a protracted sojourn abroad. The war, which rendered travel impossible, she regarded rather in the light of a heaven-sent boon. Irvin, though personally favoring a quiet ceremony, recognized that Rita cherished a desire to quit theater land in a chariot of fire, and accordingly the wedding was on a scale of magnificence which outshone that of any other celebrated during the season. Even the lugubrious Miss Dresden, who gave his daughter away, was seen to smile twice. Mrs. Esden, moved in a rarefied atmosphere, of gratified ambition and parental pride, which no doubt closely resembled that which the angels breathe. It was during the early days of her married life, and while Sir Lucian was still abroad, that Rita began to experience difficulty in obtaining the drugs which she required. She had lost touch to a certain extent with her former associates, but she had retained her maid, Nina, and the girl regularly went to Casma's and returned with the little flasks of perfume. When an accredited representative was sent upon such a mission, Casma dispatched the drugs disguised in a scent flask. But on each successive occasion that Nina went to him, the price increased and finally became so exorbitant that even Rita grew astonished and dismayed. She mentioned the matter to another habitu, a lady of title addicted to the use of the hypodermic syringe, and learned that she, Rita, was being charged nearly twice as much as her friend. I should bring the man to his senses, dear, said her ladyship. I know a doctor who will be only too glad to supply you. When I say doctor, he is no longer recognized by the BMA, but he's nonetheless clever and kind for all that. To the clever and kind medical man, Rita repaired on the following day, bearing a written introduction from her friend. The discredited physician supplied her for a short time, charging only moderate fees. Then suddenly... This second source of supply was closed. The man declared that he was being watched by the police and that he dared not continue to supply her with cocaine and veronal. His shifty eyes gave the lie to his words, but he was firm in his resolution, whatever may have led him to it, and Rita was driven back to Casma. His charges had become more exorbitant than ever, but her need was imperative. Nevertheless, she endeavored to find another drug dealer, and after time was again successful. At a certain supper club, she was introduced to a suave little man, quite palpably an uninterned alien, who smilingly offered to provide her with any drug to be found in the British pharmacopoeia, at most moderate charges. With this little German Jew villain, she made a pact, reflecting that, provided that his wares were of good quality, she had triumphed over Casma. 
The craving for Shandu seized her sometimes and refused to be exorcised by morphia, laudanum, or any other form of opium, but she had not dared to spend a night at the House of a Hundred Raptures since her marriage. Her new German friend volunteered to supply the necessary gum, outfit, and to provide an apartment where she might safely indulge in smoking. She declined at first, but finally on Molly Gretna's return from France, where she had been acting as a nurse, Rita and Molly accepted the suave alien's invitation to spend an evening in his private opium divan. Many thousands of careers were wrecked by the war, and to the war and the consequent absence of her husband, Rita undoubtedly owed her relapse into opium smoking. That she would have continued secretly to employ a cocaine, veronal, and possibly morphine was probably enough, but the constant society of Monty Irvin must have made it extremely difficult for her to indulge the craving for Shandu. She began to regret the gaiety of her old life. Loneliness and monotony plunged her into a state of suicidal depression, and she grasped eagerly at every promise of excitement. It was at about this time that she met Margaret Haley, and between the two, so contrary in disposition, a close friendship arose. The girl doctor ere long discovered Rita's secret, of course, and the discovery was hastened by an event which occurred shortly after they had become acquainted. The suave alien gentleman disappeared. That was the entire story in five words, or all of the story that Rita ever learned. His apartments were labeled to let, and the nightclubs knew him no more. Rita, for a time, was deprived of drugs, and the nervous collapse which resulted revealed to Margaret Haley's trained perceptions the truth respecting her friend. Kazma's terms proved to be more outrageous than ever, but Rita found herself again compelled to resort to the Egyptian. She went personally to the rooms in Old Bond Street and arranged with Rashid to see Kazma on the following day, Friday, for Kazma only received visitors by appointment. As it chanced, Sir Lucian Pine returned to England on Thursday night and called upon Rita at Prince's Gate. She walked to him as a friend in need, unfolding the pitiful story to the truth of which her nervous condition bore eloquent testimony. Sir Lucian began to pace up and down the charming little room in which Rita had received him. She watched him, haggard-eyed. Presently, "'Leave Kazma to me,' he said. "'If you visit him, he will merely shield himself behind the mystical business or assure you that he is making no profit on his sales. Kilfane had similar trouble with him. "'Then you will see him?' asked Rita. "'I will make a point of interviewing him in the morning. Meanwhile, if you will send Nina round to Albemarle Street in about an hour, I will see what can be done.' "'Oh, Lucy,' whispered Rita, "'what a pal you are!' Sir Lucian smiled in his cold fashion. "'I try to be,' he said enigmatically, "'but I don't always succeed.' He turned to her. "'Have you ever thought of giving up this doping?' he asked. "'Have you ever realized that with increasing tolerance the quantities increase as well, and that a day is sure to come when—' Rita repressed a nervous shudder. "'You are trying to frighten me,' she replied. "'You have tried before. I don't know why, but it's no good, Lucy. You know I cannot give it up.' "'You can try.' "'I don't want to try,' she cried irritably. It will be time enough when Monty is back again and we can really live. This wretched existence with everything restricted and rationed and all one's friends in Flanders or Mesopotamia or somewhere drives me mad. I tell you I should die, Lucy, if I tried to do without it now. The hollow presence of reform contemplated in a hazy future did not deceive Sir Lucian. He suppressed a sigh and changed the subject of conversation. End of chapter 20《Chapter Twenty One of Dope》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon.《Dope》by Sax Romer. Chapter Twenty One: The Cigarettes from Buenos Aires. Sir Lucian's intervention proved successful. Casma's charges became more modest and Rita no longer found it necessary to deprive herself of hats and dresses in order to obtain drugs. But nevertheless, these were not the halcyon days of old. She was now surrounded by spies. 
it was necessary to resort to all kinds of subterfuge in order to cover her expenditures at the establishment in old bond street her husband never questioned her outlay but on the other hand it was expedient to be armed against the possibility of his doing so and read his debts were accumulating formidably then there was margaret halley to consider rita had never hitherto given her confidence to any one who was not addicted to the same practices as herself and she frequently experienced embarrassment beneath the grave scrutiny of margaret's watchful eyes in another this attitude of gentle disapproval would have been irritating but rita loved and admired margaret and suffered accordingly as for sir lucian she had ceased to understand him an impalpable barrier seemed to have arisen between them the inner man had become inaccessible her mind was not subtle enough to grasp the real explanation of this change in her old lover being based upon wrong premises her inferences were necessarily wide of the truth and she believed that sir lucian was jealous of margaret's cousin quinton gray gray met rita at margaret halley's flat shortly after he had returned home from service in the east and he immediately conceived a violent infatuation for this pretty friend of his cousin's in this respect his conduct was in no way peculiar few men were proof against the seductive mrs monty irvin not because she designedly encouraged admiration but because she was one of those fortunately rare characters who inspire it without conscious effort her appeal to men was sweetly feminine and quite lacking in that self-assertive and masculine take me or leave me attitude which characterizes some of the beauties of today. There was nothing abstract about her delicate loveliness, yet her charm was not wholly physical. Many women disliked her. At dance, theater, and concert, Quentin Gray played the doting cavalier, and Rita, who was used to at least one such adoring attendant, accepted his homage without demur. Monty Urban returned to civil life. But Rita showed no disposition to dispense with her new admirer. Both Gray and Sir Lucian had become frequent visitors at Prince's Gate, and Irvin, who understood his wife's character up to a point, made them his friends. Shortly after Monty Irvin's return, Sir Lucian taxed Rita again with her increasing subjection to drugs. She was in a particularly gay humor as the supplies from Casma had been regular, and she laughingly fenced with him when he reminded her of her declared intention to reform when her husband should return. You are really as bad as Margaret, she declared. There is nothing the matter with me. You talk of curing me as though I were ill. Physician, heal thyself. The sardonic smile momentarily showed upon Pine's face, and— i know when and where to pull up rita he said a woman never knows this if i were deprived of opium tomorrow i could get along without it i have given up opium replied rita it's too much trouble and the last time molly and i went she paused glancing quickly at sir lucian go on he said grimly i know you have been to sinsinois what happened the last time well continued rita hurriedly monty seemed to be vaguely suspicious besides mrs sin charged me most preposterously i really cannot afford it lucy i am glad you cannot but what i was about to say was this suppose you were to be deprived not of chard but of cocaine and veronal do you know what would happen to you oh whispered rita why will you persist in trying to frighten me i'm not going to be deprived of them i persist dear because i want you to try gradually to depend less upon drugs so that if the worst should happen you would have a chance rita stood up and faced him biting her lip lucy she said do you mean that kasma i mean that anything might happen rita after all, we do possess a police service in London, 
and one day there might be an accident casma has certain influence but it may be withdrawn rita won't you try she was watching him closely and now the pupils of her beautiful eyes became dilated you know something she said slowly which you are keeping from me he laughed and turned aside i know that i am compelled to leave england again rita for a time and i should be a happier man if i knew that you were not so utterly dependent upon casma oh lucy are you going away again i must but i shall not be absent long i hope rita sank down upon the settee from which she had risen and was silent for some time then i will try lucy she promised i will go to margaret halley as she is always asking me to do good girl said pine quietly it is just a question of making the effort rita you will succeed with margaret's help a short time later solution left england but throughout the last week that he remained in london rita spent a great part of every day in his company she had latterly begun to experience an odd kind of remorse for her treatment of the inscrutably reserved baronet his earlier intentions she had not forgotten but she had long ago forgiven him and now she often felt sorry for this man whom she had deliberately used as a stepping-stone to fortune gray was quite unable to conceal his jealousy he seemed to think that he had a proprietary right to mrs monty urban's society and during the week preceding sir lucian's departure gray came perilously near to making himself ridiculous on more than one occasion one night on leaving a theatre rita suggested to pine that they should proceed to a supper club for an hour it'll be like old times she said but your husband is expecting you protested sir lucian let's ring him up and ask him to join us he won't but he cannot very well object then as a result they presently found themselves descending a broad carpeted stairway from the rooms below arose the strains of an american melody dancing was in progress or rather one of those orgiastic ceremonies which passed for dancing during this pagan period just by the foot of the stairs they paused and surveyed the scene why said rita there is quinton glaring insanely silly boy you see whom he is with asked sir lucian molly gretna but i mean the woman sitting down rita stood on tiptoe trying to obtain a view and suddenly oh she exclaimed mrs sin the dance at that moment concluding they crossed the floor and joined the party mrs sin greeted them with one of her rapid mirthless smiles she was wearing a gown noticeable but not for quantity even in that semi-draped assembly molly gretna giggled rapturously but gray swiftly changing color betrayed a mood which he tried in vain to conceal by his manner having exchanged a few words with the new arrivals he evidently realized that he could not trust himself to remain longer and now i must be off he said awkwardly i have an appointment important business good night everybody he turned away and hurried from the room rita flushed slightly and exchanged a glance with sir lucian mrs sin who had been watching the three intently did not fail to perceive this glance molly gretna characteristically said a silly thing oh she cried i wonder whatever is the matter with him he looks as though he had gone mad it is perhaps his heart said mrs sin harshly and she raised her bold dark eyes to sir lucian's face oh please don't talk about hearts cried rita wilfully misunderstanding monty has a weak heart and it frightens me so murmured mrs sin poor fellow i think a weak heart is most romantic declared molly gretna but gray's behavior had cast a shadow upon the party which even molly's empty light-hearted chatter was powerless to dispel 
and when shortly after midnight sir lucian drove rita home to prince's gate they were very silent throughout the journey just before the car reached the house where does mrs sin live asked rita although it was not of mrs sin that she had been thinking in limehouse i believe replied sir lucian at the house but i fancy she has rooms somewhere in town also he stayed only a few minutes at prince's gate and as the car returned along piccadilly sir lucian glancing upward towards the windows of a tall block of chambers facing the green park observed a light in one of them acting upon a sudden impulse he raised the speaking tube pull up fraser he directed the chauffeur stopped the car and sir lucian alighted glancing at the clock inside as he did so and smiling at his own quixotic behaviour he entered an imposing doorway and rang one of the bells there was an interval of two minutes or so when the door opened and a man looked out is that you willis asked pine oh i beg pardon sir lucian i didn't know you in the dark has mr gray retired yet not yet will you please follow me sir lucian the stairway lights are off a few moments later sir lucian was shown into the apartment of gray's which oddly combined the atmosphere of a gymnasium with that of a study gray wearing a dressing-gown and having a pipe in his mouth was standing up to receive his visitor his face rather pale and the expression of his lips at variance with that in his eyes but hello pine he said quietly anything wrong or have you just looked in for a smoke sir lucian smiled a trifle sadly i wanted a chat gray he replied i'm leaving town tomorrow, or i should not have intruded at such an unearthly hour no intrusion muttered gray try the armchair no the big one it's more comfortable he raised his voice willis bring some fluid sir lucian sat down and from the pocket of his dinner jacket took out a plain brown packet of cigarettes and selected one here said gray have a cigar no thanks replied pine i rarely smoke anything but these never seen that kind of packet before declared gray what brand are they no particular brand they are imported from buenos aires i believe willis having brought the tray of refreshments and departed again sir lucian came at once to the point i really called gray he said to clear up any misunderstanding there may be in regard to rita irvin quinton gray looked up suddenly when he heard rita's name and what misunderstanding he asked regarding the nature of my friendship with her answered sir lucian coolly now i'm going to speak quite bluntly gray because i like rita and i respect her i also like and respect monty irvin and i don't want you or anybody else to think that rita and i are or ever have been anything more than pals i have known her long enough to have learned that she sails straight and has always sailed straight now listen gray please you embarrassed me tonight old chap and you embarrassed rita it was unnecessary he paused and then added slowly she is as sacred to me gray as she is to you and we are both friends of monty irvin for a moment quentin gray's fiery temper flickered up as his heightened color showed but the coolness of the older and cleverer man prevailed gray laughed stood up and held out his hand you're right pine he said but she's damn pretty he uttered a loud sigh if only she were not married sir lucian gripped the outstretched hand but his answering smile had much pathos in it if only she were not gray he echoed he took his departure shortly afterwards absently leaving a brown packet of cigarettes upon the table it was an accident yet there were few when the truth respecting sir lucian pine became known who did not believe it had been a deliberate act designed to lure quentin gray into the path of the poppy 
End of chapter 21. Recording by John Brandon. Chapter 22 of Dope. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia. Dope by Sax Romer. Chapter 22 The Stranglehold. Less than a month later, Rita was in a state of desperation again. Kazma's prices had soared above anything that he had hitherto extorted. Her bank account, as usual, was greatly overdrawn, and creditors of all kinds were beginning to press for payment. Then, crowning catastrophe, Monty Irvin, for the first time during their married life, began to take an interest in Rita's reckless expenditure. By a combination of adverse circumstances, she, the wife of one of the wealthiest aldermen of the City of London, awakened to the fact that literally she had no money. She pawned as much of her jewelry as she could safely dispose of, and temporarily silenced the more threatening tradespeople. But Kazma declined to give credit, and checks had never been acceptable at the establishment in Old Bond Street. Rita feverishly renewed her old quest, seeking in all directions for some less extortionate purveyor. But none was to be found. The selfishness and secretiveness of the drug slave made it difficult for her to learn on what terms others obtained Kazma's precious goods. But although his prices undoubtedly varied, she was convinced that no one of all his clients was so cruelly victimized as she. Molly Gretna endeavored to obtain an extra supply to help Rita, but Kazma evidently saw through the device, and the endeavor proved a failure. She demanded to see Kazma, but Rashid, the Egyptian, blandly assured her that the Sheikh el Kazma was away. She cast discretion to the winds and wrote to him, protesting that it was utterly impossible for her to raise so much ready money as he demanded, and begging him to grant her a small supply or to accept the letter as a promissory note to be redeemed in three months. No answer was received, but when Rita again called at Old Bond Street, Rashid proposed one of the few compromises which the frenzied woman found herself unwilling to accept. The Sheikh El Kazma say, my lady, your friend Mr. Gray never come to him. If you bring him, it will be all right. Rita found herself stricken dumb by this cool proposal. The degradation which awaits the drug slave had never been more succinctly expounded to her. She was to employ Gray's foolish devotion for the commercial advantage of Kazma. Of course, Gray might any day become one of the three wealthiest peers in the realm. She divined the meaning of Kazma's hitherto incomprehensible harshness, or believed that she did. She saw what was expected of her. My God, she whispered, I have not come to that yet. Rashid she knew to be incorruptible, or powerless, and she turned away, trembling, and left the place whose faint perfume of frankincense had literally become hateful to her. She was at this time bordering upon a state of collapse. Insomnia, which latterly had defied dangerously increased doses of aeronol, was telling upon nerve and brain. Now, her head aching so that she often wondered how long she could retain sanity, she found herself deprived not only of cocaine, but also of maloria. Margaret Halley was her last hope and to Margaret she hastened on the day before the tragedy which was destined to bring to light the sinister operations of the Chasma group. Although, perhaps mercifully, she was unaware of the fact, representatives of Spinker's agency had been following her during the whole of the preceding fortnight. That Rita was in desperate trouble of some kind her husband had not failed to perceive, and her reticence had quite naturally led him to a certain conclusion. He had sought to win her confidence by every conceivable means, and had failed. At last had come doubt, and the hateful interview with Spinker. As Rita turned in at the doorway below Margaret's flat, then Brisley was lighting a cigarette in the shelter of a porch nearly opposite, and Gunn was not far away. Margaret immediately perceived that her friend's condition was alarming, but she realized that whatever the cause to which it might be due, it gave her the opportunity for which she had been waiting. She wrote a prescription containing one grain of cocaine, but declined firmly to issue others unless Rita authorized her, in writing, to undertake a cure of the drug habit. 
Rita's disjointed statements pointed to a conspiracy of some kind on the part of those who had been supplying her with drugs. But Margaret knew from experience that to exhibit curiosity in regard to the matter would be merely to provoke evasions. A hopeless day and a pain-racked, sleepless night found Kazma's unhappy victim in the mood for any measure, however desperate, which should promise even temporary relief. Monty Irvin went out very early, and at about eleven o'clock Rita rang up Kazma's, but only to be informed by Rashid, who replied, that Kazma was still away. This evening he tell me that he see your friend if he come, my lady. As if the fates sought to test her endurance to the utmost, Quentin Gray called shortly afterwards, and invited her to dine with him and go to a theater that evening. For five age-long seconds, Rita hesitated. If no plan offered itself by nightfall, she knew that her last scruple would be conquered. After all, whispered a voice in her brain, Quentin is a man. Even if I took him to Casma's, and he was in some way induced to try opium, or even cocaine, he would probably never become addicted to drug-taking, but I should have done my part. Very well, Quentin, she heard herself saying aloud. Will you call for me? But when he had gone, Rita sat for more than half an hour, quite still, her hands clenched and her face a tragic mask. Gunn, of Spinker's agency, reported telephonically to Monty Irvin in the city that the Honorable Quentin Gray had called and had remained about twenty-five minutes, that he had proceeded to the Prince's restaurant and from there to Muddy's, where he had booked a box at the Gaiety Theatre. Towards the fall of dusk, the more dreadful symptoms which attend upon a sudden cessation of the use of cocaine by a victim of cocaenophagia began to assert themselves again. Rita searched wildly in the lining of her jewel case to discover if even a milligram of the drug had by chance fallen there from the little gold box. But the quest was in vain. As a final resort, she determined to go to Margaret Halley again. She hurried to Dover Street, and her last hope was shattered. Margaret was out, and Janet had no idea when she was likely to return. Rita had much ado to prevent herself from bursting into tears. She scribbled a few lines, without quite knowing what she was writing, sealed the paper in an envelope, and left it on Margaret's table. On returning to Prince's Gate and dressing for the evening, she had only a hazy impression. The hammer beats in her head were driving her of reasoning power, and she felt cold, numbed, although a big fire blazed in her room. Then, as she sat before her mirror, drearily wondering if her face really looked as drawn and haggard as the image in the glass, or if definite delusions were beginning, Nina came in and spoke to her. Some moments elapsed before Rita could grasp the meaning of the girl's words. "'Sir Lucian Pine has rung up, madam, and wishes to speak to you.' "'Sir Lucian? Sir Lucian had come back?' Rita experienced a swift return of feverish energy. Half-dressed as she was, and without pausing to take a wrap, she ran out to the telephone. Never had a man's voice sounded so sweet as that of Sir Lucian when he spoke across the wires. He was at Albemarle Street, and Rita, wasting no time in explanations, begged him to await her there. In another ten minutes she had completed her toilette and had sent Nina to phone for a cab. One of the minor details of his wife's behavior, which latterly had aroused Irvin's distrust, was her frequent employment of public vehicles in preference to either of the cars. Quentin Gray she had quite forgotten, until, as she was about to leave, "'Is there any message for Mr. Gray, madam?' inquired Nina, naively. "'Oh!' cried Rita. "'Oh, oh, of course. Quick, give me some paper and a pencil.' She wrote a hasty note, merely asking Gray to proceed to the restaurant where she promised to join him, left it in charge of the maid, and hurried off to Albemarle Street. Marino, the silent yellow-faced servant who had driven the car on the night of Rita's first visit to Limehouse, admitted her. He showed her immediately into the lofty study where Sir Lucian awaited. "'Oh, Lucy, Lucy!' she cried, almost before the door had closed behind Marino. "'I'm desperate, desperate!' Sir Lucian placed a chair for her. His face looked very drawn and grim, but Rita was in too highly strung a condition to observe this fact, or indeed to observe anything. Tell me, he said gently, and in a torrent of disconnected, barely coherent language, the tortured woman told him of Casma's attempt to force her to lure Quentin Gray into the drug coterie. Sir Lucian stood behind her chair, and the icy reserve which habitually rendered his face an impenetrable mask 
deserted him, as the story of Rita's treatment at the hands of the Egyptian of Bond Street was unfolded in all its sordid hideousness. Rita's soft musical voice, for which of old she had been famous, shook and wavered. Her pose, her twitching gestures, all told of a nervous agony bordering on prostration or worse. Finally, he dare not refuse you, she cried. Ring him up and, and insist upon him seeing me tonight. I will see him, Rita. She turned to him, wild eye. You shall not, you shall not, she said. I am going to speak to that man face to face, and if he is human, he must listen to me. Oh, I have realized the hold he has upon me, Lucy. I know what it means, this disappearance of all the others who used to sell what Kazma sells. If I am to suffer, he shall not escape. I swear it. Either he listens to me tonight, or I shall go straight to the police. Be calm, little girl, whispered Sir Lucian, and he laid his hand upon her shoulder. But she leapt up, her pupils suddenly dilating and her delicate nostrils twitching in a manner which unmistakably pointed to the impossibility of thwarting her if sanity were to be retained. "'Ring him up, Lucy,' she repeated in a low voice. "'He is there. Now that I have someone behind me, I see my way at last.' "'There may, nevertheless, be a better way,' said Sir Lucian. But he added quickly, "'Very well, dear. I will do as you ask. I have a little cocaine which I will give to you.' He went out to the telephone, carefully closing the study door. That he had counted on the influence of the drug to reduce Rita to a more reasonable frame of mind was undoubtedly the fact, for presently, as they proceeded on foot toward Old Bond Street, he reverted to something like his old ironical manner. But Rita's determination was curiously fixed. Unmoved by every kind of appeal, she proceeded to the appointment which Sir Lucian had made, ignorant of that which fate held in store for her, and Sir Lucian, also humanly blind, walked on to meet his death. End of chapter 22. Recording by Olivia. Chapter 23 of Dope. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Friend. Dope by Sax Romer. Part Third. The Man from Whitehall. Chapter 23. Chief Inspector Carey Resigns. Come in, said the Assistant Commissioner. The door opened and Chief Inspector Carey entered. His face was as fresh-looking, his attire as spruce, and his eyes were as bright as though he had slept well, enjoyed his bath, and partaken of an excellent breakfast whereas he had not been to bed during the preceding twenty-four hours, had breakfast upon biscuits and coffee, and had spent the night and early morning in ceaseless toil. Nevertheless, he had found time to visit a hairdressing salon, for he prided himself upon the nicety of his personal appearance. He laid his hat, cane, and overall upon a chair, and from a pocket of his reefer jacket took out a big notebook. "'Good morning, sir,' he said." "'Good morning, Chief Inspector,' replied the Assistant Commissioner. "'Pray be seated. No doubt,' he suppressed a weary sigh. "'You have a long report to make. I observe that some of the papers have the news of Sir Lucian Pine's death.' Chief Inspector Carey smiled savagely. Twenty pressmen are sitting downstairs,' he said, waiting for particulars. One of them got into my room. He opened his notebook. He didn't stay long.' The assistant commissioner gazed wearily at his blotting pad, striking imaginary chords upon the table edge with his large, widely extended fingers. He cleared his throat. <clears throat> Chief Inspector, he said, I fully recognize the difficulties which, you follow me, but the press is the press. Neither you or I could hope to battle against such an institution, even if we desired to do so. Where active resistance is useless, a little tact. You quite understand? "'Quite, sir. Rely upon me,' replied Carey. "'But I didn't mean to open my mouth until I had reported to you. "'Now, sir, here is a précis of evidence, nearly complete, "'written out clearly by Sergeant Combs. "'You would probably prefer to read it?' "'Yes, yes, I will read it. "'But has Sergeant Combs been on duty all night?' "'He has, sir, and so have I. "'Sergeant Combs went home an hour ago.' "'Ah,' murmured the assistant commissioner." He took the notebook from Carey, and resting his head upon his hand, began to read. Carey sat very upright in his chair, chewing slowly and watching the profile of the reader with his unwavering steel-blue eyes. 
The reading was twice punctuated by telephone messages, but the assistant commissioner apparently possessed the Napoleonic faculty of doing two things at once, for his gaze traveled uninterruptedly along the lines of the report throughout the time that he issued telephonic instructions. When he had arrived at the final page of Combs' neat schoolboy writing, he did not look up for a minute or more, continuing to rest his head in the palm of his hand. Then, so far you have not succeeded in establishing the identity of the missing man, Cosma, he said. Not so far, sir, replied Carey, enunciating the words with characteristic swift precision, each syllable distinct as the rap of a typewriter. Inspector Whiteleaf of Vine Street has questioned all constables in the Piccadilly area, and we have seen members of the staffs of many shops and offices in the neighborhood, but no one is familiar with the appearance of the missing man. Ah, now, the Egyptian servant. Inspector Carey moved his shoulders restlessly. Rashid is his name. Many of the people in the neighborhood knew him by sight, and at five o'clock this morning one of my assistants had the good luck to find out, from an Arab coffee house keeper named Abdullah, where Rashid lived. He paid a visit to the place. It's off the West India Dock Road, half an hour later. But Rashid had gone. I regret to report that all traces of him have been lost. Ah, oh, considering the circumstance side by side with the facts that no scrap of evidence has come to light in Cosmos' premises, and that the late Sir Lucian's private books and papers cannot be found, what do you deduce, Chief Inspector? My report indicates what I deduce, sir. An accomplice of Cosma's must have been in Sir Lucian's household. Cosma and Mrs. Irvin can only have left the premises by going up to the roof and across the leads to Sir Lucian's flat in Albemarle Street. I shall charge the man, Juan Marino. What is he to say? murmured the assistant commissioner, absently turning over the pages of the notebook. Ah, oh, yes. Claims to be a citizen of the United States, but has produced no papers. Engaged by Sir Lucian Pine in San Francisco professes to have no evidence to offer, admitted Mrs. Monty Irvin to Sir Lucian's flat on night of murder. Sir Lucian and Mrs. Irvin went out together shortly afterwards, and Sir Lucian ordered him, Marino, to go for the car to garage in South Audley Street and drive to Club, where Sir Lucian proposed to dine. Marino claims to have followed the instructions after waiting near Club for an hour, learned from Hall Porter that Sir Lucian had not been there that evening, drove car back to garage and returned to Albemarle Street shortly after eight o'clock. Hmm. Is this confirmed in any way? Carrie's teeth snapped together viciously. Up to a point it is, sir. The club porter remembers Marino inquiring about Sir Lucian, and the people at the garage testify that he took out the car and returned it as stated. No one has come forward who actually saw him waiting outside the club? No one. But, unfortunately, it was a dark, misty night, and cars waiting for club members stand in a narrow side turning. Marino is a surly brute, and he might have waited an hour without speaking to a soul. Unless another chauffeur happened to notice and recognize the car, nobody would be any wiser. The assistant commissioner sighed, glancing up for the first time. You don't think he waited outside the club at all, he said. I don't, sir, rapped Carey. The assistant commissioner rested his head upon his hand again. It doesn't seem to be germane to your case, Chief Inspector, in any event. There is no question of an alibi. Sir Lucian's wristwatch was broken at 7.15, evidently at the time of his death, and this man, Marino, does not claim to have left the flat until after that hour. I know it, sir, said Carey. He took out the car at half-past seven. What I want to know is where he went to. The assistant commissioner glanced rapidly into the speaker's fierce eyes. From what you have gathered respecting the appearance of Cosma, does it seem possible that Marino may be Cosma? It does not, sir. Cosma has been described to me, at first hand and at second hand. All descriptions tally in one respect. Cosma has remarkably large eyes. In Miss Haley's evidence, you will note that she refers to them as larger than any human eyes I have ever seen. Now Marino has eyes like a pig. Then I take it you are charging him as accessory. Exactly, sir. Somebody got Cosma and Mrs. Irwin away, and it can only have been Marino. Sir Lucian had no other resident servant. He was a man who lived almost entirely at restaurants and clubs. Again, somebody cleaned up his papers, and it was somebody who knew where to look for them. Quite so, quite so, murmured the assistant commissioner. Of course, we shall learn today something of his affairs from his banker. 
He must have banked somewhere, but surely, Chief Inspector, there is a safe or a private bureau in his flat? There is, sir, said Carey grimly. A safe. I had it opened at six o'clock this morning. It had been hastily cleaned out, not a doubt of it. I expect Sir Lucian carried the keys on his person. You will remember, sir, that his pockets had been emptied. Hmm, mused the assistant commissioner. This cabana cigarette company, Chief Inspector. Dummy goods, rapped Carey. A blind, just a back entrance to Cosma's office. Premises were leased on behalf of an agent. This agent, a reputable man of business, paid the rent quarterly. I've seen him. And who was his client? asked the assistant commissioner, displaying a faint trace of interest. A certain Mr. Isaacs, who can be traced, who can't be traced. His checks? Chief Inspector Carey smiled, so that his large white teeth gleamed savagely. Mr. Isaacs represented himself as a dealer in Covent Garden, who was leasing the office for a lady friend, and who desired, for domestic reasons, to cover his tracks. As ready money in large amounts changes hands in the market, Mr. Isaacs paid ready money to the agent. Beyond doubt, the real source of the ready money was Cosmas. But his address? A hotel in Covent Garden. Where he lives? Where he is known to the booking clerk, a girl who allowed him to have letters addressed there. A man of smoke, sir, acting on behalf of someone in the background. Ah, and these Bond Street premises have been occupied by Cosma for the past eight years. So I am told. I have yet to see representatives of the landlord. I may add that Sir Lucian Pine had lived in Albemarle Street for about the same time. Wearily raising his head. The point is certainly significant, said the assistant commissioner. Now we come to the drug traffic, Chief Inspector. You have found no trace of drugs on the premises? Not a grain, sir. In the office of the cigarette firm? No. By the way, was there no staff attached to the latter concern? Carey chewed viciously. No business of any kind seems to have been done there, he replied. An office boy, employed by the solicitor on the same floor as Cosma, has seen a man and also a woman go up to the third floor on several occasions, and he seems to think they went to the cabana's office. But he's not sure, and he can give no useful description of the parties anyway. Nobody in the building has ever seen the door open before this morning. The assistant commissioner sighed yet more wearily. Apart from suspicions of Miss Margaret Haley, you have no sound basis for supposing that Cosma dealt in prohibited drugs, he inquired. The evidence of Miss Haley, the letter left for her by Mrs. Irvin, and the fact that Mrs. Irvin said, in the presence of Mr. Quinton Gray, that she had a particular reason for seeing Cosma, point to it unmistakably, sir. Then I have seen Mrs. Irvin's maid. Mr. Monty Irvin is still too unwell to be interrogated. The girl was very frightened, but she admitted outright that she had been in the habit of going regularly to Cosma for certain perfumes. She wouldn't admit that she knew the flasks contained cocaine or veronal, but she did admit that her mistress had been addicted to the drug a habit for several years. It began when she was on the stage. Ah, yes, murmured the assistant commissioner. She was Rita Dresden, was she not? The maid of the mask. A very pretty and talented actress. A pity. A great pity. So, the girl, characteristically, is trying to save herself? She is, said Carrie grimly, but it cuts no ice. There is another point. After this report was made out, a message reached me from Miss Haley, as a result of which I visited Mr. Quinton Gray early this morning. Dear, dear, sighed the assistant commissioner. Your intense zeal and activity are admirable, Chief Inspector, but appalling. And what did you learn? From an inside pocket, Chief Inspector Carey took out a plain brown paper packet containing several cigarettes and laid the packet on the table. I got these, sir, he said grimly. They were left at Mr. Gray's some weeks ago by the late Sir Lucian. They are doped. The assistant commissioner, his head resting upon his hand, gazed abstractedly at the packet. If only you could trace the source of supply, he murmured. That brings me to my last point, sir. From Mrs. Irvin's maid, I learned that her mistress was acquainted with a certain Mrs. Sin. Mrs. Sin? Incredible name. She's a woman reputed to be married to a Chinaman. Inspector Whiteleaf of Vine Street knows her by sight as one of the nightclub birds. A sort of mysterious fungus, sir, flowering in the dark and fattening on gilded fools. Unless I'm greatly mistaken, Mrs. Sin is the link between the doped cigarettes and the missing Cosma. Does anyone know where she lives? 
Lots of them know, snapped Carrie, but it's making them speak. To whom do you more particularly refer, Chief Inspector? To the moneyed asses and the brainless women belonging to a certain West End set, sir, said Carrie savagely. They go in for every monstrosity from Buenos Aires, Port Said, and Pekin. They get up dances that would make a wooden horse blush. They eat hashish and they smoke opium. They inject morphine and they would have their hair dyed blue if they heard it was being done. Ah, sighed the assistant commissioner. A very delicate and complex case, chief inspector. The agony of mind which Mr. Irvin must be suffering is too horrible for one to contemplate. An admirable man, too. Honorable and generous. I can conceive no theory to account for the disappearance of Mrs. Irvin other than she was a party to the murder. No, sir, said Carey guardedly, but we have the dope clue to work on. That the Chinese receive stuff in the East End and that it's sold in the West End, every constable in the force is well aware. Lehman Street is getting busy, and every shady case in the Piccadilly area will be beaten up within the next 24 hours, too. It's purely departmental, sir, from now onwards, and merely a question of time. Therefore, I don't doubt the issue. Carey paused, cleared his throat, and produced a foolscap envelope, which he laid upon the table before the assistant commissioner. With very deep regret, sir, he said, after a long and agreeable association with the criminal investigation department, I have to tender you this. The assistant commissioner took up the envelope and stared at it vaguely. Uh, yes, Chief Inspector, he murmured. Perhaps I fail entirely to follow you. I am somewhat overworked, as you know. What does this envelope contain? My resignation, sir, replied Carey. End of chapter 23「Chapter twenty four of Dope. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Friend. Dope by Sax Romer. Chapter twenty four to introduce seven one nine. Some moments of silence followed. Sounds of traffic from the embankment penetrated dimly to the room of the assistant commissioner. Ringing of tram bells and that vague sustained noise which is created by the whirring of countless wheels along hard pavements. Finally, you have selected a curious moment to retire, Chief Inspector, said the Assistant Commissioner. Your prospects were never better. No doubt you have considered the question of your pension. I know what I'm giving up, sir, replied Carey. The Assistant Commissioner slowly revolved in his chair and gazed sadly at the speaker. Chief Inspector Carey met his glance with that fearless, unflinching stare which lent him so formidable an appearance. You might care to favor me with some explanation which I can lay before the Chief Commissioner. Carey snapped his white teeth together viciously. May I take it, sir, that you accept my resignation? Certainly not. I will place it before the responsible authority. I can do no more. Without disrespect, sir, I want to speak to you as man to man. As a private citizen, I can do it. As your subordinate, I can't. The assistant commissioner sighed, stroking his neatly brushed hair with one large hand. Equally without disrespect, Chief Inspector, he murmured, it is news for me to learn that you have ever refrained from speaking your mind either in my presence or in the presence of any man. Carey smiled, unable to wholly conceal a sense of gratified vanity. Well, sir, he said, you have my resignation before you, and I am prepared to abide by the consequences. What I want to say is this. I am a man that has worked hard all his life to earn the respect and the trust of his employers. I am supposed to be chief inspector of this department, and as chief inspector, I'll kowtow to nothing on two legs once I've been put in charge of a case. I work right in the sunshine. There's no grafting about me. I draw my salary every week, and any man that says I earn sixpence in the dark is at liberty to walk in here and deposit his funeral expenses. If I'm supposed to be under a cloud, there's my reply but I demand a public inquiry. At ever-increasing speed, succinctly, viciously, he rapped out the words. His red face grew more red, and his steel-blue eyes more fierce. The assistant commissioner exhibited bewilderment as the high tones ceased. Really, Chief Inspector, he said, you pain and surprise me. I do not profess to be ignorant of the cause of your annoyance. But perhaps if I acquaint you with the facts of my own position in the matter, you will be open to reconsider your decision. Carey cleared his throat loudly. 
I won't work in the dark, sir, he declared truculently. I'd rather be a pavement artist and my own master than chief inspector with an unknown spy following me about. Quite so, quite so. The assistant commissioner was wonderfully patient. Very well, chief inspector. It cannot enhance my personal dignity to admit the fact, but I'm nearly as much in the dark as yourself. What's that, sir? Carey sat bolt upright, staring at the speaker. At a late hour last night, the Secretary of State communicated in person with the Chief Commissioner at the latter's town residence. He instructed him to offer every facility to a newly appointed agent of the Home Office who was empowered to conduct an official inquiry into the drug traffic. As a result, Vine Street was advised that the Home Office investigator would proceed at once to Cosmos' premises, and from thence, wherever available clues might lead him. For some reason which has not yet been explained to me, this investigator chooses to preserve a strict anonymity. Traces of irritation became perceptible in the weary voice. Carrie staring in silence, the assistant commissioner continued. I have been advised that this nameless agent is in a position to establish his bona fides at any time, as he bears a number of these cards. You see, Chief Inspector, I am frank with you. From a table drawer, the assistant commissioner took a visiting card, which he handed to Carey. The latter stared at it as one stares at a rare specimen. It was the card of Lord Rexborough, His Majesty's principal secretary of state for the Home Department, and in the cramped calligraphy of his lordship, it bore a brief note initialed thus, Lord Rexborough, Great Cumberland Place, V1, to introduce 719, W. Some moments of silence followed. Then, 719, said Carrie in a high, strained voice. Why 719? And why all this hocus-pocus? Am I to understand, sir, that not only myself, but all the criminal investigation department is under a cloud? The assistant commissioner stroked his hair. You are to understand, Chief Inspector, that for the first time throughout my period of office, I find myself out of touch with the chief commissioner. It is not departmental for me to say so, but I believe the Chief Commissioner finds himself similarly out of touch with the Secretary of State. Apparently, very powerful influences are at work, and the line of conduct taken by the Home Office suggests, to my mind, that collusion between the receivers and distributors of drugs and the police is suspected by someone. That being so, possibly out of a sense of fairness to all officially concerned, the committee, which I understand has been appointed to inquire into the traffic, has decided to treat us all alike, from myself down to the rawest constable. It's highly irritating and preposterous, of course, but I cannot disguise from you or from myself that we are on trial, Chief Inspector. Carey stood up and slowly moved his square shoulders in the manner of an athlete about to attempt a feat of weightlifting. From the assistant commissioner's table, he took the envelope which contained his resignation and tore it into several portions. These he deposited in a waste paper basket. That's that, he said. I am very deeply indebted to you, sir. I know now what to tell the press. The assistant commissioner glanced up. Not a word about 719, he said. Of course you understand this. If we don't exist as far as 719 is concerned, sir, said Carey in his most snappy tones, 719 means nothing to me. Quite so, quite so, of course. I may be wrong in the motives which I ascribe to this Whitehall agent, but misunderstanding is certain to arise out of a system of such deliberate mystification, which can only be compared to that employed by the Russian police under the Tsars. Half an hour later, Chief Inspector Carey came out of New Scotland Yard and, walking down onto the embankment, boarded a Norwood tram car. The weather remained damp and gloomy, but upon the red face of Chief Inspector Carey, as he mounted to the upper deck of the car, rested an expression which might have been described as one of cheery truculence, where other passengers, coat collars upturned, gazed gloomily from the windows at the yellow murk overhanging the river. Carey looked briskly about him, smiling pleasurably. He was homeward bound, and when he presently alighted and went swinging along Spencer Road towards his house, he was still smiling. He regarded the case as having developed into a competition between himself and the man appointed by Whitehall, and it was just such a position, disconcerting to one of less aggressive temperament, which stimulated Chief Inspector Carey and put him in high good humor. Mrs. Carey, arrayed in a serviceable raincoat and wearing a plain felt hat, was standing by the dining room door as Carey entered. She had a basket on her arm. I was waiting for you, Dan, she said simply. He kissed her affectionately, 
put his arm about her waist, and the two entered the cozy little room. By no ordinary human means was it possible that Mary Carey should have known that her husband would come home at that time, but he was so used to her prescience in this respect that he offered no comment. She kenned his approach always, and at times when his life had been in danger, and these were not of infrequent occurrence, Mary Carey, if sleeping, had awakened, trembling, though the scene of peril were a hundred miles away, and if awake had blanched and known a deadly sudden fear. "'You'll be going to bed?' she asked. "'For three hours, Mary. Don't fail to rouse me if I oversleep. "'Is it clear to you yet?' "'Nearly clear. The dark thing you saw behind it all, Mary, was dope.' Cosmos is a secret drug syndicate. They've appointed a home office agent, and he's working independently of us. But his teeth came together with a snap. Oh, Dan, said his wife, it's a race. Drugs. A home office agent. Dan, they think the force is in it. They do, rapped Carey. I'm for Lehman Street in three hours. If there's double dealing behind it, then the mugs are in the east end. And it's folly, not knavery, I'm looking for. It's a race, Mary and the credit of the service is at stake. No, my dear, I'll have a snack when I wake. You're going shopping? I am done. I have started, but I wanted to see you when you came home. If you only three hours, go straight up now. I'll have something hot and ready when you waken. Ten minutes later, Carey was in bed, his short clay pipe between his teeth and the meditations of Marcus Aurelius in his hand. Such was his customary sleeping drought, and it had never been known to fail. Half a pipe of Irish twist and three pages of the sad imperial author invariably plunged Chief Inspector Carey into healthy slumber. End of chapter 24 Chapter 25 of Dope This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Friend. Dope by Sax Romer. Chapter 25. Nightlife of Soho. It was close upon midnight when Detective Sergeant Combs appeared in a certain narrow West End thoroughfare, which was lined with taxicabs and private cars. He wore a dark overcoat and a tweed cap, and although his chin was buried in the genial folds of a woolen comforter, and his cap was pulled down over his eyes, his sly smile could easily be detected even in the dim light afforded by the car lamps. He seemed to have business of a mysterious nature among the cabmen, for with each of them in turn he conducted a brief conversation, passing unobtrusively from cab to cab, and making certain entries in a notebook. Finally, he disappeared. No one actually saw him go, and no one had actually seen him arrive. At one moment, however, he was there. In the next, he was gone. Five minutes later, Chief Inspector Carey entered the street. His dark overcoat and white silk muffler concealed a spruce dress suit, a fact betrayed by black braided trousers, unusually tight-fitting, and boots which almost glittered. He carried the silver-headed Malacca cane, and had retained his narrow-brimmed bowler at its customary jaunty angle. Passing the lines of waiting vehicles, he walked into the entrance of a popular nightclub which faced the narrow street. On a lounge immediately inside the doorway, a heated young man was sitting, fanning his dancing partner and gazing into her weakly pretty face in vacuous adoration. Carrie paused for a moment, staring at the pair. The man returned his stare, looking him up and down in a manner meant to be contemptuous. Carrie's fierce, intolerant gaze became transferred to the face and then the figure of the woman. He tilted his hat further forward and turned aside. The woman's glance followed him, to the marked disgust of her companion. Oh, she whispered, what a delightfully savage man. He looks positively uncivilized. I have no doubt he drags women about by their hair. I do hope he's a member. Molly Gretna spoke loudly enough for Carrie to hear her, but unmoved by her admiration, he stepped up to the reception office. He was in high good humor. He had spent the afternoon agreeably, interviewing certain officials charged with policing the East End of London, and had succeeded, to quote his own language, in getting a gale up. Despite the coldness of the weather, he had left two inspectors and a speechlessly indignant superintendent bathed in perspiration. "'Are you a member, sir?' inquired the girl behind the desk. Carrie smiled genially. A newsboy thrust open the swing door, yelling, Bond Street murder! A fresh development! Late special! 
Oh, cried Molly Gretna to her companion. Get me a paper. Be quick. I am so excited. Carrie took up a pen and in large, bold handwriting inscribed the following across two pages of the visitor's book. Chief Inspector Carey, Criminal Investigation Department. He laid a card on the open book and, thrusting his cane under his arm, walked to the head of the stairs. Cloakroom on the right, sir, said the attendant. Carey paused, glancing over his shoulder and chewing audibly. Then he settled his hat more firmly upon his red head and descended the stairs. The attendant went to inspect the visitor's book, but Molly Gretna was at the desk before him, and, Oh, Bill, she cried to her annoyed cavalier, it's Inspector Carey, who is in charge of poor Lucy's murder. Oh, Bill, this is lovely. Something is going to happen. Do come down. Followed by the obedient but reluctant Bill, Molly ran downstairs and almost into the arms of a tall, dark girl, who, carrying a purple opera cloak, was coming up. You're not going yet, Dickie, asked Molly throwing her arm around the other's waist. Shh, whispered Dickie. Inspector Carey is here. You don't want to be called as a witness at nasty inquests and things, do you? Good heavens, my dear, no. But why should I be? Why should any of us? But don't you see they are looking for people who used to go to Cosmas? It's in the paper tonight. We shall all be served with subpoenas. I'm off. Escaping from Molly's embrace, the tall girl ran up the stairs, kissing her hand to Bill as she passed. Molly hesitated, looking all about the crowded room for Chief Inspector Carey. Presently she saw him, standing nearly opposite the stairway, his intolerant blue eyes turning right and left, so that the fierce glance seemed to miss nothing and no one in the room. Hands thrust in his overcoat pockets and his cane held under his arm, he inspected the place and its occupants as a very aggressive country cousin might inspect the monkey house at the zoo. To Molly's intense disappointment, he persistently avoided looking in her direction. Although a popular dance was on the point of commencing, several visitors had suddenly determined to leave. Carey pretended to be ignorant of the sensation which his appearance had created, passing slowly along the room and submitting group after group to deliberate scrutiny. But as news flies through an eastern bazaar the name of the celebrated detective, whose association with London's latest crime was mentioned by every evening paper in the kingdom, sped now on magic wings so that there was a muted chivalry out of which, in every key from bass to soprano, arose ever and anon the words, Chief Inspector Carey. It's perfectly ridiculous, but characteristically English, drawled one young man, standing beside Molly Gretna, to send out a bally red-headed policeman in preposterous glad rags to look for a clever criminal. Carey is well known to all the crooks, and nobody could mistake him. Damn silly. Damn silly. As damn silly Carey's open scrutiny of the members and visitors must have appeared to others, but it was a deliberate policy very popular with the chief inspector, and termed by him beating. Possessed of an undistinguishable personality, Carey had found a way of employing his natural physical peculiarities to his professional advantage. Where other investigators worked in the dark, secretly, Red Carey sought the limelight at the right time. That every hour lost in getting on the track of the mysterious Cosma was a point gained by the equally mysterious man from Whitehall, he felt assured. And although the elaborate but hidden mechanism of New Scotland Yard was at work seeking out the patrons of the Bond Street drug shop, Carey was indisposed to await the result. He had been in the nightclub only about ten minutes, but during those ten minutes fully a dozen people had more or less hurriedly departed. Because of the arrangements already made by Sergeant Combs, the addresses of many of these departing visitors would be in Carey's possession ere the night was much older. And why should they have fled incontinent, if not for the reason that they feared to become involved in the Cosma affair? All the cabmen had been warned, and those fugitives who had private cars would be followed. It was a curious scene which Carey surveyed, a scene to have interested philosopher and politician alike, for here were representatives of every stratum of society, although some of those standing for the lower strata were suitably disguised. The peerage was well represented. So was Judah. There were women entitled to wear coronets, dancing with men entitled to wear the broad arrow, and men whose forefathers had signed Magna Carta, dancing with chorus girls from the reviews of musical comedies. Waiting until the dance was fully in progress, Inspector Carey walked slowly around the room in the direction of the stair. Parties seated at tables were treated each to an intolerant stare. Alcoves were inspected, 
and more than one waiter meeting the gaze of the steely eyes felt a prickling of conscious and recalled past picadillos. Bill had claimed Molly Gretna for the dance, but... No, Bill, she had replied, watching Carey as if enthralled. I don't want to dance. I am watching Chief Inspector Carey. That's evident, complained the young man. Perhaps you'd like to spend the rest of the night in Bow Street. Oh, whispered Molly, I should love it. I have never been arrested, but if I ever am, I hope it will be by Chief Inspector Carey. I am positive he would haul me away in handcuffs. When Carey came to the foot of the stairs, Molly quite deliberately got in his way, murmured an apology, and gave him a sidelong gaze through lowered lashes, which was more eloquent than any thesis. He smiled with fierce geniality, looked her up and down, and proceeded to mount the stairs with never a backward glance. His genius for criminal investigation possessed definite limitations. He could not perhaps have been expected in tactics so completely opposed to those which he had anticipated to recognize the presence of a valuable witness. Student of human nature, though undoubtedly he was, he had not solved the mystery of that outstanding exception which seems to be involved in every rule. Thus, a fellow with a low forehead and a weakly receding chin, Carey classified as a dullard, a whittling, unaware that if the brow were but low enough and the chin virtually absent altogether, he might stand in the presence of a second Daniel. Physiognomy is a subtle science, and the exceptions to its rules are often of a sensational character. In the same way Carey looked for evasion, and, where possible, flight on the part of one possessing a guilty conscience, Molly Gretna was a phenomenal exception to a rule otherwise sound. And even one familiar with criminal psychology might be forgiven for failing to detect guilt in a woman anxious to make the acquaintance of a prominent member of the criminal investigation department. Pausing for a moment in the entrance of the club and chewing reflectively, Carey swung open the door and walked out into the street. He had one more cover to beat, and he set off briskly, plunging into the mazes of Soho, crossing Wardour Street into Old Compton Street, and proceeding thence in the direction of Shaftesbury Avenue. Turning to the right on entering the narrow thoroughfare for which he was bound, he stopped and whistled softly. He stood in the entrance to a court, and from further up the court came an answering whistle. Carey came out of the court again, and proceeded some twenty paces along the street to a restaurant, the window showed no light, but the door remained open, and Carey entered without hesitation, crossed a darkened room, and found himself in a passage where a man was seated in a little apartment like that of a stage doorkeeper. He stood up on hearing Carey's tread, peering out at the newcomer. The restaurant is closed, sir. Tell me a better one, rapped Carey. I want to go upstairs. Your card, sir. Carey revealed his teeth in a savage smile and tossed his card onto the desk before the concierge. He passed on, mounting the stairs at the end of the passage. Dimly, a bell rang, and on the first landing, Carey met a heavily built foreign gentleman, who bowed. My dear chief inspector, he said gutturally, what is this, please? I trust nothing is wrong, eh? Huh? Nothing, replied Carey. I just want to look around. A few friends, explained the suave alien, rubbing his hands together and still bowing, remain playing dominoes with me. Very good, rapped Carey. Well, if you think we have given them time to hide the wheel, we'll go in. Oh, don't explain. I'm not worrying about sticklebacks tonight. I'm out for salmon. He opened a door on the left of the landing and entered a large room which offered evidence of having been hastily evacuated by a considerable company. A red and white figured cloth of a type much used in continental cafes had been spread upon a long table, and three foreigners, two men and an elderly woman, were bending over a row of dominoes set upon one corner of the table. Apparently the men were playing and the woman was watching. But there was a dense cloud of cigar smoke in the room, and mingled with its pungency were sweeter scents. A number of empty champagne bottles stood upon a sideboard, and an elegant silk theater bag lay on a chair. Hmm, said Carey, glaring fiercely from the bottles to the players, who covertly were watching him. How you two smarts can tell a domino from a door knocker after cracking a dozen magnums gets me guessing. He took up the scented bag and gravely handed it to the old woman. You have mislaid your bag, madam, he said, but fortunately I noticed it as I came in. He turned the glance of his fierce eyes upon the man who had met him on the landing and who had followed him into the room. Third floor, Van Hindenburg, he rapped. Don't argue. Lead the way. For one dangerous moment the man's brow lowered and his heavy face grew blackly menacing. 
He exchanged a swift look with his friends seated at the disguised roulette table. Carrie's jaw muscles protruded enormously. Give me another answer like that, he said in a tone of cold ferocity, and I'll kick you from here to paradise. No offense, no offense, muttered the man, quailing before the savagery of the formidable chief inspector. You come this way, please. Some ladies call upon me this evening, and I do not want to frighten them. No, said Carrie. You wouldn't, naturally. He stood aside as a door at the further end of the room was opened. After you, my friend, I said, lead the way. They mounted to the third floor of the restaurant. The room which they had just quitted was used as an auxiliary dining and supper room before midnight, as Carrie knew. After midnight, the center table was unmasked, and from thence onward to dawn, sometimes, was surrounded by roulette players. The third floor he had never visited, but he had a shrewd idea that it was not entirely reserved for the private use of the proprietor. A babble of voices died away as the two men walked into a room rather smaller than that below and furnished with little tables cafe fashion. At one end was a grand piano and a platform before which a velvet curtain was draped. Some twenty people, men and women, were in the place, standing, looking towards the entrance. Most of the men and all the women but one were in evening dress. But despite this common armor of respectability, they did not all belong to respectable society. Two of the women Carrie recognized as bearers of titles, and one was familiar to him as a screen beauty. The others were unclassifiable, but all were fashionably dressed with the exception of a masculine-looking lady who had apparently come straight off a golf course, and who later was proved to be a well-known advocate of women's rights. The men all belonged to the familiar types. Some of them were Jews. Carrie, his feet widely apart and his hands thrust in his overcoat pockets, stood staring at face after face and chewing slowly. The proprietor glanced apologetically at his patrons and shrugged. Silence fell upon the company. Then, I am a police officer, said Carey sharply. You will file out past me, and I want a card from each of you. Those who have no cards will write name and address here. He drew a long envelope and a pencil from a pocket of his dinner jacket, laying the envelope and pencil on one of the little tables. Quick march, he snapped. You, sir, shooting out his forefinger in the direction of a tall, fair young man. Step out. Glancing helplessly about him, the young man obeyed and approaching Carrie, I say, officer, he whispered nervously, can't you manage to keep my name out of it? I mean to say, my people will kick up the deuce. Anything up to a tenor? The whisper faded away. Carrie's expression had grown positively furious. Put your card on the table, he said tersely, and get out while my hands stay in my pockets. Hurriedly, the noble youth, he was the elder son of an earl, complied and departed. Then, one by one, the rest of the company filed past the chief inspector. He challenged no one until a Jew smilingly laid a card on the table bearing the legend, Mr. John Jones, Lincoln's Inn Fields. Hi, rapped Carey, grasping the man's arm. One moment, Mr. Jones. The card I want is in the other case. Do you take me for a mug? That Jones trick was tried on Noah by the blue-faced baboon. His perception of character was wonderful. At some of the cards he did not even glance, and upon the women he wasted no time at all. He took it for granted that they would all give false names, but since each of them would be followed, it did not matter. When at last the room was empty, he turned to the scowling proprietor and, That's that, he said. I've had no instructions about your establishment, my friend, and as I've seen nothing improper going on, I'm making no charge, at the moment. I don't want to know what sort of show takes place on your platform, and I don't want to know anything about you that I don't know already. You're a Swiss subject and a dark horse. He gathered up the cards from the table, glancing at them carelessly. He did not expect to gain much from his possession of these names and addresses. It was among the women that he counted upon finding patrons of Cosma and Company. But as he was about to drop the cards into his overcoat pocket, one of them, which bore a written note, attracted his attention. At this card, he stared like a man amazed. His face grew more and more red, and... Hell, he said. Hell, which of them was it? The card contained the following. Lord Rexborough, Great Cumberland Place, V1. To introduce 719, W. End of chapter 25. Chapter 26 of Dope. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Friend. Dope by Sax Romer. Chapter 26. The Moods of Molly. Early the following morning, Margaret Haley called upon Molly Gretna. Molly's personality did not attract Margaret. The two had nothing in common, but Margaret was well aware of the nature of the tie which had bound Rita Irvin to this empty and decadent representative of the English aristocracy. Molly Gretna was entitled to append the words, the Honorable, to her name, but not only did she refrain from doing so, but she even preferred to be known as Gretna, the style of one of the family estates. This pseudonym she had adopted shortly after her divorce, when she had attempted to take up a stage career. But although the experience had proved disastrous, she had retained the nom de guerre, and during the past four years had several times appeared at war charity garden parties as a classical dancer, to the great delight of the guests, and greater disgust of her family. Her maternal uncle, head of her house, said to be the most blasé member of the British peerage and known as the noble tortoise, was generally considered to have pronounced the final verdict upon his golden-haired niece when he declared, she is almost amusing. Molly received her visitor with extravagant expressions of welcome. My dear Miss Haley, she cried, how perfectly sweet of you to come see me. Of course, I can guess what you have called about. Look, I have every paper published this morning in London, every one. Oh, poor darling little Rita, what can have become of her? Tears glistened upon her carefully made up lashes, and so deep did her grief seem to be that one would never have suspected that she had spent the greater part of the night playing bridge at a mixed club in Dover Street, and from thence had proceeded to a military breakfast dance. It is indeed a ghastly tragedy, said Margaret. It seems incredible that she cannot be traced. Absolutely incredible, declared Molly, opening a large box of cigarettes. Will you have one, dear? No, thanks. By the way, they are not from Buenos Aires, I suppose. Molly, cigarette in hand, stared round-eyed and, Oh, my dear Miss Haley, she cried. What an idea. Such a funny thing to suggest. Margaret smiled coolly. Poor Sir Lucian used to smoke cigarettes of that kind, she explained. I thought perhaps you smoked them too. Molly shook her head and lighted the cigarette. He gave me one once, and it made me feel quite sick, she declared. Margaret glanced at the speaker and knew immediately that Molly had determined to deny all knowledge of the drug coterie, because there is no problem of psychology harder than that offered by a perverted mind. Margaret was misled in ascribing the secrecy to a desire to avoid becoming involved in a scandal. Therefore, do you quite realize, Miss Gretna, she said quietly, that every hour wasted now in tracing Rita may mean, must mean, an hour of agony for her? oh don't please don't cried molly clasping her hands i cannot bear to think of it god knows in whose hands she is then there is poor mr urban he is utterly prostrated one shudders to contemplate his torture as the hours and the days go by and no news comes of rita oh my dear you are making me cry exclaimed molly if only i could do something to help margaret studied her closely and now, for the first time, she detected sincere emotion in Molly's voice, and unforced tears in her eyes. Hope was reborn. Perhaps you can, she continued, speaking gently. You knew all Rita's friends and all Sir Lucian's. You must have met the woman called Mrs. Sin. Mrs. Sin, whispered Molly, staring in a frightened way so that the pupils of her eyes slowly enlarged. What about Mrs. Sin? Well, you see... They seem to think that through Mrs. Sin they will be able to trace Cosma, and wherever Cosma is, one would expect to find poor Rita. Molly lowered her head for a moment, then glanced quickly at the speaker and quickly away again. Please let me explain just what I mean, continued Margaret. It seems to be impossible to find anybody in London who will admit having known Mrs. Sin or Cosma. They are all afraid of being involved in the case, of course. Now, if you can help, don't hesitate for that reason. A special commission has been appointed by Lord Rexborough to deal with the case, and their agent is working quite independently of the police. Anything which you care to tell him will be treated as strictly confidential. But think what it would mean to Rita. Molly clasped her hands about her right knee and rocked to and fro in her chair. No one knows who Cosma is, she said. 
but a number of people seem to know Mrs. Sin. I am sure you must have met her. If I say that I know her, shall I be called as a witness? Certainly not. I can assure you of that. Molly continued to rock to and fro. But if I were to tell the police, I should have to go to court, I suppose. I suppose so, replied Margaret. I am afraid I am dreadfully ignorant of such matters. It might depend upon whether you spoke to a high official or to a subordinate one, an ordinary policeman, for instance. But the Home Office agent has nothing whatever to do with Scotland Yard. Molly stood up in order to reach an ashtray, and, "'I really don't think I have anything to say, Miss Haley,' she declared. "'I have certainly met Mrs. Sin, but I know nothing whatever about her, except that I believe she is a Jewess.' Margaret sighed, looking up wistfully into Molly's face. "'Are you quite sure?' she pleaded. "'Oh, Miss Gretna, if you know anything, anything, don't hide it now. It may mean so much.' "'Oh, I quite understand that,' cried Molly. "'My heart simply aches, and aches when I think of poor, sweet little Rita. "'But really, I don't think I can be of the least bit of use.' "'Their glances met, and Margaret read hostility in the shallow eyes. "'Molly, who had been wavering, now for some reason had become confirmed "'in her original determination to remain silent. "'Margaret stood up. "'It is no good, then,' she said. "'We must hope that Rita will be traced by the police.' Goodbye, Miss Gretna. I am so sorry you cannot help. And so am I, declared Molly. It is perfectly sweet of you to take such an interest, and I feel a positive worm. But what can I do? As Margaret was stepping into her little runabout car, which awaited her at the door, a theory presented itself to account for Molly's sudden hostility. It had developed, apparently, as a result of Margaret's reference to the Home Office inquiry. Of course! Molly would naturally be antagonistic to a commission appointed to suppress the drug traffic. Convinced that this was the correct explanation, Margaret drove away, reflecting bitterly that she had been guilty of a strategical error which it was now too late to rectify. In common with others, Carrie among them, who had come in contact with that perverted intelligence, she misjudged Molly's motives. In the first place, the latter had no wish to avoid publicity, and in the second place, although she sometimes wondered vaguely what she should do when her stock of drugs became exhausted, Molly was prompted by no particular animosity toward the Home Office inquiry. She had merely perceived a suitable opportunity to make the acquaintance of the fierce Red and Chief Inspector, and at the same time to secure notoriety for herself. Ere Margaret's car had progressed a hundred yards from the door, Molly was at the telephone. City 400, please, she said. An interval elapsed. Then, is that the commissioner's office, New Scotland Yard? She asked. A voice replied that it was. Could you put me through to Chief Inspector Carey? What name? inquired the voice. Molly hesitated for three seconds and then gave her family name. Very well, madam, said the voice respectfully. Please hold on and I will inquire if the chief inspector is in. Molly's heart was beating rapidly with pleasurable excitement, and she was as confused as a maiden at her first rendezvous. Then, Hello, said the voice. Yes. I am sorry, madam, but Chief Inspector Carey is off duty. Oh, dear, sighed Molly. What a pity. Can you tell me where I could find him? I'm afraid not, madam. It is against the rules to give private addresses of members of any department. Oh, very well, she sighed again. Thank you. She replaced the receiver and stood biting her finger thoughtfully. She was making a mental inventory of her many admirers and wondering which of them could help her. Suddenly, she came to a decision on the point, taking up the receiver. Victoria 8440, please, she said. Still biting one finger, she waited until... For an office, announced a voice. Please put me through to Mr. Archie Bowden Shaw, she said. Ere long, that official secretary was inquiring her name, and a moment later... Is that you, Archie? said Molly. Yes, Molly speaking. No, please listen, Archie. You can get to know everything at the foreign office, and I want you to find out for me the private address of Chief Inspector Carey, who is in charge of the Bond Street murder case. Oh, don't be silly. I've asked Scotland Yard, but they won't tell me. You can find out. It doesn't matter why I want to know. Just ring me and tell me. I must know in half an hour. Yes, I shall be seeing you tonight. Goodbye. Less than a half hour later, the obedient Archie rang up, and Molly, all excitement, 
wrote the following address in a dainty scented notebook which she carried in her handbag. Chief Inspector Carey, 67 Spencer Road, Brixton. End of chapter 26. Chapter 27 of Dope. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Friend. Dope by Sax Romer. Chapter 27. Crown Evidence. The appearance of the violet enameled motor brougham, upholstered in cream and driven by a chauffeur in a violet and cream livery, created some slight sensation in Spencer Road southeast. Molly Gretna's conspicuous car was familiar enough to residents in the west end of London, but to lower middle class suburbia it came as something of a shock. More than one window curtain moved suspiciously, suggesting a hidden but watchful presence, when the glittering vehicle stopped before the gate of number 67. And a lady at number 68 seized an evidently rare opportunity to come out and polish her letterbox. She was rewarded by an unobstructed view of the smartest woman in London, thus spake society paragraphers, and of the most expensive set of furs in Europe, also of a perfectly gowned slim figure. Of Molly's disdainful face, with its slightly uptilted nose, she had no more than a glimpse. A neat maid, evidently Scotch, admitted the dazzling visitor to number 67, and Spencer Road waited and wondered. It was something to do with the Bond Street murder. Small girls appeared from doorways suddenly opened and darted off to advise less watchful neighbors. Carrie, who had been at work until close upon dawn in the mysterious underworld of Soho, was sleeping. But Mrs. Carey received Molly in a formal little drawing room, which, unlike the cozy, homely dining room, possessed that frigid atmosphere which belongs to uninhabited apartments. In a rather handsome cabinet were a number of trophies associated with the detective's successful cases. The cabinet itself was a present from a Regent Street firm for who Carey had recovered valuable property. Mary Carey, dressed in a plain blouse and skirt, exhibited no trace of nervousness in the presence of her aristocratic and fashionable caller. Indeed, Molly afterwards declared that she was quite a ladylike person, but rather tin tabernacly, my dear. Did ye wish to see Chief Inspector Carey particularly? asked Mary, watching her visitor with calm, observant eyes. Oh, most particularly, cried Molly, in a flutter of excitement. "'Of course I don't know what you must think of me for calling it such a preposterous hour, but there are some things that simply can't wait.' "'I,' murmured Mrs. Carey, "'twill be on Bond Affair.' "'Oh, yes, it is, Mrs. Carey. Doesn't the very name of Bond Street turn your blood cold? I am simply shivering with fear. As the wife of a chief inspector, I may be a bit more used to tragedies than yourself, madam, but it surely is a sour grim business.' Me husband is resting now. He was hard at work the night. Now I doubt you'll be wishing to see him privately. Oh, if you please. I am so sorry to disturb him. I can imagine that he must be literally exhausted after spending a whole night among dreadful people. Mary Carey stood up. If you'll excuse me for a moment, I'll awaken him, she said. Our household is small. Oh, of course. I quite understand, Mrs. Carey. So sorry, but so good of you. Might I offer ye a glass of sherry and a biscuit? I simply couldn't dream of troubling you. Please don't suggest such a thing. I feel covered with guilt already. Many thanks, nevertheless. Mary Carey withdrew, leaving Molly alone. As soon as the door closed, Molly stood up and began to inspect the trophies in the cabinet. She was far too restless and excited to remain sitting down. She looked at the presentation clock on the mantelpiece and puzzled over the signatures engraved upon a large silver dish which commemorated the joy displayed by the Criminal Investigation Department upon the occasion of Carey's promotion to the post of Chief Inspector. The door opened and Carey came in. He had arisen and completed his toilet in several seconds less than five minutes, but his spotlessly neat attire would have survived inspection by the most lynx-eyed martinet in the Brigade of Guards. As he smiled at his visitor with fierce geniality, Molly blushed like a young girl. Chief Inspector Carey was a much bigger man than she had believed him to be. The impression left upon her memory by his brief appearance at the nightclub had been that of a small, dapper figure. Now, as he stood in the little drawing room, she saw that he was not much, if anything, below the average height of Englishmen, and that he possessed wonderfully broad shoulders. In fact, 
Carrie was deceptive. His compact neatness and the smallness of his feet and hands, together with those swift, lithe movements which commonly belong to men of light physique, curiously combined to deceive the beholder, but masked eleven stones of bone and muscle. Note, one stone equals fourteen pounds. Very good of you to offer information, miss, he said. I'm willing to admit that I can do with it. He opened a bureau and took out a writing block and a fountain pen. Then he turned and stared hard at Molly. She quickly lowered her eyes. Excuse me, said Carrie, but didn't I see you somewhere last night? Yes, she said. I was sitting just inside the door at... Right, I remember, interrupted Carrie. He continued to stare. Before you say any more, miss, I have to remind you that I am a police officer and that you may be called upon to swear to the truth of any information you may give me. Oh, of course, I know. You know. Very well, then. We can get on. Who gave you my address? At the question, so abruptly asked, Molly felt herself blushing again. It was delightful to know that she could still blush. Oh, I... that is, I asked Scotland Yard. She bestowed a swift, half-veiled glance at her interrogator, but he offered her no help, and... They wouldn't tell me, she continued, so I had to find out. You see, I heard you were trying to get information which I thought perhaps I could give. So you went to the trouble to find my private address rather than to the nearest police station, said Carrie. Might I ask you from whom you heard that I wanted this information? Well, it's in the papers, isn't it? It is, certainly. But it occurred to me that someone connected might have told you as well. Actually, someone did. Miss Margaret Haley. Good, rapped Carrie. Now we're coming to it. She told you to come to me? Oh, no, cried Molly. She didn't. She told me to tell her so that she could tell the home office. Huh? said Carrie. What? He bent forward, staring fiercely. Please tell me exactly what Miss Haley wanted to know. The intensity of his gaze Molly found very perturbing. But she wanted me to tell her where Mrs. Sin lived, she replied. Carrie experienced a quickening of the pulse. In the failure of the CID to trace the abode of the notorious Mrs. Sin, he had suspected double dealing. He counted it unbelievable that a figure so conspicuous in certain circles could evade official quest even for 48 hours. K Division's explanation, too that there were no less than eighty Chinamen resident in and about Limehouse, whose names either began or ended with sin, he looked upon as a paltry evasion. That very morning he had awakened from a species of nightmare wherein 719 had effected the arrest of Cosma and Mrs. Sin, and had rescued Mrs. Irvin from the clutches of the former. Now here was hope. 719 would seem to be as hopelessly in the dark as everybody else. You refused, he rapped. Of course I did, Inspector, said Molly, with a timid, tender glance. I thought you were the proper person to tell. Then you know, asked Carrie, unable to conceal his eagerness. Yes, sighed Molly. Unfortunately, I know. Oh, Inspector, how can I explain it to you? Don't trouble, miss. Just give me the address and I'll ask no questions. His keenness was thrilling, infectious. As a result of the night's beating, he had a list of some twenty names whose owners might have been patrons of Cosma, and some of whom might know Mrs. Sin. But he had learned from bitter experience how difficult it was to induce such people to give useful evidence. There was practically no means of forcing them to speak if they chose, from selfish motives, to be silent. They could be forced to appear in court, but anything elicited in public was worse than useless. Furthermore, Carey could not afford to wait. Molly replied excitedly, Oh, Inspector, I know you will think me simply an appalling person when I tell you, but I have been to Mrs. Sin's house, the house of a hundred raptures, she calls it. Yes, yes, but the address. However, can I tell you the address, Inspector? I could drive you there, but I haven't the very haziest idea of the name of the horrible street. One drives along dreadful roads where there are stalls and Jews for quite an interminable time, and then over a sort of canal, and then round to the right, all among ships and horrid Chinamen. Then there is a doorway in a little court, and Mrs. Sin's husband sits inside a smelly room with a positively ferocious raven who shrieks about legs and policemen. Oh, can I ever forget it! One moment, miss, one moment, said Carey, keeping an iron control upon himself. What is the name of Mrs. Sin's husband? Oh, let me think. I can always remember it by recalling the croak of the raven. She raised one hand to her brow. 
posing reflectively, and began to murmur, Sin Sin Ah, uh, Sin Sin Jar, Sin Sin... Oh, I have it! Sin Sin Wa! Good, rapped Carrie, and made a note on the block. Sin Sin Wa. And he has a pet raven, you say, who talks? Who positively talks like some horrid old woman, cried Molly. He has only one eye. The raven? The raven, yes, and also the Chinaman. What? Oh, it's a nightmare to behold them together, declared Molly, clasping her hands and bending forward. She was gaining courage, and now looked almost boldly into the fierce eyes of the chief inspector. Describe the house, he said succinctly. Take your time and use your own words. Thereupon, Molly launched into a description of Sinsinwa's opium house. Carrie, his eyes fixed upon her, listened silently. Then, these little rooms are really next door, he asked. I suppose so, Inspector. We always went through the back of a cupboard. Can you give me names of others who use this place? Well, Molly hesitated. Poor Rita, of course, and Sir Lucian. Then Cyrus Kilfane used to go. Kilfane? The American actor? Yes. Hmm. He's back in America. Sir Lucian is dead, and Mrs. Irvin is missing. Nobody else? Molly shook her head. Who first took you there? Cyrus Kilfane. Not Sir Lucian. Oh, no. But both of them had been before. What was Cosma's connection with Mrs. Sin and her husband? I have no idea, Inspector. Cosma used to supply cocaine and vernol and trionol and heroin, but those who wanted to smoke opium he sent to Mrs. Sin. What? He gave them her address? No, no, he gave her their address. I see. She called. Yes. Oh, Inspector, Molly bent farther forward, I can see in your eyes that you think I am fabulously wicked. Shall I be arrested? Carrie coughed dryly and stood up. Probably not, miss, but you may be required to give evidence. Oh, actually, cried Molly, also standing up and approaching nearer. Yes, shall you object? Molly looked into his eyes. Not if I can be of the slightest assistance to you, Inspector. A theory to explain why the social butterfly had sought him out as a recipient of her compromising confidences presented itself to Carrie's mind. He was a modest man having neither time nor inclination for gallantries, and this was the first occasion throughout his professional career upon which he had obtained valuable evidence on the strength of his personal attractions. He doubted the accuracy of his deduction, but Molly at that moment lowering her lashes and rapidly raising them again, Carrie was compelled to accept his own astonishing theory. And she is the daughter of a peer, he reflected. No wonder it has been hard to get evidence." He glanced rapidly in the direction of the door. There were several details which were by no means clear, but he decided to act upon the information already given and to get rid of his visitor without delay. Where some of the most dangerous criminals in Europe and America had failed, Molly Gretna had succeeded in making Red Carey nervous. I am much indebted to you, miss, he said, and opened the door. Oh, it has been delightful to confess to you, Inspector declared Molly. I will give you my card, and I shall expect you to come to me for any further information you may want. If I have to be brought to court, you will tell me, won't you? Rely upon it, miss, replied Carey shortly. He escorted Molly to her brougham, observed by no less than six discreetly hidden neighbors, and as the brougham was driven off, she waved her hand to him. Carey felt a hot flush spreading over his red countenance, for the veiled onlookers had not escaped his attention. As he re-entered the house, "'Yon's a bad woman,' said his wife, emerging from the dining room. "'I believe you may be right, Mary,' replied Carrie confusedly. "'I kind it when first I set ein upon her painted face. "'I kind it the now when she looked sideways at ye. "'If yon's a grand lady, she's a woman of pure repute. "'The Lord gas grace.'" End of chapter 27《Chapter 28 of Dope》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Friend.《Dope》by Sax Romer. Chapter 28 The Gilded Joss London was fog-bound. The threat of the past week had been no empty one. Towards the hour of each wintry sunset had come the yellow racks, hastening dusk and driving folks more speedily homeward to their firesides. 
The dull reports of fog signals had become a part of the metropolitan bombardation, but hitherto the choking mist had not secured a stranglehold. Now, however, it had triumphed, casting its thick net over the city as if eager to stifle the pulsing life of the new Babylon. In the neighborhood of the docks, its density was extraordinary, and the purlieu of Limehouse became mere mysterious gullies of smoke, impossible to navigate unless you were very familiar with their intricacies and dangers. Chief Inspector Carey, wearing a cardigan under his oilskins, tapped the pavement with the point of his malacca like a blind man. No glimmer of light could he perceive. He could not even see his companion. Hell, he snapped irritably as his foot touched the brick wall. Where the devil are you, constable? Here beside you, sir, answered P.C. Bryce of K Division, his guide. Which side? Here, sir, the constable grasped Carey's arm. But we've walked slap into a damn brick wall. Keep the wall on your left, sir, and it's all clear ahead. Clear be damned, said Carey. Are we nearly there? About a dozen paces, and we shall see the lamp, if it's been lighted. And if not, we shall stroll into the river, I suppose? No danger of that. Even if the lamp's out, we shall strike the iron pillar. I don't doubt it, said Carey grimly. They proceeded at a slow pace. Dull reports of a vague clangor were audible. These sounds were so deadened by the clammy mist that they might have proceeded from some gnome's workshop deep in the bowels of the earth. The blows of a pile driver at work on the Surrey shore suggested to Carey's mind the phantom crew of Hendrick Hudson at their game of nine pins in the Catskill Mountains. Suddenly, is that you, Bryce? he asked. I'm here, sir, replied the voice of the constable from beside him. Hmm. Then there's someone else about, he raised his voice. Hi there. Have you lost your way? Carey stood still, listening, but no one answered his call. I'll swear there was someone just behind us, Bryce. There was, sir. I saw someone, too. A Chinese resident, probably. Here we are. A sound of banging became audible, and on advancing another two paces, Carey found himself beside Bryce before a low closed door. Hello, hello, croaked a dim voice. Number one police chop low, Sin Sin Wa. The flat note of a police whistle followed. Sin Sin is at home, declared Bryce. That's the raven. Does he take the thing about with him, then? I don't think so but he puts it in a cupboard when he goes out, and it never talks unless it can see light. Bolts were unfastened and the door was opened. Out through the moving curtain of fog shone the red glow of a stove. A grotesque silhouette appeared outlined upon the dim redness. You want ye me, crooned Sin Sin Wah. I do, rapped Carey. I've called to look for opium. He stepped past the Chinaman into the dimly lighted room. As he did so, the cause of an apparent deformity which had characterized the outline of Sin Sin Wah became apparent. From his left shoulder, the raven partly arose, moving its big wings, and, Smartest leg! it shrieked in Carey's ear and rattled imaginary castanets. The chief inspector started involuntarily. Damn the thing! he muttered. Come in, Bryce, and shut the door. What's this? On a tea chest set beside the glowing stove, the little door of which was open, stood a highly polished squat wooden image, gilded and colored red and green. It was that of a leering Chinaman, possibly designed to represent Buddha, and its jade eyes seemed to blink knowingly in the dancing rays from the stove. Sinsin was Joss, murmured the proprietor, as Bryce closed the outer door. Me shiny him up, makey Joss glad. Number one piecey Joss. Carey turned and stared into the pockmarked smiling face. Seen in that dim light, it was not unlike the carved face of the image, save that the latter possessed two open eyes and the Chinaman but one. The details of the room were indiscernible, lost in yellowish shadow, but the eye of the raven and the eye of Sin Sin Wah glittered like strange jewels. Hmm, said Carey. Sorry to interrupt your devotions. Light us. Ali veli prapa, crooned Sin Sin Wah. He took up the joss tenderly and bore it across the room. Opening a little cupboard set low down near the floor, he discovered a lighted lantern. This he took out and set upon the dirty table. Then he placed the image on a shelf in the cupboard and turned smilingly to his visitors. Number one, please, shrieked the raven. Here, snapped Carrie. Put that damn thing to bed. Very good, murmured Sinsinwa complacently. He raised his hand to his shoulder and the raven stepped sedately from shoulder to wrist. Sinsinwa stooped. Come, tingling, he said softly. You catchy sleepy. The raven stepped down from his wrist and walked into the cupboard. So fashion low said Sin Sin Wa, closing the door. He seated himself upon a tea chest beside the useful cupboard, resting his hands upon his knees and smiling. 
Carrie, chewing steadily, had watched the proceedings in silence. But now, Constable Bryce, he said crisply, you recognize this man as Sin Sinwa, the occupier of the house? Yes, sir, replied Bryce. He was not wholly at ease, and persistently avoided the Chinaman's oblique beady eye. In the ordinary course of your duty, you frequently pass along this street. It's the limit of the Limehouse Beat, sir. Poplar patrols on the other side. So that at this point, or hereabout, you would sometimes meet the constable on the next beat. Well, sir, Bryce hesitated, clearing his throat. <clears throat> this street isn't properly in his district. I didn't say it was, snapped Carey, glaring fiercely at the embarrassed constable. I said you would sometimes meet him here. Yes, sometimes. Sometimes, right. Did you ever come in here? The constable ventured a swift glance at the savage red face, and... Yes, sir, now and then, he confessed. Just for a warm on a cold night, maybe. Ali, very welcome, murmured Sinsinwa. Carey never for a moment removed his fixed gaze from the face of Bryce. Now, my lad, he said, I'm going to ask you another question. I'm not saying a word about the warm on a cold night. We're all human. But did you ever see or hear or smell anything suspicious in this house? Never, affirmed the constable earnestly. Did anything ever take place that suggested to your mind that Sin Sinwa might be concealing something? Upstairs, for instance? Never a thing, sir. There's never been a complaint about him. Ali very proper, scrooned Sin Sinwa. Carrie stared intently for some moments at Bryce. Then, turning suddenly to Sin Sinwa, I want to see your wife, he said. Fetch her. Sin Sinwa gently patted his knees. She very bad woman, he declared. She no hate topside pigeon. Don't talk, shouted Carrie. Fetch her. Sinsinwa turned his hands, palms upward. Me no hate got you wifey, he murmured. Carrie took one pace forward. Fetch her, he said, or he drew a pair of handcuffs from the pocket of his oilskin. Very bad luck, murmured Sinsinwa. Catchy trouble for wifey no got. He extended his wrists, meeting the angry glare of the chief inspector with a smile of resignation. Carrie bit savagely at his chewing gum, glancing aside at Bryce. Did you ever see his wife? He snapped. No, sir. I didn't know he had one. No, I've got ye, murmured Sinsinwa. Very bad woman. For the last time, said Carrie, stooping and thrusting his face forward so that his nose was only some six inches from that of Sinsinwa. Where's Mrs. Sin? Kachi Lunaf, replied the Chinaman blandly. Very bad woman. Thief woman. Kachi steely all of my dollars. Ah! Carrie stood upright, moving his shoulders and rattling the handcuffs. Come here when Sinsinwa had gone for Kachi Shavi. Lift the all of my dollars and f chilo. He raised his hands and blew imaginary fluff into space. Carrie stared down at him with an expression in which animal ferocity and helplessness were oddly blended. Then, Bryce, he said, stay here. I'm going to search the house. Very good, sir. Carey turned again to the Chinaman. Is there anyone upstairs? He demanded. Nobody hate. Sinsin wa ala semi lonesome. Ketchy shinem him josh. Carey dropped the handcuffs back into the pocket of his overall and took out an electric torch. With never another glance at Sinsin wa, he went out into the passage and began to mount the stairs, presently finding himself in a room filled with all sorts of unsavory rubbish and containing a large cupboard. He uttered an exclamation of triumph crossing the littered floor and picking his way amid broken cane chairs, tea chests, discarded garments, and bed lays, he threw open the cupboard door. Before him hung a row of ragged clothes and a number of bowler hats. Directing the ray of the torch upon the unsavory collection, he snatched coats and hats from the hooks upon which they depended and hurled them impatiently upon the floor. When the cupboard was empty, he stepped into it and began to bang upon the back. The savagery of his expression grew more marked than usual, and as he chewed, his maxillary muscles protruded extraordinarily. If ever I sounded a brick wall, he muttered, I'm doing it now. Tap where he would, and he tapped with his knuckles and with the bone furl of his cane. There was nothing in the resulting sound to suggest that that part of the wall behind the cupboard was less solid than any other part. He examined the room rapidly, then passed into another one adjoining it, which was evidently used as a bedroom. The latter faced towards the court and did not come in contact with the wall of the neighboring house. In both rooms, the windows were fastened, and judging from the state of the fasteners, were never opened. In that containing the cupboard, outside shutters were also closed. 
Despite the sealing up of the apartments, traces of fog hung in the air. Carrie descended the stairs. Snapping off the light of his torch, he stood, feet wide apart, staring at Sinsinwa. The latter, smiling imperturbably, yellow hands resting upon his knees, sat quite still on the tea chest. Constable Bryce was seated on a corner of the table, looking curiously awkward in his tweed overcoat and bowler hat, which garments quite failed to disguise the policeman. He stood up as Carrie entered. Then, "'There used to be a door between this house and the next,' said Carrie succinctly. "'My information is exact and given by someone who has often used that door.' "'Bloody liar!' murmured Sinsinwa. "'What?' shouted Carrie. "'What did you say, you yellow-faced mongrel?' He clenched his fists and strode towards the Chinaman. "'Saucy fellow, catchy pulley leg,' explained the unmoved Sinsinwa. "'Velly bad man telly lie for makey bulberry. Catchy poor Chinaman in trouble.' In the fog-bound silence, Carrie could very distinctly be heard chewing. He turned suddenly to Bryce. "'Go back and fetch two men,' he directed. "'I should never find my way.' "'Very good, sir.' Bryce stepped to the door, unable to hide the relief which he experienced, and opened it. The fog was so dense that it looked like a yellow curtain hung in the opening. "'Phew!' said Bryce. "'I may be some little time, sir.' "'Quite likely, but don't stop to pick daisies.' The constable went out, closing the door. Carrie laid his cane on the table, then stooped and tossed a cut of chewing gum into the stove. From his waistcoat pocket, he drew out a fresh piece and placed it between his teeth. Drawing a tea chest closer to the stove, he seated himself and stared intently into the glowing heart of the fire. Sin Sin Wa extended his arm and opened the little cupboard. Number one, please, croaked the raven drowsily. You catchy sleepy, twing a ling, said Sin Sin Wa. He took out the green-eyed joss, set it tenderly upon a corner of the table, and closed the cupboard door. With a piece of chamois leather, which he sometimes dipped into a little square tin, he began to polish the hideous figure. End of chapter 28 Chapter 29 of Dope This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Friend. Dope by Sax Romer. Chapter 29. Doubts and Fears. Monty Urban raised his head and stared dully at Margaret Haley. It was very quiet in the library of the big old-fashioned house at Prince's Gate. A faint crackling sound which proceeded from the fire was clearly audible. Margaret's gray eyes were anxiously watching the man whose pose, as he sat in the deep saddle-back chair, so curiously suggested collapse. Drugs, he whispered. Drugs. Few of his city associates would have recognized the voice. All would have been shocked to see the change which had taken place in the man. You really understand why I have told you, Mr. Irvin, don't you? said Margaret, almost pleadingly. Dr. Burton thought you should not be told, but then Dr. Burton did not know you were going to ask me point-blank, and I thought it better that you should know the truth, bad as it is, rather than... Rather than suspect worse things, whispered Irvin. Of course, you were right, Miss Haley. I am very, very grateful to you for telling me. I realize what courage it must have called for. Believe me, I shall always remember, he broke off, staring across the room at his wife's portrait. Then, if only I had known, he added. Irvin exhibited greater composure than Margaret had ventured to anticipate. She was confirmed in her opinion that he should be told the truth. I would have told you long ago, she said, if I had thought that any good could result from my doing so. Frankly, I had hoped to cure Rita of the habit, and I believe I might have succeeded in time. There has been no mention of drugs in connection with the case, said Monty Irvin, speaking monotonously. In the press, I mean. Hitherto there has not, she replied, but there is a hint of it in one of this evening's papers, and I determine to give you the exact facts so far as they are known to me before some garbled account came to your ears. Thank you, he said. Thank you. I had felt for a long time that I was getting out of touch with Rita, that she had other confidence. Have you any idea who they were, Miss Haley? He raised his eyes, looking at her pathetically. Margaret hesitated, then... Well, she replied, I am afraid Nina knew. Her maid? I think she must have known. He sighed. The police have interrogated her, he said. Probably she's being watched. 
Oh, I don't think she knows anything about the drug syndicate, declared Margaret. She merely acted as a confidential messenger. Poor Sir Lucian Pine, I am sure, was addicted to drugs. Do you think, Irvin spoke in a very low voice, do you think he led her into the habit? Margaret bit her lip, staring down at the red carpet. I would hate to slander a man who can never defend himself, she replied finally, but I have sometimes thought he did. Silence fell. Both were contemplating a theory which neither dared express in words. You see, continued Margaret, it is evident that this man Cosma was patronized by people so highly placed that it is hopeless to look for information from them. Again, such people have influence. I don't suggest they are using it to protect Cosma, but I have no doubt they are doing so to protect themselves. Monty Urban raised his eyes to her face. A weary, sad look had come into them. You mean that it may be to someone's interest to hush up the matter as much as possible? Margaret nodded her head. The prevalence of the drug habit in society, especially in London society, is a secret which has remained hidden so long from the general public, she replied, that one cannot help looking for bribery and corruption. The stage is made the scapegoat whenever the voice of scandal breathes the word dope, but we rarely hear the names of the worst offenders even whispered. I have thought for a long time that the authorities must know the names of the receivers and distributors of cocaine, veronal, opium, and the other drugs, huge quantities of which find their way regularly to the west end of London. Pharmacists sometimes experience the greatest difficulty in obtaining the drugs which they legitimately require. And the prices have increased extraordinarily. Cocaine, for instance, has gone up from five and six pence an ounce to eighty-seven shillings, and heroin from three and six pence to over forty shillings, while opium that was once twenty shillings a pound is now eight times the price. Monty Irvin listened attentively. In the course of my Guildhall duties, he said slowly, I have been brought in contact frequently with police officers of all ranks. If influential people are really at work protecting these villains who deal illicitly in drugs, I don't think, and I am not prepared to believe, that they have corrupted the police. Neither do I believe so, Mr. Irvin, said Margaret eagerly. But, Irvin pursued, exhibiting greater animation, you informed me that a Home Office Commissioner has been appointed. What does this mean, if not that Lord Rexborough distrusts the police? Well, you see... The police seem to be unable or unwilling to do anything in the matter. Of course, this may have been due to the fact that the traffic was so skillfully handled that it defied their inquiries. Take, as an instance, Chief Inspector Carey, continued Urban. He has exhibited the utmost delicacy and consideration in his dealings with me, but I'll swear that a whiter man never breathed. Oh, really, Mr. Urban? I don't think for a moment that men of that class are suspected of being concerned. Indeed, I don't believe any act of collusion is suspected at all. Lord Rexborough thinks that Scotland Yard hasn't got an officer clever enough for the dope people? Quite possibly. I take it that he has put up a secret service man? I believe, that is, I know he has. Monty Irvin was watching Margaret's face, and despite the dull misery which deadened his usually quick perceptions, he detected a heightened color and a faint change of expression. He did not question her further upon the point. But, God knows I welcome all the help that offers, he said. Lord Rexborough is your uncle, Miss Haley. But do you think this secret commission business quite fair to Scotland Yard? Margaret stared for some moments at the carpet, then raised her gray eyes and looked earnestly at the speaker. She had learned in the brief time that had elapsed since this black sorrow had come upon him to understand that it was in the character of Monty Irvin which had attracted Rita. It afforded an illustration of that obscure law governing the magnetism which subsists between diverse natures. For not all the agony of mind which he suffered could hide or mar the cleanness and honesty of purpose which were Monty Irvin's outstanding qualities. No, Margaret replied. Honestly, I don't. And I feel rather guilty about it, too, because I have been urging Uncle to take such a step for quite a long time. You see, she glanced at Irvin wistfully, I am brought in contact with so many victims of the drug habit. I believe the police are hampered, and these people who deal in drugs manage in some way to evade the law. The Home Office agent will report to a committee appointed by Lord Rexborough, and then, you see, if it is found necessary to do so, there will be special legislation. 
Monty Irvin sighed wearily, and his glance strayed in the direction of the telephone on the side table. He seemed to be constantly listening for something which he expected, but dreaded to hear. Whenever the toy spaniel, which lay curled up on the rug before the fire, moved or looked towards the door, Irvin started, and his expression changed. "'This suspense,' he said jerkily, "'this suspense is so hard to bear.' "'Oh, Mr. Irvin, your courage is wonderful,' replied Margaret earnestly. "'But he,' she hastily corrected herself, "'everybody is convinced that Rita is safe. "'Under some strange misapprehension regarding this awful tragedy, "'she has run away into hiding. "'Probably she has been induced to do so "'by those interested in preventing her from giving evidence.' "'Monty Irvin's eyes lighted up strangely. "'Is that the opinion of the Home Office agent?' he asked. "'Yes.' "'Inspector Carey shares it,' declared Irvin. Please, God, they are right. It is the only possible explanation, said Margaret. Any hour now we may expect news of her. You don't think, pursued Monty Irvin, that anybody, anybody suspects Rita of being concerned in the death of Sir Lucian? He fixed a gaze of pathetic inquiry upon her face. Of course not, she cried. How ridiculous it would be. Yes, he murmured. It would be ridiculous. Margaret stood up. I am quite relieved now that I have done what I conceive to be my duty, Mr. Irvin, she said. And bad as the truth may be, it is better than doubt, after all. You must look after yourself, you know. When Rita comes back, we shall have a big task before us to wean her from her old habits. She met his glance frankly. But we shall succeed. How you cheer me, whispered Monty Irvin emotionally. You are the truest friend that Rita ever had, Miss Haley. You will keep in touch with me, will you not? Of course. Next to yourself, there is no one so sincerely interested as I am. I love Rita as I should have loved a sister if I had had one. Please don't stand up. Dr. Burton has told you to avoid all exertion for a week or more, I know. Monty Irvin grasped her outstretched hand. Any news which reaches me, he said, I will communicate immediately. Thank you. In times of trouble, we learn to know our real friends. End of chapter 29. Chapter 30 of Dope. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Friend. Dope by Sax Romer. Chapter 30 The Fight in the Dark. Towards eleven o'clock at night, the fog began slightly to lift. As Carey crossed the bridge over Limehouse Canal, he could vaguely discern the dirty water below, and street lamps showed dimly, surrounded each by a halo of yellow mist. Fog signals were booming on the railway, and from the great docks in the neighborhood, mechanical clashings and hammerings were audible. Turning to the right, Carey walked on for some distance, and then suddenly stepped into the entrance to a narrow cul-de-sac and stood quite still. A conviction had been growing upon him during the past twelve hours that someone was persistently and cleverly dogging his footsteps. He had first detected the presence of this mysterious follower outside the house of Sinsinwa, but the density of the fog had made it impossible for him to obtain a glimpse of the man's face. He was convinced, too, that he had been followed back to Layman Street, and from there to New Scotland Yard. Now, again, he became aware of this persistent presence and hoped at last to confront the spy. Below, footsteps. The footsteps of someone proceeding with the utmost caution came along the pavement. Carey stood close to the wall of the court, one hand in a pocket of his overall, waiting and chewing. Nearer came the footsteps, and nearer. A shadowy figure appeared only a yard or so away from the watchful chief inspector. Thereupon he acted. With one surprising spring, he hurled himself upon the unprepared man, grasped him by his coat collar, and shone the light of an electric torch fully into his face. Hell, he snapped, the smart from spinkers. The ray of the torch lighted up the mean, pinched face of Bristly, blanched now by fright, gleamed upon the sharp, hooked nose and into the cunning little brown eyes. Bristly licked his lips. In Carey's muscular grip, he bore quite a remarkable resemblance to a rat in the jaws of a terrier. Ho, ho, continued the chief inspector, showing his teeth savagely. So we let Scotland Yard make the pie, and then we steal all the plums, do we? 
He shook the frightened man until Bristley's broad-brimmed bowler was shaken off, revealing the receding brow and scanty, neutral-colored hair. We let Scotland Yard work night and day, and then we present our rat-faced selves to Mr. Monty Irvin and say we have found the lady, do we? Another vigorous shake followed. We track chief inspectors of the Criminal Investigation Department, do we? Do we, huh? We are dirty, skulking mongrels, aren't we? We require to be kicked from Limehouse to paradise, don't we? He suddenly released Bristly. So we shall be, he shouted furiously. Hot upon the promise came the deed. Bristly sent up a howl of pain as Carey's right brogue came into violent contact with his person. The assault almost lifted him off his feet, and hatless as he was, he set off, running as a man runs whose life depends upon his speed. The sound of his pattering footsteps was echoed from wall to wall of the cul-de-sac until finally it was swallowed up in the fog. Carey stood listening for some moments, then, directing a furious kick upon the bowler which lay at his feet, he snapped off the light of the torch and pursued his way. The lesser mystery was solved, but the greater was before him. He had made a careful study of the geography of the neighborhood, and although the fog was still dense enough to be confusing, he found his way without much difficulty to the street for which he was bound. Some fifteen paces along the narrow thoroughfare, he came upon someone standing by a closed door set in a high brick wall. The street contained no dwelling houses, and except for the solitary figure by the door, was deserted and silent. Carey took out his torch and shone a white ring upon the smiling countenance of Detective Sergeant Combs. "'If that smile gets any worse,' he said irritably, "'they'll have to move your ears back. Anything to report? Since Sinwa went to bed an hour ago. Any visitors?' No. Has he been out? No. Got the ladder? Yes. All quiet in the neighborhood. All quiet. Good. The street in which this conversation took place was one running roughly parallel with that in which the house of Sinsinwa was situated. A detailed search of the Chinaman's premises had failed to bring to light any scrap of evidence to show that opium had ever been smoked there. Of the door described by Molly Gretna, and said to communicate with the adjoining establishment, not a trace could be found. But the fact that such a door had existed did not rest solely upon Molly's testimony. From one of the beat-ups interviewed that day, Carey had succeeded in extracting confirmatory evidence. Inquiries conducted in the neighborhood of Poplar had brought to light the fact that four of the houses in this particular street, including that occupied by Sin Sin Wa and that adjoining it, belonged to a certain Mr. Jacobs, said to reside abroad. Mr. Jacobs' rents were collected by an estate agent and sent to an address in San Francisco. For some reason not evident to this man of business, Mr. Jacobs demanded a rental for the house next to Sinsinwa's, which was out of all proportion to the value of the property. Hence it had remained vacant for a number of years. The windows were broken and boarded up, as was the door. Carey realized that the circumstance of the landlord of the House of a Hundred Raptures, being named Jacobs, and the leasee of the Cubana Cigarette Company's premises in Old Bond Street being named Isaacs, might be no more than a coincidence. Nevertheless, it was odd. He had determined to explore the place without unduly advertising his intentions. Two modes of entrance presented themselves. There was a trap on the roof, but in order to reach it, access would have to be obtained to one of the other houses in the row, which also possessed a roof trap. Or there were four windows overlooking a little brickyard, two upstairs and two down. By means of a short ladder which Combs had brought for the purpose, Carey climbed onto the wall and dropped into the yard. The jimmy, he said softly. Combs, also mounting, dropped the required implement. Carey caught it deftly, and in a very few minutes had wrenched away the rough planking nailed over one of the lower windows, without making very much noise. "'Shall I come down?' inquired Combs, in muffled tones from the top of the wall. "'No,' rapped Carey. "'Hide the ladder again. If I want help, I'll whistle. Catch!' He tossed the jimmy up to Combs, and Combs succeeded in catching it. Then Carey raised the glassless sash of the window and stepped into a little room, which he surveyed by the light of his electric torch. It was filthy and littered with rubbish, but showed no sign of having been occupied for a long time. The ceiling was nearly black, and so were the walls. He went out into a narrow passage similar to that in the house of Sin Sin Wa, and leading to a stair. Walking quietly, he began to ascend. Molly Gretna's description of the opium house had been most detailed and lurid, and he was prepared for some extravagant scene. 
he found three bare, dirty rooms, having all the windows boarded up. Hell, he said succinctly, resting his torch upon a dust-coated ledge of the room, which presumably was situated in the front of the house, he deposited a cut of chewing gum in the empty grate, and lovingly selected a fresh piece from the packet which he always carried. Once more chewing, he returned to the narrow passage, which he knew must be that in which the secret doorway had opened. It was uncarpeted and dirty, and the walls were covered with faded, filthy paper, the original color and design of which were quite lost. There was not the slightest evidence that a door had ever existed in any part of the wall. Following a detailed examination, Carey returned his magnifying glass to the washed leather bag and the bag to his waistcoat pocket. Hmm, he said, thinking aloud. Sin Sin Wa may have only one eye, but it's a good eye. He raised his glance to the blackened ceiling of the passage and saw that the trap giving access to the roof was situated immediately above him. He directed the ray of the torch upon it. In the next moment, he had snapped off the light and was creeping silently towards the door of the front room. The trap had moved slightly. Gaining the doorway, Carey stood just inside the room and waited. He became conscious of a kind of joyous excitement, which claimed him at such moments, an eagerness and a lust of action. But he stood perfectly still, listening and waiting. There came a faint creaking sound, and a new damp chilliness was added to the stale atmosphere of the passage. Someone had quietly raised the trap. Cutting through the blackness like a scimitar shone a ray of light from above, widening as it descended and ending in a white patch on the floor. It was moved to and fro, then it disappeared. Another vague creaking sound followed, that caused by a man's weight being imposed upon a wooden framework. Finally came a thud on the bare boards of the floor. Complete silence ensued. Carey waited, muscles tense and brain alert. He even suspended the chewing operation. A dull, padding sound reached his ears. From the quality of the thud which had told of the intruder's drop from the trap to the floor, Carey had deduced that he wore rubber-soled shoes. Now, the sound which he could hear was that of the stranger's furtive footsteps. He was approaching the doorway in which Carey was standing. Just behind the open door, Carey waited, and unheralded by any further sound to tell of his approach, the intruder suddenly shone a ray of light right into the room. He was on the threshold. Only the door concealed him from Carey, and concealed Carey from the newcomer. The disk of light cast into the dirty room grew smaller. The man with the torch was entering. A hand which grasped a magazine pistol appeared beyond the edge of the door, and Carey's period of inactivity came to an end. Leaning back, he adroitly kicked the weapon from the hand of the man who held it. There was a smothered cry of pain, and the pistol fell clattering on the floor. The light went out, too. As it vanished, Carey leapt from his hiding place, snapping on the light of his own pocket lamp. He ran out into the passage. Crack! came the report of a pistol. Carey dropped flat on the floor. He had not counted on the intruder being armed with two pistols. His pocket lamp, still alight, fell beside him, and he lay in a curiously rigid attitude on his side, one knee drawn up and his arm thrown across his face. Carefully avoiding the path of light cast by the fallen torch, the unseen stranger approached silently. Pistol in hand, he bent, nearer and nearer, striving to see the face of the prostrate man. Carey lay deathly still. The other dropped to one knee and bent closely over him. Swiftly as a lash, Carey's arm was whipped around the man's neck, and helpless, he pitched over onto his head. Uttering a dull groan, he lay heavy and still across Carey's body. Flames! muttered the chief inspector, extricating himself. I didn't mean to break his neck. He took up the electric torch and shone it upon the face of the man on the floor. It was a dirty, unshaven face, unevenly tanned, as though the man had worn a beard until quite recently and had come from a hot climate. He was attired in a manner which suggested that he might be a ship's fireman, save that he wore canvas shoes having rubber soles. Carey stood watching him for some moments. Then he groped behind him with one foot until he found the pistol, the second pistol which the man had dropped as he pitched on his skull. Carey picked it up, and resting the electric torch upon the crown of his neat bowler hat, which lay upon the floor, he stooped, pistol in hand, and searched the pockets of the prostate man, who had begun to breathe stertorously. In the breast pocket he found a leather wallet of good quality, and at this he stared, a curious expression coming into his fierce eyes. He opened it and found treasury notes, some official-looking papers, and a number of cards. Upon one of these cards he directed the light, and this is what he read. 
Lord Rexborough, Great Cumberland Place, V1, to introduce 719W. God's truth, gasped Carrie. It's the man from Whitehall. The stertorous breathing ceased, and a very dirty hand was thrust up to him. I'm glad you spoke, Chief Inspector Carey, drawled a vaguely familiar voice. I was just about to kick you in the back of the neck. Carey dropped the wallet and grasped the pro-offered hand. 719 stood up, smiling grimly. Footsteps were clattering on the stairs. Combs had heard the shot. Sir, said Carey, if ever you need a testimonial to your efficiency at this game, my address is 67 Spencer Road, Brixton. We've met before. We have, Chief Inspector, was the reply. We met at Cosmas, and later at a certain gambling den in Soho. The pseudo-fireman dragged a big cigar case from his hip pocket. I'm known as Seton Pasha. Can I offer you a churut? End of chapter 30「Chapter Thirty One of Dope. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Dope by Sax Romer. Chapter Thirty One The Story of Seven Nineteen. In a top back room of the end house in the street, which also boasted the residence of Sinsinwa. Seton Pasha and Chief Inspector Carey sat one on either side of a dirty deal table. Seton smoked, and Carey chewed. A smoky oil lamp burned upon the table, and two notebooks lay beside it. It is certainly odd, Seton was saying, that you fail to break my neck. But I have made it a practice since taking up my residence here to wear a cap heavily padded. I apprehend sandbags and pieces of loaded tubing. The tube is not made, declared Kerry, which can do the job. You're harder to kill than a Chinese Jew. Your own escape is almost equally remarkable, added Seaton. I rarely miss at such short range. But you had nearly broken my wrist with that kick. I'm sorry, said Carey. You should always bang a door wide open suddenly before you enter into a suspected room. Anybody standing behind usually stops it with his head. I am indebted for the hint, Chief Inspector. We all have something to learn. Well, sir, we've laid our cards on the table, and you'll admit we've both got a lot to learn before we see daylight. I'll be obliged if you'll put me wise to your game. I take it you began work on the very night of the murder. I did, by a pure accident. The finding of an opiated cigarette in Mr. Gray's rooms. I perceived that the business which had led to my recall from the East was involved in the Bond Street mystery. Frankly, Chief Inspector, I doubted at that time if it were possible for you and me to work together. I decided to work alone. A beard which I had worn in the East, for purposes of disguise, I shaved off, and because the skin was whiter where the hair had grown than elsewhere, I found it necessary after shaving to powder my face heavily. This accounts for the description given to you of a man with a pale face. Even now the coloring is irregular, as you may notice. Deciding to work anonymously, I went post-haste to Lord Rexborough, and made certain arrangements, whereby I became known to the responsible authorities as 719. The explanation of these figures is a simple one. My name is Greville Seaton. G is the seventh letter in the alphabet, and S the nineteenth. Hence, 719. The increase of the drug traffic and the failure of the police to cope with it had led to the institution of a home office inquiry, you see. It was suspected that the traffic was in the hands of Orientals, and in looking about for a confidential agent to make certain inquiries, my name cropped up. I was at that time employed by the Foreign Office, but Lord Rexborough borrowed me. Seaton smiled at his own expression. Every facility was offered to me, as you know. 
and that my investigations led to the same conclusions as your own, my presence as lessee of this room, in the person of John Smiles, seaman, sufficiently demonstrates. Hmm, said Carey. And I take it your investigations have also led you to the conclusion that our hands are clean? Seaton Pasha fixed his cool regard upon the speaker. Personally, I have never doubted this, Chief Inspector. He declared, I believed, and I still believe, that the people who traffic in drugs are clever enough to keep in the good books of the local police. It is a case of clever camouflage rather than corruption. Ah, snapped Carey. I was waiting to hear you mention it. So long as we know, I'm not a man that stands for being pointed at. I've got a boy at a good public school, but if ever he said he was ashamed of his father, the day he said it would be the day he'd never forget. Seaton Pasha smiled grimly and changed the topic. Let us see, he said, if we are any nearer to the heart of the mystery of Kasma. You were at the Regent Street Bank today, I understand, at which the late Sir Lucian Pine had an account. I was, replied Carey. Next to his theatrical enterprises, his chief source of income seems to have been a certain Jose Santos company of Buenos Aires. We have traced Cosmo's account, too, but no one at the bank has ever seen him. The missing Rashid always paid in. Checks were signed Mohammed El Kasma, in which name the account had been opened. From the amount standing to his credit there, it's evident that the proceeds of the dope business went elsewhere. Where do you think they went? asked Seaton quietly, watching Carey. Well, rapped Carey, I think the same as you. I've got two eyes, and I can see out of both of them. And you think? I think they went to the Jose Santos Company of Buenos Aires. Right, cried Seaton. I feel sure of it. We may never know how it was all arranged or who was concerned. But I am convinced that Mr. Isaacs, lessee of the Cubana Cigarette Company offices, Mr. Jacobs, my landlord, Mohammed El Kazma, whoever he may be, the untraceable Mrs. Sinsenwa, and another, were all shareholders of the Jose Santos Company. I am with you. By another, you mean? Sir Lucian, it's horrible, but I'm afraid it's true. They became silent for a while. Carrie chewed and Seaton smoked. Then, the significance of the fact that Sir Lucian's study window was no more than forty paces across the leads from a well-oiled window of the Cubanus Company will not have escaped you, said Seaton. I performed the journey just ahead of you, I believe. Then Sir Lucian had lived in Buenos Aires. That was before he came into the title, and at a time I am told when he was not overburdened with wealth. His man Marino is indisputably some kind of a South American, and he can give no satisfactory account of his movements on the night of the murder. That we have to deal with a powerful drug syndicate there can be no doubt. The late Sir Lucian may not have been a director, but I feel sure he was financially interested. Casmas was the distributing office, and the importer? Was Sinsin Wa, cried Carey, his eyes gleaming savagely. He's as clever and cunning as all the rest of Chinatown put together. Somewhere not a hundred miles from this spot where we are now, there's a store of stuff big enough to dope all Europe. And there's something else, said Seaton quietly, knocking a cone of gray ash from his cheroot onto the dirty floor. Kazma is hiding there in all probability, if he hasn't got clear away, and Mrs. Monty Irvin is being held a prisoner. If they haven't, for Irvin's sake I hope not, Chief Inspector. There are two very curious points in the case, apart from the mystery which surrounds the man, Kazma, the fact that Marino, palpably an accomplice, stayed to face the music, and the fact that Cincinnati likewise has made no effort to escape. Do you see what it means? They are covering the big man, Kazma. Once he and Mrs. Irvin are out of the way, we can prove nothing against Marino and Cincinnati. 
and the most we could do for mrs sin would be to convict her of selling opium to do even that we should have to take a witness to court said carrie gloomily and all the satisfaction we get would be to see her charged ten pounds silence fell between them again it was the kind of sympathetic silence which is only possible where harmony exists and indeed of all the things strange and bizarre which characterized the inquiry this sudden amity between carrie and seton pasha was not the least remarkable it represented the fruit of a mutual respect there was something about the lean unshaven face of seton pasha and something too in his bright grey eyes which allowing for the difference of colouring might have reminded a close observer of carrie's fierce countenance the tokens of iron determination and utter indifference to danger were perceptible in both and although seaton was dark and turning slightly grey while carrie was as red as a man well could be that they possessed several common traits of character was a fact which the dissimilarity of their complexions wholly failed to conceal but while seaton pasha hid the grimness of his nature beneath a sort of humorous reserve the dangerous side of Kerry was displayed in his open truculence seated there in that limehouse attic a smoky lamp burning on the table between them and one gripping the stump of a cheroot between his teeth while the other chewed steadily they presented a combination which none but a fool would have lightly challenged since sinois is cunning said seaton suddenly he is a very clever man watch him as closely as you like he will never lead you to the store in the character of john smiles i had some conversation with him this morning and i formed the same opinion as yourself he is waiting for something and he is certain of his ground i have a premonition chief inspector that whoever else may fall into the net since sinwa will slip out we have one big chance what's that rapped carrie the dope syndicate can only have got control of the traffic in one way by paying big prices and buying out competitors if they cease to carry on for even a week they lose their control the people who bring the stuff over from japan south america india holland and so forth will sell somewhere else if they can't sell to Casma and company therefore we want to watch the ships from likely ports or better still get among the men who do the smuggling there must be resorts along the riverside used by people of that class we might pick up information there carrie smiled savagely i've got half a dozen good men doing every dive from wapping to gravesend he answered but if you think it's worth looking into personally say the word well my dear sir seaton pasha tossed the end of his cheroot into the empty grate what else can we do kerry banged his fist on the table you're right he snapped we're stuck but anything's better than nothing we'll start here and now and the first joint we'll make for is dougal's dougal's echoed seaton pasha that's it dougal's a danger spot on the isle of dogs used by the lowest type of seafaring men and not barred to arabs chinks and other gaily coloured fowl if there's any chat going on about dope we'll hear it at dougal's seaton pasha stood up smiling grimly dougal's it shall be he said end of chapter thirty one recording by john brandon Chapter thirty two of Dope. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Dope by Sax Romer. Chapter thirty two On the Isle of Dogs. As the police boat left Limehouse Pier, a clammy southeasterly breeze blowing upstream lifted the fog in clearly defined layers an effect very singular to behold at one moment a great arc lamp burning above the lavender pond of the surrey commercial dock 
shot out a yellowish light across the thames then as suddenly as it had come the light vanished again as a stratum of mist floated before it the creaking of the oars muffled and ghostly and none of the men in the boat seemed to be inclined to converse heading across stream they made for the unseen promontory of the isle of dogs navigation was suspended and they reached midstream without seeing a ship's light then came the damp wind again to lift the fog and ahead of them they discerned one of the general steam navigation company's boats awaiting an opportunity to make her dock at the head of the deptford creek the glamour of an ironworks on the mill wall shore burst loudly upon their ears and away astern the lights of the surrey dock shone out once more hugging the bank they pursued a southerly course and from limehouse reach crept down to greenwich reach fog closed in upon them a curtain obscuring both light and sound when the breeze came again it had gathered force and it drove the mist before it in wreathing banks and brought to their ears a dull lowing and to their nostrils a farmyard odor from the cattle pens ghostly flames leaping and falling leaping and falling crowed where a gas works lay on the greenwich bank ahead eastward swept the river now and fresher blew the breeze as they rounded the blunt point of the isle the fog banks went swirling past them astern and the lights on either shore showed clearly ahead a ship's siren began to roar somewhere behind them the steamer which they had passed was about to pursue her course closer inshore drew the boat passing a series of wharves and beyond these a tract of waste desolate bank very gloomy in the half-light and apparently boasting no habitation of man the activities of the greenwich bank seemed remote and the desolation of the isle of dogs very near touching them intimately with its peculiar gloom a light sprang into view some little distance inland notable because it shone lonely in an expanse of utter blackness Carey broke the long silence dougals he said put us ashore here the police boat was pulled in under a rickety wooden structure beneath which the thames water whispered eerily and Carrie and Seaton disembarked. Mounting a short flight of slimy wooden steps and crossing a roughly planked place onto a shingly slope. Climbing this, they were on damp waste ground, pathless and uninviting. Dougal's is being watched, said Carrie. I think I told you. Yes, said Seaton. But I have formed the opinion that the dope gang is too clever for the ordinary type of man. Since in moi, is an instance of what i mean neither you nor i doubt that he is a receiver of drugs perhaps the receiver but where is our case the only real link connecting him with the west end habitue is his wife and she has conveniently deserted him we cannot possibly prove that she hasn't while he chooses to maintain that she has hmm grunted Carey abruptly changing the subject i hope i'm not recognized here have you visited the place before some years ago unless there are any old hands on view tonight i don't think i shall be spotted he wore a heavy and threadbare overcoat which was several sizes too large for him a muffler and a weed cap the outfit supplied by seaton pasha and he had a very vivid and unpleasant recollection of his appearance as viewed in his little pocket mirror before leaving seaton's room as they proceeded across the muddy wilderness towards the light which marked the site of dougal's they presented a picture of a sufficiently villainous pair the ground was irregular and the path wound sinuously about mounds of rubbish so that often the guiding light was lost and they stumbled blindly among nondescript litter which apparently represented the accumulation of centuries but finally they turned a corner formed by a stack of rusty scrap iron and found a long low building before them 
from a ground floor window light streamed out upon the fragments of rubbish strewing the ground from amid which sickly weeds uprose as if in defiance of nature's laws seaton paused and what is dougal's exactly he asked a public house no rapped carrie it's a coffee shop used by the dockers you'll see when we get inside the place never closes so far as i know and if we made em close there would be a dock strike he crossed and pushed open the swing door as seaton entered at his heels a babble of coarse voices struck upon his ears and he found himself in a superheated atmosphere suggestive of shag stale spirits and imperfectly washed humanity dougal's proved to be a kind of hut of wood and corrugated iron not unlike an army canteen there were two counters one on either end and two large american stoves oil lamps hung from the beams and the furniture was made up of trestle tables rough wooden chairs and empty barrels coarse thick curtains covered all the windows but one the counter further from the entrance was laden with articles of food such as pies tins of bully beef and saveloys while the other was devoted to liquid refreshment in the form of ginger beer and cider or so the casks were conspicuously labeled tea coffee and cocoa the place was uncomfortably crowded the patrons congregating more especially around the two stoves there were men who looked like dock laborers seamen and riverside loafers lascars chinese arabs and dagos and at the solid counter there presided a red-armed brawny woman fierce of mien and ready of tongue while a huge irishman possessing a broken nose and deficient teeth ruled the liquid department with a rod of iron and a flow of language which shocked even kerry this formidable ruffian a retired warrior of the ring was dougal said to be the strongest man from tower hill to the river lee as they entered several of the patrons glanced at them curiously but no one seemed to be particularly interested kerry wore his cap pulled down over his fierce eyes and had the collar of his topcoat turned up he looked about him as if expecting to recognize someone and as they made their way to dougal's counter a big fellow dressed in the manner of a dock laborer stepped up to the chief inspector and clapped him on the shoulder have one with me mike he said winking the coffee's good kerry bent towards him swiftly and anybody here jervis he whispered george martin is at the bar i've had the tip that he traffics you'll remember he figured in my last report sir kerry nodded and the trio elbowed their way to the counter the pseudo dockhand was a detective attached to lehman street and one who knew the night birds of east end london as few men outside their own circles knew them three coffees pat he cried leaning against the shoulder of the heavy red-headed fellow who lolled against the counter and two lumps of sugar in each to hell with your sugar roared dougal grasping three cups deftly in one hairy hand and filling them from a steaming urn there's no more sugar tonight not any brown sugar asked the customer yous can have one taste one of brown and no more tonight cried dougal he stooped rapidly below the counter then pushed the three cups of coffee towards the detective the latter tossed a shilling down at which dougal glared ferociously twas weed sugar you said he roared a second shilling followed dougal swept both coins into a drawer and turned to another customer who was also clamoring for coffee securing their cups with difficulty for the red-headed man surly refused to budge they retired to a comparatively quiet spot and seaton tasted the hot beverage hmm he said rum good rum too it's a nice position for me snapped carrie i don't think i would remind you that there's a police station actually on this blessed island if there was a dive like dougal's anywhere west it would be raided as a matter of course 
but to shut dougals down would be to raise hell there are two laws in england sir one for piccadilly and the other for the isle of dogs he sipped his coffee with appreciation jervis looked about him cautiously and that's george the red-headed hooligan against the counter he said he's been liquoring up pretty freely and i shouldn't be surprised to find that he's got a job on tonight he has a skiff beached below here and i think he's waiting for the tide good rapped carrie where can we find a boat well jervis smiled there were several lying there if you didn't come in in an r p boat we did but i'll dismiss it we want a small boat very good sir we shall have to pinch one that doesn't matter declared carrie glancing at seaton with a sudden twinkle discernible in his steely eyes what do you say sir i agree with you entirely replied seaton quietly we must find a boat and lie off somewhere to watch for george he should be worth following we'll be moving then said the lehman street detective it'll be high tide in an hour they finished their coffee as quickly as possible the stuff was not far below boiling point then jervis returned the cups to the counter good night pat he cried and rejoined seaton and kerry as they came out into the desolation of the scrap heaps the last traces of fog had disappeared and a steady breeze came up the river fresh and salty from the nore jervis led them in a northeasterly direction threading his way through pyramids of rubbish until with the wind in their teeth they came out upon the river bank at a point where the shore shelved steeply downwards a number of boats lay on the shingle we're pretty well opposite greenwich marshes said jervis you can just see one of the big gasometers the end boat is george's have you searched it rapped carrie placing a fresh piece of chewing gum between his teeth i have sir oh he's too wise for that i propose said seaton briskly that we borrow one of the other boats and pull downstream to where the short pier juts out we can hide behind it and watch for our man i take it he'll be bound upstream and the tide will help us to follow him quietly right said carrie we'll take the small dinghy it's big enough he turned to jervis nip across to the wooden stairs he directed and tell inspector white to stand by but to keep out of sight if we've started before you return go back and join em very good sir jervis turned and disappeared into the mazes of rubbish as seaton and kerry grasped the boat and ran it down into the rising tide kerry boarding seaton thrust it out into the river and climbed in over the stern phew the current drags like a towboat said kerry they were being drawn rapidly upstream but as kerry seized the oars and began to pull steadily this progress was checked he could make little actual headway however the tide races round this bend like fury he said bear on the oar sir seaton thereupon came to kerry's assistance and gradually the dinghy crept upon its course until below the little pier they found a sheltered spot where it was possible to run in and lie hidden as they won this haven quiet said seaton don't move the oars look we were only just in time immediately above them where the boats were beached a man was coming down the slope carrying a hurricane lantern as carrie and seaton watched the man raised the lantern and swung it to and fro watch whispered seaton he's signaling to the greenwich bank carrie's teeth snapped savagely together and he chewed but made no reply until there it is he said rapidly on the marshes a speck of light in the darkness it showed a distant moving lantern on the curtain of the night although few would have credited kerry with the virtue he was a man of cultured imagination and it seemed to him as it seemed to seaton pasha that the dim light symbolized the life of the missing woman of the woman who hovered between the gay world from which tragically she had vanished and some chinese hell upon whose brink she hovered neither of the watchers was thinking of the crime 
and the criminal of sir lucian pine or casma but of mrs monty irvin mysterious victim of a mysterious tragedy oh dan you must find her you must find her sure weak heart dinna ye ken how she is sufferin clairvoyantly to carrie's ears was borne an echo of his wife's words the traffic he whispered if we lose george martin tonight we deserve to lose the case i agree chief inspector said seaton quietly the grating sound made by a boat thrust out from a shingle beach came to their ears above the whispering of the tide a ghostly figure in the dim light george martin clambered into his craft and took to the oars if he's for the greenwich bank said seaton grimly he has a stiff task but for the greenwich bank the boat was headed and pulling mightily against the current the man struck out into midstream they watched him for some time silently noting how he fought against the tide sturdily heading for the point at which the signal had shown then what do you suggest asked seaton he may follow the surrey bank upstream i suggest said carrie that we drift once in limehouse reach we'll hear him there are no pleasure parties punting about that stretch let us pull out then i propose that we wait for him at some convenient point between the west india dock and limehouse basin good rapped carrie thrusting the boat out into the fierce current you may have spent a long time in the east sir but you're fairly wise on the geography of the lower thames gripped in the strongly running tide they were borne smoothly upstream using the oars merely for the purpose of steering the gloomy mystery of the london river claimed them and imposed silence upon them until familiar landmarks told of the northern bend of the thames and the light above the lavender pond shone out upon the unctuously moving water each pulling a skull they headed in for the left bank there's a wharf ahead said seaton looking back over his shoulder if we put in beside it we can wait there unobserved good enough said carrie they bent to the oars stealing stroke by stroke out of the grip of the tide and presently came to a tiny pool above the wharf structure where it was possible to lie undisturbed by the eager current those limitations which are common to all humanity and that guile which is peculiar to the chinese failed the fact from their ken that the deserted wharf in whose shelter they lay was at once the roof and the gateway of sinsinwa's receiving office as the boat drew into the bank a chinese boy who was standing on the wharf retired into the shadows from a spot visible downstream but invisible to the men in the boat he signaled constantly with a hurricane lantern three men from new scotland yard were watching the house of sinsinwa and sinsinwa had given no sign of animation since some hours earlier he had extinguished his bedroom light yet george drifting noiselessly upstream received a signal to the effect police while seaton pasha and chief inspector carey lay below the biggest dope cache in london seaton sometimes swore under his breath carey chewed incessantly but george never came at that eerie hour of the night when all things living from the lowest to the highest nor excepting mother earth herself grow chilled when all nature's perishable handiwork feels the touch of death a wild sudden cry rang out a wailing sorrowful cry that seemed to come from nowhere from everywhere from the bank from the stream that rose and fell and died sobbing into the hushed whisper of the tide seaton's hand fashioned like a vice onto carrie's shoulder and merciful god he whispered what was it who was it if it wasn't a spirit it was a woman replied carrie hoarsely and a woman very near to her end carrie seaton pasha had dropped all formality carrie if it calls for all the men that scotland yard can muster we must search every building down to the smallest rat-hole in the floor 
on this bank and do it by dawn we'll do it rapped carrie end of chapter thirty two recording by john brandon